Section 1 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane The Pace of Youth 1. Stimson stood in a corner and glowered. He was a fierce man and had indomitable whiskers, albeit he was very small. "'That young terrier,' he whispered to himself. "'He wants to quit making eyes at Lizzie. This is too much of a good thing. First thing you know, he'll get fired.' His brow creased in a frown. He strode over to the huge open doors and looked at a sign. Stimson's Mammoth Merry-Go-Round, it read, and the glory of it was great. Stimson stood and contemplated the sign. It was an enormous affair. The letters were as large as men. The glow of it, the grandeur of it, was very apparent to Stimson. At the end of his contemplation he shook his head thoughtfully, determinedly. No, no, he muttered. This is too much of a good thing. First thing you know, he'll get fired. A soft booming sound of surf, mingled with the cries of bathers, came from the beach. There was a vista of sand and sky and sea that drew to a mystic point far away in the northward. In the mighty angle, a girl in a red dress was crawling slowly like some kind of a spider on the fabric of nature. A few flags hung lazily above where the bathhouses were marshaled in compact squares. Upon the edge of the sea stood a ship, with its shadowy sails painted dimly upon the sky, and high overhead, in the still sunshot air, a great hawk swung and circled slowly. Within the merry-go-round there was a whirling circle of ornamental lions, giraffes, camels, ponies, goats, glittering with varnish and metal that caught swift reflections from windows high above them. With stiff wooden legs they swept on in a never-ending race, while a great orchestrion clamored in wild speed. The summer sunlight sprinkled its gold upon the garnet canopies, carried by the tireless racers and upon all the devices of decoration that made Stimson's machine magnificent and famous. A host of laughing children bestrode the animals, bending forward like charging cavalrymen and shaking reins and whooping in glee. At intervals they leaned out perilously to clutch at iron rings that were tendered to them by a long wooden arm. At the intense moment before the swift grab for the rings, one could see their little nervous bodies quiver with eagerness. The laughter rang shrill and excited. Down in the long rows of benches, crowds of people sat watching the game, while occasionally a father might arise and go near to shout encouragement, cautionary commands, or applause at his flying offspring. Frequently mothers called out, Be careful, Georgie! The orchestrion bellowed and thundered on its platform, filling the ears with its long, monotonous song. Over in a corner, a man in a white apron and behind a counter roared above the tumult, Popcorn! Popcorn! A young man stood upon a small raised platform, erected in the manner of a pulpit, and just without the line of the circling figures. It was his duty to manipulate the wooden arm and affix the rings. When all were gone into the hands of the triumphant children, he held forth a basket into which they returned all, save the coveted brass one, which meant another ride free, and made the holder very illustrious. The young man stood all day upon his narrow platform, affixing rings or holding forth the basket. He was a sort of general squire in these lists of childhood. He was very busy. And yet Stimson, the astute, had noticed that the young man frequently found time to twist about on his platform and smile at a girl who shyly sold tickets behind a silvered netting. This, indeed, was the great reason of Stimson's glowering. The young man upon the raised platform had no manner of license to smile at the girl behind the silvered netting. 
It was a most gigantic insolence. Stimson was amazed at it. By Jiminy, he said to himself again, that fellow is smiling at my daughter. Even in this tone of great wrath, it could be discerned that Stimson was filled with wonder that any youth should dare smile at the daughter in the presence of the august father. Often the dark-eyed girl peered between the shining wires, and, upon being detected by the young man, she usually turned her head away quickly to prove to him that she was not interested. At other times, however, her eyes seemed filled with a tender fear lest he should fall from that exceedingly dangerous platform. As for the young man, it was plain that these glances filled him with valor, and he stood carelessly upon his perch, as if he deemed it of no consequence that he might fall from it. In all the complexities of his daily life and duties, he found opportunity to gaze ardently at the vision behind the netting. This silent courtship was conducted over the heads of the crowd who thronged about the bright machine. The swift, eloquent glances of the young man went noiselessly and unseen with their message. There had finally become established between the two, in this manner, a subtle understanding and companionship. They communicated accurately all that they felt. The boy told his love, his reverence, his hope in the changes of the future. The girl told him that she loved him, that she did not love him, that she did not know if she loved him, that she loved him. Sometimes a little sign saying cashier in gold letters, and hanging upon the silvered netting, got directly in range and interfered with a tender message. The love affair had not continued without anger, unhappiness, despair. The girl had once smiled brightly upon a youth who came to buy some tickets for his little sister, and the young man upon the platform observing this smile had been filled with gloomy rage. He stood like a dark statue of vengeance upon his pedestal, and thrust out the basket to the children with a gesture that was full of scorn for their hollow happiness, for their insecure and temporary joy. For five hours he did not once look at the girl when she was looking at him. He was going to crush her with his indifference. He was going to demonstrate that he had never been serious. However, when he narrowly observed her in secret, he discovered that she seemed more blithe than was usual with her. When he found that his apparent indifference had not crushed her, he suffered greatly. She did not love him, he concluded. If she had loved him, she would have been crushed. For two days he lived a miserable existence upon his high perch. He consoled himself by thinking of how unhappy he was, and by swift furtive glances at the loved face. At any rate, he was in her presence, and he could get a good view from his perch when there was no interference by the little sign, Cashier. But suddenly, swiftly, these clouds vanished, and under the imperial blue sky of the restored confidence, they dwelt in peace, a peace that was satisfaction, a peace that, like a babe, put its trust in the treachery of the future. This confidence endured until the next day, when she, for an unknown cause, suddenly refused to look at him. Mechanically, he continued his task, his brain dazed a tortured victim of doubt, fear, suspicion. With his eyes he supplicated her to telegraph an explanation. She replied with a stony glance that froze his blood. There was a great difference in their respective reasons for becoming angry. His were always foolish, but apparent, plain as the moon. Hers were subtle, feminine, as incomprehensible as the stars as mysterious as the shadows at night. They fell and soared, and soared and fell in this manner, until they knew that to live without each other would be a wandering in deserts. They had grown so intent upon the uncertainties, the variations, the guessings of their affair, that the world had become but a huge immaterial background. 
In time of peace their smiles were soft and prayerful, caresses confided to the air. In time of war their youthful hearts, capable of profound agony, were wrung by the intricate emotions of doubt. They were the victims of the dread angel of affectionate speculation that forces the brain endlessly on roads that lead nowhere. At night the problem of whether she loved him confronted the young man like a specter, looming as high as a hill, and telling him not to delude himself. Upon the following day this battle of the night displayed itself in the renewed fervor of his glances, and in their increased number. Whenever he thought he could detect that she too was suffering, he felt a thrill of joy. But there came a time when the young man looked back upon these contortions with contempt. He believed then that he had imagined his pain. This came about when the redoubtable Stimson marched forward to participate. This has got to stop, Stimson said to himself as he stood and watched them. They had grown careless of the light world that clattered about them. They were become so engrossed in their personal drama that the language of their eyes was almost as obvious as gestures. And Stimson, through his keenness, his wonderful infallible penetration, suddenly came into possession of these obvious facts. "'Well, of all the nerves,' he said, regarding with a new interest the young man upon the perch. He was a resolute man. He never hesitated to grapple with a crisis. He decided to overturn everything at once, for, although small, he was very fierce and impetuous. He resolved to crush this dreaming. He strode over to the silvered netting. "'Say, you want to quit your everlasting grinning at that idiot,' he said grimly. The girl cast down her eyes and made a little heap of quarters into a stack. She was unable to withstand the terrible scrutiny of her small and fierce father. Stimson turned from his daughter and went to a spot beneath the platform. He fixed his eyes upon the young man and said, "'I've been speaking to Lizzie. You better attend strictly to your own business, or there'll be a new man here next week.' It was as if he had blazed away with a shotgun. The young man reeled upon his perch. At last he in a measure regained his composure and managed to stammer, "'Uh, all right, sir.' He knew that denials would be futile with the terrible Stimson. He agitatedly began to rattle the rings in the basket and pretend he was obliged to count them or inspect them in some way. He, too, was unable to face the great Stimson. For a moment Stimson stood in fine satisfaction and gloated over the effect of his threat. i fixed them, he said complacently, and went out to smoke a cigar and revel in himself. Through his mind went the proud reflection that people who came in contact with his granite will usually ended in quick and abject submission. Two. One evening, a week after Stimson had indulged in the proud reflection that people who came in contact with his granite will usually ended in quick and abject submission, a young feminine friend of the girl behind the silvered netting came to her there and asked her to walk on the beach after Stimson's mammoth merry-go-round was closed for the night. The girl assented with a nod. The young man upon the perch holding the rings saw this nod and judged its meaning. Into his mind came an idea of defeating the watchfulness of the redoubtable Stimson. When the merry-go-round was closed and the two girls started for the beach, he wandered off aimlessly in another direction, but he kept them in view, and as soon as he was assured that he had escaped the vigilance of Stimson, he followed them. The electric lights on the beach made a broad band of tremoring light, extending parallel to the sea, and upon the wide walk there slowly paraded a great crowd intermingling, intertwining, sometimes colliding. In the darkness stretched the vast purple expanse of the ocean, and the deep indigo sky above 
was peopled with yellow stars. Occasionally, out upon the water, a whirling mass of froth suddenly flashed into view, like a great ghostly robe appearing, and then vanished, leaving the sea in its darkness, from whence came those bass tones of the water's unknown emotion. A wind, cool, reminiscent of the wave wastes, made the women hold their wraps about their throats, and caused the men to grip the rims of their straw hats. It carried the noise of the band in the pavilion in gusts. Sometimes people unable to hear the music glanced up at the pavilion and were reassured upon beholding the distant leader still gesticulating and bobbing, and the other members of the band with their lips glued to their instruments. High in the sky soared an unassuming moon, faintly silver. For a time the young man was afraid to approach the two girls. He followed them at a distance, and called himself a coward. At last, however, he saw them stop on the outer edge of the crowd, and stand silently, listening to the voices of the sea. When he came to where they stood, he was trembling in his agitation. They had not seen him. "'Lizzie,' he began, "'I—' The girl wheeled instantly, and put her hand to her throat. "'Oh, Frank, you frightened me!' she said, inevitably. "'Well, you know, I—I—' I, he stuttered. But the other girl was one of those beings who were born to attend to tragedies. She had for love a reverence, an admiration. That was greater the more that she contemplated the fact that she knew nothing of it. This couple with their emotions awed her, and made her humbly wish that she might be destined to be of some service to them. She was very homely." When the young man faltered before them, she, in her sympathy, actually overestimated the crisis, and felt that he might fall dying at their feet. Shyly, but with courage, she marched to the rescue. "'Why don't you come and walk on the beach with us?' she said. The young man gave her a glance of deep gratitude, which was not without the patronage which a man in his condition naturally feels for one who pities it. The three walked on. Finally the being who was born to attend at this tragedy said that she wished to sit down and gaze at the sea alone. They politely urged her to walk on with them, but she was obstinate. She wished to gaze at the sea alone. The young man swore to himself that he would be her friend until he died, and so the two young lovers went on without her. They turned once to look at her. "'Jenny's awfully nice,' said the girl. "'You bet she is,' replied the young man, ardently. They were silent for a little time. At last the girl said, "'You were angry at me yesterday.' "'No, I wasn't.' "'Yes, you were, too. You wouldn't look at me once all day.' "'No, I wasn't angry. I was only putting on.' Though she had, of course, known it. This confession seemed to make her very indignant. She flashed a resentful glance at him. "'Oh, were you indeed?' she said, with a great air. For a few minutes she was so haughty with him that he loved her to madness. And directly this poem, which stuck at his lips, came forth lamely in fragments. When they walked back toward the other girl, and saw the patience of her attitude— their hearts swelled in a patronizing and secondary tenderness for her. They were very happy. If they had been miserable, they would have charged this fairy scene of the night with a criminal heartlessness. But as they were joyous, they faintly wondered how the purple sea, the yellow stars, the changing crowd under the electric lights, could be so phlegmatic and stolid. They walked home by the lakeside way, and out upon the water those gay paper lanterns, flashing, fleeting, and careening, sang to them, sang a chorus of red and violet and green and gold, a song of mystic lands of the future. One day when business paused during the dull, sultry afternoon, Stimson went uptown. Upon his return he found that the popcorn man, from his stand over in a corner, was keeping an eye upon the cashier's cage, 
and that nobody at all was attending to the wooden arm and the iron rings. He strode forward like a sergeant of grenadiers. "'Where in the thunder is Lizzie?' he demanded, a cloud of rage in his eyes. The popcorn man, although associated long with Stimson, had never got over being dazed. "'They've, they've gone round to the, the house,' he said, with difficulty, as if he had just been stunned. "'Whose house?' snapped Stimson. Y "'Your house, I suppose.' said the popcorn man. Stimson marched round to his home. Kingly denunciation surged, already formulated, to the tip of his tongue, and he bided the moment when his anger would fall upon the heads of that pair of children. He found his wife convulsive and in tears. "'Where's Lizzie?' And then she burst forth. "'Oh, John, John, they've run away. I know they have.' They drove by here not three minutes ago. They must have done it on purpose to bid me good-bye. For Lizzie waved her hand sad-like, and then before I could get out to ask where they were going or what, Frank whipped up the horse. Stimson gave vent to a dreadful roar. Get my revolver. Get a hack. Get my revolver. Damn, do you hear? What the devil? His voice became incoherent. He had always ordered his wife about, as if she were a battalion of infantry, and despite her misery, the training of years forced her to spring mechanically to obey, but suddenly she turned to him a shrill appeal. "'Oh, John, not the revolver!' "'Confound it, let go of me!' he roared again, and shook her from him. He ran hatless upon the street. There was a multitude of hacks at the summer resort but it was ages to him before he could find one. Then he charged it like a bull. Uptown, he yelled, as he tumbled into the rear seat. The hackman thought of severed arteries. His galloping horse distanced a large number of citizens, who had been running to find what caused such contortions by the little hatless man. It chanced, as the bouncing hack went along near the lake, Stimson gazed across the calm gray expanse and recognized a color in a bonnet and a poise of a head. A buggy was traveling along a highway that led to Sorrington. Stimson bellowed, There! There! There they are! In that buggy! The hackman became inspired with the full knowledge of the situation. He struck a delirious blow with the whip. His mouth expanded in a grin of excitement and joy. It came to pass that this old vehicle, with its drowsy horse and its dusty-eyed and tranquil driver, seemed suddenly to awaken, to become animated and fleet. The horse ceased to ruminate on his state, his air of reflection vanished, he became intent upon his aged legs, and spread them in quaint and ridiculous devices for speed. The driver, his eyes shining, sat critically in his seat. He watched each motion of this rattling machine down before him. He resembled an engineer. He used the whip with judgment and deliberation, as the engineer would have used coal or oil. The horse clacked swiftly upon the macadam. The wheels hummed. The body of the vehicle wheezed and groaned. Stimson, in the rear seat, was erect in that impassive attitude that comes sometimes to the furious man when he is obliged to leave the battle to others. Frequently, however, the tempest in his breast came to his face, and he howled. "'Go it! Go it! You're gaining! Pound him! Thump the life out of him! Hit him hard, you fool!' His hand grasped the rod that supported the carriage top, and it was clenched so that the nails were faintly blue. Ahead, the other carriage had been flying with speed, as from realization of the menace in the rear. It bowled away rapidly, drawn by the eager spirit of a young and modern horse. Stimson could see the buggy top bobbing, bobbing. That little pain, like an eye, was a derision to him. Once he leaned forward and bawled angry sentences. He began to feel impotent. His whole expedition was the tottering of an old man upon the trail of birds. 
A sense of age made him choke again with wrath. That other vehicle, that was youth, with youth's pace. It was swift flying with the hope of dreams. He began to comprehend those two children ahead of him, and he knew a sudden and strange awe, because he understood the power of their young blood, the power to fly strongly into the future and feel and hope again, even at that time when his bones must be laid in the earth. The dust rose easily from the hot road and stifled the nostrils of Stimson. The highway vanished far away in a point, with a suggestion of intolerable length. The other vehicle was becoming so small that Stimson could no longer see the derisive eye. At last the hackman drew rein to his horse and turned to look at Stimson. "'No use, I guess,' he said. Stimson made a gesture of acquiescence, rage, despair. As the hackman turned his dripping horse about, Stimson sank back with the astonishment and grief of a man who has been defied by the universe. He had been in a great perspiration, and now his bald head felt cool and uncomfortable. He put up his hand with the sudden recollection that he had forgotten his hat. At last he made a gesture. It meant that at any rate he was not responsible. End of the Pace of Youth Section 2 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sketches An Ominous Baby A baby was wandering in a strange country. He was a tattered child with a frousled wealth of yellow hair. His dress, of a checked stuff, was soiled and showed the marks of many conflicts, like the chain shirt of a warrior. His sun-tanned knees shone above wrinkled stockings, which he pulled up occasionally, with an impatient movement when they entangled his feet. From a gaping shoe there appeared an array of tiny toes. He was toddling along an avenue between rows of stolid brown houses. He went slowly, with a look of absorbed interest, on his small, flushed face. His blue eyes stared curiously. Carriages went with a musical rumble over the smooth asphalt. A man with a chrysanthemum was going up steps. Two nursery maids chatted as they walked slowly, while their charges hobnobbed amiably between perambulators. A truck wagon roared thunderously in the distance. The child from the poor district made way along the brown street filled with dull gray shadows. High above, near the roofs, glancing sun-rays changed cornices to blazing gold and silvered the fronts of windows. The wandering baby stopped and stared at the two children laughing and playing in their carriages among the heaps of rugs and cushions. He braced his legs apart in an attitude of earnest attention. His lower jaw fell and disclosed his small, even teeth. As they moved on, he followed the carriages with awe in his face, as if contemplating a pageant. Once one of the babies, with twittering laughter, shook a gorgeous rattle at him. He smiled jovially in return. Finally, a nursery maid ceased conversation and, turning, made a gesture of annoyance. "'Go away, little boy,' she said to him. "'Go away. You're all dirty.' He gazed at her with infant tranquility for a moment, and then went slowly off, dragging behind him a bit of rope he had acquired in another street. He continued to investigate the new scenes. The people and houses struck him with interest, as would flowers and trees. Passengers had to avoid the small absorbed figure in the middle of the sidewalk. They glanced at the intent baby face, covered with scratches and dust, as with scars and powder smoke. After a time the wanderer discovered upon the pavement a pretty child in fine clothes, playing with a toy. It was a tiny fire-engine, 
painted brilliantly in crimson and gold. The wheels rattled as its small owner dragged it uproariously about by means of a string. The babe with his bit of rope trailing behind him paused and regarded the child and the toy. For a long while he remained motionless, save for his eyes, which followed all movements of the glittering thing. The owner paid no attention to the spectator, but continued his joyous imitations of phases of the career of a fire engine. His gleeful baby laugh rang against the calm fronts of the houses. After a little, the wandering baby began quietly to sidle nearer. His bit of rope, now forgotten, dropped at his feet. He removed his eyes from the toy and glanced expectantly at the other child. Say, he breathed softly. The owner of the toy was running down the walk at top speed. His tongue was clanging like a bell, and his legs were galloping. An iron post on the corner was all ablaze. He did not look around at the coaxing call from the small tattered figure on the curb. The wandering baby approached still nearer, and, presently, spoke again. "'Say,' he murmured, "'let me play with it.' The other child interrupted some shrill tootings. He bended his head and spoke disdainfully over his shoulder. "'No,' he said. The wanderer retreated to the curb. He failed to notice the bit of rope, once treasured. His eyes followed as before the winding course of the engine, and his tender mouth twitched. "'Say,' he ventured at last, "'is that yours?' "'Yes,' said the other, tilting his round chin. He drew his property suddenly behind him, as if it were menaced. "'Yes,' he repeated. It's mine. Well, let me play with it, said the wandering baby, with a trembling note of desire in his voice. No, cried the pretty child, with determined lips. It's mine. My mamma bide it. Well, can't I play with it? His voice was a sob. He stretched forth little covetous hands. No, the pretty child continued to repeat. No, it's mine. Well, I want to play with it, wailed the other. A sudden fierce frown mantled his baby face. He clenched his thin hands and advanced with a formidable gesture. He looked some wee battler in a war. It's mine, it's mine, cried the pretty child, his voice in the treble of outraged rights. I want it, roared the wanderer. It's mine, it's mine. I want it. It's mine. The pretty child retreated to the fence and there paused at bay. He protected his property with outstretched arms. The small vandal made a charge. There was a short scuffle at the fence. Each grasped the string to the toy and tugged. Their faces were wrinkled with baby rage, the verge of tears. Finally, the child in tatters gave a supreme tug and wrenched the string from the other's hands. He set off rapidly down the street, bearing the toy in his arms. He was weeping with the air of a wronged one who has at last succeeded in achieving his rights. The other baby was squalling lustily. He seemed quite helpless. He wrung his chubby hands and railed. After the small barbarian had got some distance away, he paused and regarded his booty. His little form curved with pride. A soft, gleeful smile loomed through the storm of tears. With great care, he prepared the toy for traveling. He stopped a moment on a corner and gazed at the pretty child whose small figure was quivering with sobs. As the latter began to show signs of beginning pursuit, the little vandal turned and vanished down a dark side street as into a swallowing cavern. A GREAT MISTAKE An Italian kept a fruit stand on a corner, where he had good aim 
at the people who came down from the elevated station, and at those who went along two thronged streets. He sat most of the day in a backless chair that was placed strategically. There was a babe living hard by, up five flights of stairs, who regarded this Italian as a tremendous being. The babe had investigated this fruit stand. It had thrilled him, as few things he had met with in his travels had thrilled him. The sweets of the world laid there, in dazzling rows, tumbled in luxurious heaps. When he gazed at this Italian seated amid such splendid treasure, his lower lip hung low, and his eyes raised to the vendor's face were filled with deep respect, worship, as if he saw omnipotence. The babe came often to this corner. He hovered about the stand, and watched each detail of the business. He was fascinated by the tranquility of the vendor, the majesty of power and possession. At times he was so engrossed in his contemplation that people, hurrying, had to use care to avoid bumping him down. He had never ventured very near to the stand. It was his habit to hang warily about the curb. Even there he resembled a babe who looks unbidden at a feast of gods. One day, however, as the baby was thus staring, the vendor arose, and going along the front of the stand, began to polish oranges with a red pocket handkerchief. The breathless spectator moved across the sidewalk until his small face almost touched the vendor's sleeve. His fingers were gripped in a fold of his dress. At last the Italian finished with the oranges and returned to his chair. He drew a newspaper printed in his language from behind a bunch of bananas. He settled himself in a comfortable position, and began to glare savagely at the print. The babe was left face to face with the massed joys of the world. For a time he was a simple worshipper at this golden shrine. Then tumultuous desires began to shake him. His dreams were of conquest, his lips moved. Presently, into his head, there came a little plan. He sidled nearer, throwing swift and cunning glances at the Italian. He strove to maintain his conventional manner, but the whole plot was written upon his countenance. At last he had come near enough to touch the fruit. From the tattered skirt came slowly his small dirty hand. His eyes were fixed upon the vendor. His features were set, save for the upper lip, which had a faint fluttering movement. The hand went forward. Elevated trains thundered to the station, and the stairway poured people upon the sidewalks. There was a deep sea roar from feet and wheels, going ceaselessly. None seemed to perceive the babe engaged in the great venture. The Italian turned his paper. Sudden panic smote the babe. His hands dropped, and he gave vent to a cry of dismay. He remained for a moment, staring at the vendor. There was evidently a great debate in his mind. His infant intellect had defined the Italian. The latter was undoubtedly a man who would eat babes that provoked him. And the alarm in him, when the vendor had turned his newspaper, brought vividly before him the consequences if he were detected. But at this moment the vendor gave a blissful grunt, and tilting his chair against a wall, closed his eyes. His paper dropped unheeded. The babe ceased his scrutiny and again raised his hand. It was moved with supreme caution toward the fruit. The fingers were bent, claw-like, in the manner of great heart-shaking greed. Once he stopped and chattered convulsively because the vendor moved in his sleep. The babe, with his eyes still upon the Italian, again put forth his hand, and the rapacious fingers closed over a round bulb. And it was written that the Italian should at this moment open his eyes. He glared at the babe a fierce question. Thereupon the babe thrust the round bulb behind him, 
and with a face expressive of the deepest guilt, began a wild but elaborate series of gestures declaring his innocence. The Italian howled. He sprang to his feet, and with three steps overtook the babe. He whirled him fiercely, and took from the little fingers a lemon. A DARK BROWN DOG A child was standing on a street corner. He leaned with one shoulder against a high board fence, and swayed the other to and fro, the while kicking carelessly at the gravel. Sunshine beat upon the cobbles, and a lazy summer wind raised yellow dust, which trailed in clouds down the avenue. Clattering trucks moved with indistinctness through it. The child stood dreamily gazing. After a time, a little dark brown dog came trotting with an intent air down the sidewalk. A short rope was dragging from his neck. Occasionally he trod upon the end of it and stumbled. He stopped opposite the child, and the two regarded each other. The dog hesitated for a moment, but presently he made some little advances with his tail. The child put out his hand and called him. In an apologetic manner, the dog came close, and the two had an interchange of friendly pattings and waggles. The dog became more enthusiastic with each moment of the interview, until with his gleeful caperings he threatened to overturn the child. Whereupon the child lifted his hand and struck the dog a blow upon the head. This thing seemed to overpower and astonish the little dark brown dog, and wounded him to the heart. He sank down in despair at the child's feet. When the blow was repeated, together with an admonition in childish sentences, he turned over upon his back and held his paws in a peculiar manner. At the same time, with his ears and his eyes, he offered a small prayer to the child. He looked so comical on his back, and holding his paws peculiarly, that the child was greatly amused, and gave him little taps repeatedly, to keep him so. But the little dark brown dog took this chastisement in the most serious way, and no doubt considered he had committed some grave crime, for he wriggled contritely, and showed his repentance in every way that was in his power. He pleaded with the child, and petitioned him, and offered more prayers. At last the child grew weary of this amusement, and turned toward home. The dog was praying at the time. He lay on his back, and turned his eyes upon the retreating form. Presently he struggled to his feet, and started after the child. The latter wandered in a perfunctory way toward his home stopping at times to investigate various matters. During one of these pauses he discovered the little dark brown dog who was following him with the air of a footpad. The child beat his pursuer with a small stick he had found. The dog lay down and prayed until the child had finished and resumed his journey. Then he scrambled erect and took up the pursuit again. On the way to his home, the child turned many times and beat the dog, proclaiming with childish gestures that he held him in contempt as an unimportant dog, with no value save for a moment. For being this quality of animal, the dog apologized and eloquently expressed regret, but he continued stealthily to follow the child. His manner grew so very guilty that he slunk like an assassin. When the child reached his doorstep, the dog was industriously ambling a few yards in the rear. He became so agitated with shame when he again confronted the child that he forgot the dragging rope. He tripped upon it and fell forward. The child sat down on the step, and the two had another interview. During it, the dog greatly exerted himself to please the child. He performed a few gambols with such abandon that the child suddenly saw him to be a valuable thing. He made a swift, avaricious charge and seized the rope. He dragged his captive into a hall 
and up many long stairways in a dark tenement. The dog made willing efforts, but he could not hobble very skillfully up the stairs, because he was very small and soft, and at last the pace of the engrossed child grew so energetic that the dog became panic-stricken. In his mind he was being dragged toward a grim unknown. His eyes grew wild with the terror of it. He began to wiggle his head frantically and to brace his legs. The child redoubled his exertions. They had a battle on the stairs. The child was victorious because he was completely absorbed in his purpose and because the dog was very small. He dragged his acquirement to the door of his home and finally with triumph across the threshold. No one was in. The child sat down on the floor and made overtures to the dog. These the dog instantly accepted. He beamed with affection upon his new friend. In a short time they were firm and abiding comrades. When the child's family appeared, they made a great row. The dog was examined and commented upon and called names. Scorn was leveled at him from all eyes, so that he became much embarrassed and drooped like a scorched plant. But the child went sturdily to the center of the floor and, at the top of his voice, championed the dog. It happened that he was roaring protestations, with his arms clasped about the dog's neck, when the father of the family came in from work. The parent demanded to know what the blazes they were making the kid howl for. It was explained in many words that the infernal kid wanted to introduce a disreputable dog into the family. A family council was held. On this depended the dog's fate, but he in no way heeded, being busily engaged in chewing the end of the child's dress. The affair was quickly ended. The father of the family, it appears, was in a particularly savage temper that evening, and when he perceived that it would amaze and anger everybody if such a dog were allowed to remain, he decided that it should be so. The child crying softly, took his friend off to a retired part of the room to hobnob with him, while the father quelled a fierce rebellion of his wife. So it came to pass that the dog was a member of the household. He and the child were associated together at all times, save when the child slept. The child became a guardian and a friend. If the large folk kicked the dog and threw things at him, the child made loud and violent objections. Once when the child had run, protesting loudly, with tears raining down his face and his arms outstretched to protect his friend, he had been struck in the head with a very large saucepan from the hand of his father, enraged at some seeming lack of courtesy in the dog. Ever after, the family were careful how they threw things at the dog. Moreover, the latter grew very skillful in avoiding missiles and feet. In a small room containing a stove, a table, a bureau, and some chairs, he would display strategic ability of a high order, dodging, fainting, and scuttling about among the furniture. He would force three or four people armed with brooms, sticks, and handfuls of coal, to use all their ingenuity to get in a blow. And even when they did, it was seldom that they could do him a serious injury or leave any imprint. But when the child was present, these scenes did not occur. It came to be recognized that if the dog was molested, the child would burst into sobs and, as the child, when started, was very riotous and practically unquenchable, the dog had therein a safeguard. However, the child could not always be near. At night, when he was asleep, his dark brown friend would raise from some black corner a wild, wailful cry, a song of infinite loneliness and despair, that would go shuddering and sobbing among the buildings of the block and cause people to swear. 
At these times the singer would often be chased all over the kitchen and hit with a great variety of articles. Sometimes, too, the child himself used to beat the dog, although it is not known that he ever had what could truly be called a just cause. The dog always accepted these thrashings with an air of admitted guilt. He was too much of a dog to try to look to be a martyr or to plot revenge. He received the blows with great humility, and, furthermore, he forgave his friend the moment the child had finished, and was ready to caress the child's hand with his little red tongue. When misfortune came upon the child, and his troubles overwhelmed him, he would often crawl under the table, and lay his small distressed head on the dog's back. The dog was ever sympathetic. It is not to be supposed that at such times he took occasion to refer to the unjust beatings his friend, when provoked, had administered to him. He did not achieve any notable degree of intimacy with the other members of the family. He had no confidence in them and the fear that he would express at their casual approach often exasperated them exceedingly. They used to gain a certain satisfaction in underfeeding him, but finally his friend, the child, grew to watch the matter with some care, and when he forgot it, the dog was often successful in secret for himself. So the dog prospered. He developed a large bark which came wondrously from such a small rug of a dog. He ceased to howl persistently at night. Sometimes, indeed, in his sleep, he would utter little yells as from pain, but that occurred, no doubt, when in his dreams he encountered huge flaming dogs who threatened him direfully. His devotion to the child grew until it was a sublime thing, he wagged at his approach, he sank down in despair at his departure. He could detect the sound of the child's step among all the noises of the neighborhood. It was like a calling voice to him. The scene of their companionship was a kingdom governed by this terrible potentate, the child. But neither criticism nor rebellion ever lived for an instant in the heart of the one subject down in the mystic, hidden fields of his little dog's soul, bloomed flowers of love and fidelity and perfect faith. The child was in the habit of going on many expeditions to observe strange things in the vicinity. On these occasions his friend usually jogged aimfully along behind. Perhaps, though, he went ahead. This necessitated his turning around every quarter minute to make sure the child was coming. He was filled with a large idea of the importance of these journeys. He would carry himself with such an air. He was proud to be the retainer of so great a monarch. One day, however, the father of the family got quite exceptionally drunk. He came home and held carnival with the cooking utensils, the furniture, and his wife. He was in the midst of this recreation when the child, followed by the dark brown dog, entered the room. They were returning from their voyages. The child's practiced eye instantly noted his father's state. He dived under the table, where experience had taught him was a rather safe place. The dog, lacking skill in such matters, was, of course, unaware of the true condition of affairs. He looked with interested eyes at his friend's sudden dive. He interpreted it to mean, joyous gamble. He started to patter across the floor to join him. He was the picture of a little dark brown dog en route to a friend. The head of the family saw him at this moment. He gave a huge howl of joy and knocked the dog down with a heavy coffee pot. The dog, yelling in supreme astonishment and fear, writhed to his feet and ran for cover. The man kicked out with a ponderous foot. It caused the dog to swerve, as if caught in a tide. A second blow of the coffee pot laid him upon the floor. Here the child, uttering loud cries, 
came valiantly forth like a knight. The father of the family paid no attention to these calls of the child, but advanced with glee upon the dog. Upon being knocked down twice in swift succession, the latter apparently gave up all hope of escape. He rolled over on his back, and held his paws in a peculiar manner. At the same time with his eyes and his ears he offered up a small prayer. But the father was in a mood for having fun, and it occurred to him that it would be a fine thing to throw the dog out of the window. So he reached down, and grabbing the animal by a leg, lifted him, squirming, up. He swung him two or three times, hilariously about his head, and then flung him with great accuracy through the window. The soaring dog created a surprise in the block. A woman watering plants in an opposite window gave an involuntary shout and dropped a flower-pot. A man in another window leaned perilously out to watch the flight of the dog. A woman, who had been hanging out clothes in a yard, began to caper wildly. Her mouth was filled with clothespins, but her arms gave vent to a sort of exclamation. In appearance she was like a gagged prisoner children ran whooping. The dark brown body crashed in a heap on the roof of a shed five stories below. From thence it rolled to the pavement of an alleyway. The child in the room far above burst into a long dirge-like cry and toddled hastily out of the room. It took him a long time to reach the alley, because his size compelled him to go downstairs backward one step at a time, and holding with both hands to the step above. When they Section 3 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. AN EXPERIMENT IN MISERY It was late at night, and a fine rain was swirling softly down, causing the pavements to glisten, with hue of steel and blue and yellow, in the rays of the innumerable lights. A youth was trudging slowly, without enthusiasm, with his hands buried deep in his trousers' pockets, toward the downtown places where beds can be hired for coppers. He was clothed in an aged and tattered suit, and his derby was a marvel of dust-covered crown and torn rim. He was going forth to eat, as the wanderer may eat, and sleep as the homeless sleep. By the time he had reached City Hall Park, he was so completely plastered with yells of bum and hobo, and with various unholy epithets that small boys had applied to him at intervals that he was in a state of the most profound dejection. The sifting rain saturated the old velvet collar of his overcoat, and as the wet cloth pressed against his neck, he felt that there no longer could be pleasure in life. He looked about him, searching for an outcast of highest degree, that the two might share miseries. But the lights threw a quivering glare over rows and circles of deserted benches, that glistened damply, showing patches of wet sod beneath them. It seemed that their unusual freights had fled on this night to better things. There were only squads of well-dressed Brooklyn people who swarmed toward the bridge. The young man loitered about for a time, and then went shuffling off down Park Row. In the sudden descent in style of the dress of the crowd, he felt relief, and as if he were at last in his own country. He began to see tatters that matched his tatters. In Chatham Square there were aimless men strewn in front of saloons and lodging-houses, standing sadly, patiently, reminding one vaguely of the attitudes of chickens in a storm. He aligned himself with these men, and turned slowly to occupy himself 
with the flowing life of the great street. Through the mists of the cold and storming night, the cable cars went in silent procession, great affairs shining with red and brass, moving with formidable power, calm and irresistible, dangerful and gloomy, breaking silence only by the loud fierce cry of the gong. Two rivers of people swarmed along the sidewalks, spattered with black mud, which made each shoe leave a scar-like impression. Overhead elevated trains with a shrill grinding of the wheels stopped at the station, which upon its leg-like pillars seemed to resemble some monstrous kind of crab squatting over the street. The quick, fat puffings of the engines could be heard. Down an alley there were somber curtains of purple and black, on which street lamps dully glittered like embroidered flowers. A saloon stood with a voracious air on a corner. A sign leaning against the front of the doorpost announced, Free Hot Soup Tonight, the swing door snapping to and fro like ravenous lips made gratified smacks as the saloon gorged itself with plump men, eating with astounding and endless appetite, smiling in some indescribable manner as the men came from all directions like sacrifices to a heathenish superstition. Caught by the delectable sign, the young man allowed himself to be swallowed. A bartender placed a schooner of dark and portentous beer on the bar, its monumental form upreared until the froth atop was above the crown of the young man's brown derby. Soup over there, gents, said the bartender affably. A little yellow man in rags and the youth grasped their schooners and went with speed toward a lunch counter, where a man with oily but imposing whiskers ladled genially from a kettle, until he had furnished his two mendicants with a soup that was steaming hot, and in which there were little floating suggestions of chicken. The young man, sipping his broth, felt the cordiality expressed by the warmth of the mixture, and he beamed at the man with oily but imposing whiskers, who was presiding like a priest behind an altar. "'Have some more, gents?' he inquired of the two sorry figures before him. The little yellow man accepted with a swift gesture, but the youth shook his head and went out, following a man whose wondrous seediness promised that he would have a knowledge of cheap lodging-houses. On the sidewalk he accosted the seedy man. Say, do you know a cheap place to sleep? The other hesitated for a time, gazing sideways. Finally he nodded in the direction up the street. I sleep up there, he said, when I've got the price. How much? Ten cents. The young man shook his head dolefully. That's too rich for me. At that moment there approached the two a reeling man in strange garments. His head was a fuddle of bushy hair and whiskers, from which his eyes peered with a guilty slant. In a close scrutiny it was possible to distinguish the cruel lines of a mouth, which looked as if its lips had just closed with satisfaction over some tender and piteous morsel. He appeared like an assassin steeped in crimes performed awkwardly. But at this time his voice was tuned to the coaxing key of an affectionate puppy. He looked at the men with wheedling eyes, and began to sing a little melody for charity. "'Say, gents, can't you give a poor feller a couple of cents to get a bed? I got five, and I gets another two, I gets me a bed. Now, on the square, gents, can't you just give me two cents to get a bed? Now you know how a respectable gentleman feels when he's down on his luck, and I—' The seedy man, staring with imperturbable countenance at a train which clattered overhead, interrupted in an expressionless voice, "'Ah, go to hell!' But the youth spoke to the prayerful assassin in tones of astonishment and inquiry, "'Say, 
You must be crazy. Why don't you strike somebody that looks like they had money? The assassin, tottering about on his uncertain legs, and, at intervals, brushing imaginary obstacles from before his nose, entered into a long explanation of the psychology of the situation. It was so profound that it was unintelligible. When he had exhausted the subject, the young man said to him, Let's see the five cents. The assassin wore an expression of drunken woe at this sentence, filled with suspicion of him. With a deeply pained air, he began to fumble in his clothing, his red hands trembling. Presently he announced in a voice of bitter grief, as if he had been betrayed, "'There's only four. Four, said the young man thoughtfully. "'Well, look a here. I'm a stranger here, and if you'll steer me to your cheap joint, I'll find the other three. The assassin's countenance became instantly radiant with joy. His whiskers quivered with the wealth of his alleged emotions. He seized the young man's hand in a transport of delight and friendliness. "'By God!' he cried. "'If you'll do that, by God! I'd say you was a damned good feller, I would!' and I'd remember you all my life I would, by God, and if I ever got a chance, I'd return the compliment. He spoke with drunken dignity. By God, I'd treat you white, I would, and I'd always remember you. The young man drew back, looking at the assassin coldly. Oh, that's all right, he said. You show me the joint. That's all you've got to do. The assassin, gesticulating gratitude, led the young man along a dark street. Finally he stopped before a little dusty door. He raised his hand impressively. "'Look a-here,' he said, and there was a thrill of deep and ancient wisdom upon his face. "'I've brought you here, and that's my part, ain't it? If the place don't suit you, you needn't get mad at me, need you? There won't be no bad feelin', will there?' "'No,' said the young man. The assassin waved his arm tragically and led the march up the steep staircase. On the way, the young man furnished the assassin with three pennies. At the top, a man with benevolent spectacles looked at them through a hole in the board. He collected their money, wrote some names on a register, and speedily was leading the two men along a gloom-shrouded corridor. Shortly after the beginning of this journey, the young man felt his liver turn white, for from the dark and secret places of the building there suddenly came to his nostrils strange and unspeakable odors that assailed him like malignant diseases with wings. They seemed to be from human bodies closely packed in dens, the exhalations from a hundred pairs of reeking lips, the fumes from a thousand bygone debauches the expression of a thousand present miseries. A man, naked, save for a little snuff-colored undershirt, was parading sleepily along the corridor. He rubbed his eyes and, giving vent to a prodigious yawn, demanded to be told the time. Half past one. The man yawned again. He opened a door, and for a moment his form was outlined against a black, opaque interior. To this door came three men, and as it was again opened, the unholy odors rushed out like released fiends, so that the young man was obliged to struggle as against an overpowering wind. It was some time before the youth's eyes were good in the intense gloom within, but the man with benevolent spectacles led him skillfully pausing but a moment to deposit the limp assassin upon a cot. He took the youth to a cot that lay tranquilly by the window, and, showing him a tall locker for clothes that stood near the head with the ominous air of a tombstone, left him. The youth sat on his cot and peered about him. There was a gas jet in a distant part of the room that burned a small flickering orange-hued flame. It caused vast masses of tumbled shadows in all parts of the place, save where, immediately about it, 
there was a little gray haze. As the young man's eyes became used to the darkness, he could see upon the cots that thickly littered the floor the forms of men sprawled out, lying in death-like silence, or heaving and snoring, with tremendous effort, like stabbed fish. The youth locked his derby and his shoes in the mummy case near him, and then lay down with his old and familiar coat around his shoulders. A blanket he handled gingerly, drawing it over part of the coat. The cot was leather-covered and cold as melting snow. The youth was obliged to shiver for some time on this affair, which was like a slab. Presently, however, his chill gave him peace, and during this period of leisure from it, he turned his head to stare at his friend, the assassin, whom he could dimly discern where he lay sprawled on a cot in the abandon of a man filled with drink. He was snoring with incredible vigor. His wet hair and beard dimly glistened, and his inflamed nose shone with subdued luster, like a red light in a fog. Within reach of the youth's hand was one who lay with yellow breast and shoulders, bare to the cold draughts. One arm hung over the side of the cot, and the fingers lay full length upon the wet cement floor of the room. Beneath the inky brows could be seen the eyes of the man, exposed by the partly opened lids. To the youth it seemed that he and this corpse-like being were exchanging a prolonged stare, and that the other threatened with his eyes. He drew back, watching his neighbor from the shadows of his blanket edge. The man did not move once through the night, but lay in this stillness as of death like a body stretched out, expectant of the surgeon's knife. And all through the room could be seen the tawny hues of naked flesh, limbs thrust into the darkness, projecting beyond the cots, upreared knees, arms hanging, long and thin, over the cot edges. For the most part they were statuesque, carven, dead. With the curious locker standing all about like tombstones, there was a strange effect of a graveyard, where bodies were merely flung. Yet occasionally could be seen limbs, wildly tossing in fantastic, nightmare gestures, accompanied by guttural cries, grunts, oaths. And there was one fellow off in a gloomy corner, who in his dreams was oppressed by some frightful calamity for of a sudden he began to utter long wails that went almost like yells from a hound, echoing wailfully and weird through this chill place of tombstones where men lay like the dead. The sound, in its high piercing beginnings, that dwindled to final melancholy moans, expressed a red and grim tragedy of the unfathomable possibilities of the man's dreams but to the youth these were not merely the shrieks of a vision-pierced man. They were an utterance of the meaning of the room and its occupants. It was to him the protest of the wretch who feels the touch of the imperturbable granite wheels, and who then cries with an impersonal eloquence, with a strength not from him, giving voice to the wail of a whole section, a class, a people. This, weaving into the young man's brain, and mingling with his views of these vast and somber shadows, that like mighty black fingers curled around the naked bodies, made the young man so that he did not sleep, but lay carving biographies for these men from his meager experience. At times the fellow in the corner howled in a writhing agony of his imaginations. Finally, a long lance-point of gray light shot through the dusty panes of the window. Without, the young man could see roofs, drearily white in the dawning. The point of light yellowed and grew brighter, until the golden rays of the morning sun came in bravely and strong. They touched with radiant color the form of a small fat man, who snored in stuttering fashion. 
His round and shiny bald head glowed suddenly with the valor of a decoration. He sat up, blinked at the sun, swore fretfully, and pulled his blanket over the ornamental splendors of his head. The youth contentedly watched this rout of the shadows before the bright spears of the sun, and presently he slumbered. When he awoke, he heard the voice of the assassin raised in valiant curses. Putting up his head, he perceived his comrade, seated on the side of the cot, engaged in scratching his neck with long fingernails that rasped like files. "'Hully gee, this is a new breed. They've got can-openers on their feet,' he continued in a violent tirade. The young man hastily unlocked his closet and took out his shoes and hat. As he sat on the side of the cot, lacing his shoes, he glanced about and saw that daylight made the room comparatively commonplace and uninteresting. The men, whose faces seemed stolid, serene, or absent, were engaged in dressing, while a whole crackle of bantering conversation arose. A few were parading in unconcerned nakedness. Here and there were men of brawn, whose skins shone clear and ruddy. They took splendid poses, standing massively like chiefs. When they had dressed in their ungainly garments, there was an extraordinary change. They then showed bumps and deficiencies of all kinds. There were others who exhibited many deformities. Shoulders were slanting, humped, pulled this way and pulled that way. And notable among these latter men was the little fat man who had refused to allow his head to be glorified. His pudgy form, builded like a pear, bustled to and fro, while he swore in fishwife fashion. It appeared that some article of his apparel had vanished. The young man, attired speedily, went to his friend, the assassin. At first the latter looked dazed at the sight of the youth. This face seemed to be appealing to him through the cloud wastes of his memory. He scratched his neck and reflected. At last he grinned, a broad smile gradually spreading until his countenance was a round illumination. "'Hello, Willie!' he cried cheerily. "'Hello!' said the young man. "'Are you ready to fly?' "'Sure!' The assassin tied his shoe carefully with some twine and came ambling. When he reached the street, the young man experienced no sudden relief from unholy atmospheres. He had forgotten all about them, and had been breathing naturally and with no sensation of discomfort or distress. He was thinking of these things as he walked along the street, when he was suddenly startled by feeling the assassin's hand trembling with excitement, clutching his arm, and when the assassin spoke, his voice went into quavers from a supreme agitation. "'I'll be hully bloomin' blowed if there wasn't a feller with a nightshirt on, up there in that joint!' The youth was bewildered for a moment, but presently he turned to smile indulgently at the assassin's humor. "'Oh, you're a damned liar,' he merely said." whereupon the assassin began to gesture extravagantly and take oath by strange gods. He frantically placed himself at the mercy of remarkable fates if his tale were not true. "'Yes, he did. I cross my heart thousand times,' he protested, and at the time his eyes were large with amazement, his mouth wrinkled in unnatural glee. "'Yes, sir, a nightshirt, a hully-white nightshirt.' You lie. No, sir. I hope to die before I get another ball, if there wasn't a jay with a hully bloomin' white nightshirt. His face was filled with the infinite wonder of it. A hully white nightshirt, he continually repeated. The young man saw the dark entrance to a basement restaurant. There was a sign which read, No mystery about our hash and there were other age-stained and world-battered legends which told him that the place was within his means. He stopped before it and spoke to the assassin. 
I guess I'll get something to eat. At this the assassin, for some reason, appeared to be quite embarrassed. He gazed at the seductive front of the eating place for a moment. Then he started slowly up the street. Well, good-bye, Willie, he said, bravely. For an instant the youth studied the departing figure. Then he called out, Hold on a minute! As they came together, he spoke in a certain fierce way, as if he feared that the other would think him to be weak. Look a here, if you want to get some breakfast, I'll lend you three cents to do it with. But say, look a here, you've got to get out and hustle. I ain't going to support you, or I'll go broke before night. I ain't no millionaire. I take me oath, Willie, said the assassin earnestly. The only thing I really needs is a ball. My throat feels like a frying pan. But as I can't get a ball, why, the next best thing is breakfast. And if you do that for me, by God, I'd say you was the whitest lad I ever see. They spent a few moments in dexterous exchanges of phrases, in which they each protested that the other was, as the assassin had originally said, a respectable gentleman, and they concluded, with mutual assurances, that they were the souls of intelligence and virtue. Then they went into the restaurant. There was a long counter, dimly lighted from hidden sources. Two or three men in soiled white aprons rushed here and there. The youth bought a bowl of coffee for two cents and a roll for one cent. The assassin purchased the same. The bowls were webbed with brown seams, and the tin spoons wore an air of having emerged from the first pyramid. Upon them were black moss-like incrustations of age, and they were bent and scarred from the attacks of long-forgotten teeth. But over their repast the wanderers waxed warm and mellow. The assassin grew affable as the hot mixture went soothingly down his parched throat, and the young man felt courage flow in his veins. Memories began to throng in on the assassin, and he brought forth long tales, intricate, incoherent, delivered with a chattering swiftness as from an old woman. Great job out in Orange. Boss keep you hustling though all time. I was there three days, and then I went and asked him to lend me a dollar. Go go to the devil, he says, and I lose me job. South no good, damn niggers work for twenty-five and thirty cents a day, run white man out, good grub though, easy living. Yes, used to work in Toledo, rafting logs, make two or three dollars a day in the spring, lived high, cold as ice though in the winter. I was raised in northern New York. Oh, oh, oh. You just ought to live there. No beer nor whiskey, though, way off in the woods. But all the good hot grub you can eat. By God, I hung around there as long as I could, till the old man fired me. Get to hell out of here, you worthless skunk. Get to hell out of here and go die, he says. You're a hell of a father, I says. You are, and I quit him. As they were passing from the dim eating place, they encountered an old man who was trying to steal forth with a tiny package of food. But a tall man with an indomitable mustache stood dragon fashion, barring the way of escape. They heard the old man raise a plaintive protest. Ah, you always want to know what I take out, and you never see that I usually bring a package in here from my place of business. As the wanderers trudged slowly along Park Row, the assassin began to expand and grow blithe. "'By God, we've been living like kings,' he said, smacking appreciative lips. "'Look out, or we'll have to pay for it tonight,' said the youth, with gloomy warning. But the assassin refused to turn his gaze toward the future. He went with a limping step, into which he injected a suggestion of lamb-like gambols. His mouth was wreathed in a red grin. In the city hall park, the two wanderers sat down in the little circle of benches, sanctified by traditions of their class. They huddled in their old garments, slumbrously conscious of the march of the hours, 
which for them had no meaning. The people of the street hurrying hither and thither made a blend of black figures, changing yet frieze-like. They walked in their good clothes, as upon important missions, giving no gaze to the two wanderers seated upon the benches. They expressed to the young man his infinite distance from all that he valued. Social position, comfort, the pleasures of living, were unconquerable kingdoms. He felt a sudden awe. And in the background a multitude of buildings, of pitiless hues and sternly high, were to him emblematic of a nation, forcing its regal head into the clouds, throwing no downward glances. In the sublimity of its aspirations, ignoring the wretches who may flounder at its feet. The roar of the city in his ear was to him the confusion of strange tongues, babbling heedlessly. It was the clink of a coin, the voice of the city's hopes, which were to him no hopes. He confessed himself an outcast, and his eyes from under the lowered rim of his hat began to Section 4 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Open Boat, a tale intended to be after the fact, being the experience of four men from the sunk steamer Commodore. 1. None of them knew the color of the sky. Their eyes glanced level and were fastened upon the waves that swept toward them. These waves were of the hue of slate, save for the tops, which were of foaming white, and all of the men knew the colors of the sea. The horizon narrowed and widened, and dipped and rose, and at all times its edge was jagged with waves, that seemed thrust up in points, like rocks. Many a man ought to have a bathtub, larger than the boat which here rode upon the sea. These waves were most wrongfully and barbarously abrupt and tall, and each froth-top was a problem in small-boat navigation. The cook squatted in the bottom, and looked with both eyes at the six inches of gunwale which separated him from the ocean. His sleeves were rolled over his fat forearms, and the two flaps of his unbuttoned vest dangled as he bent to bail out the boat. Often, he said, God, that was a narrow clip. As he remarked it, he invariably gazed eastward over the broken sea. The oiler, steering with one of the two oars in the boat, sometimes raised himself suddenly to keep clear of water that swirled in over the stern. It was a thin little oar, and it seemed often ready to snap. The correspondent, pulling at the other oar, watched the waves and wondered why he was there. The injured captain, lying in the bow, was at this time buried in that profound dejection and indifference which comes, temporarily at least, to even the bravest and most enduring when, willy-nilly, the firm fails, the army loses, the ship goes down. The mind of the master of a vessel is rooted deep in the timbers of her, though he commanded for a day or a decade, and this captain had on him the stern impression of a scene, in the greys of dawn, of seven turned faces, and later a stump of a topmast with a white ball on it, that slashed to and fro at the waves, went low and lower and down. Thereafter there was something strange in his voice. Although steady it was, deep with mourning, and of a quality beyond oration or tears. "'Keep her a little more south, Billy,' said he. "'A little more south, sir,' said the oiler in the stern. A seat on this boat was not unlike a seat upon a bucking bronco, and by the same token a bronco is not much smaller. The craft pranced and reared, and plunged like an animal. As each wave came, and she rose for it, 
she seemed like a horse, making at a fence outrageously high. The manner of her scramble over these walls of water is a mystic thing, and, moreover, at the top of them were ordinarily these problems in white water, the foam racing down from the summit of each wave, requiring a new leap, and a leap from the air. Then, after scornfully bumping a crest, she would slide and race, and splash down a long incline, and arrive bobbing and nodding in front of the next menace. A singular disadvantage of the sea lies in the fact that after successfully surmounting one wave, you discover that there is another behind it just as important and just as nervously anxious to do something effective in the way of swamping boats. In a ten-foot dinghy, one can get an idea of the resources of the sea in the line of waves that is not probable to the average experience which is never at sea in a dinghy. As each slaty wall of water approached, it shut all else from view of the men in the boat, and it was not difficult to imagine that this particular wave was the final outburst of the ocean, the last effort of the grim water. There was a terrible grace in the move of the waves, and they came in silence, save for the snarling of the crests. In the wan light, the faces of the men must have been gray. Their eyes must have glinted in strange ways as they gazed steadily astern. Viewed from a balcony, the whole thing would doubtless have been weirdly picturesque. But the men in the boat had no time to see it. And if they had had leisure, there were other things to occupy their minds. The sun swung steadily up the sky and they knew it was broad day, because the color of the sea changed from slate to emerald green, streaked with amber lights, and the foam was like tumbling snow. The process of the breaking day was unknown to them. They were aware only of this effect upon the color of the waves that rolled toward them. In disjointed sentences, the cook and the correspondent argued as to the difference between a life-saving station and a house of refuge. The cook had said, There's a house of refuge, just north of Mosquito Inlet Light, and as soon as they see us, they'll come off in their boat and pick us up. As soon as who see us, said the correspondent. The crew, said the cook. Houses of refuge don't have crews, said the correspondent. As I understand them, they are only places where clothes and grub are stored for the benefit of shipwrecked people. They don't carry crews. Oh, yes, they do, said the cook. No, they don't, said the correspondent. Well, we're not there yet anyhow, said the oiler in the stern. Well, said the cook, perhaps it's not a house of refuge that I'm thinking of as being near Mosquito Inlet Light. Perhaps it's a life-saving station. We're not there yet said the oiler in the stern. 2. As the boat bounced from the top of each wave, the wind tore through the hair of the hatless men, and as the craft plopped her stern down again, the spray splashed past them. The crest of each of these waves was a hill, from the top of which the men surveyed, for a moment, a broad tumultuous expanse, shining and wind-driven. It was probably splendid, it was probably glorious, this play of the free sea, wild with lights of emerald and white and amber. Bully good thing it's an onshore wind, said the cook. If not, where would we be? Wouldn't have a show. That's right, said the correspondent. The busy oiler nodded his assent. Then the captain, in the bow, chuckled in a way that expressed humor, contempt, tragedy, all in one. Do you think we've got much of a show now, boys? said he. Whereupon the three were silent, save for a trifle of hemming and hawing. To express any particular optimism at this time, they felt to be childish and stupid, but they all doubtless possessed this sense of the situation in their mind. A young man thinks doggedly at such times. On the other hand, 
the ethics of their condition was decidedly against any open suggestion of hopelessness. So they were silent. Oh, well, said the captain, soothing his children, we'll get ashore all right. But there was that in his tone which made them think. So the oiler quoth, Yes, if this wind holds. The cook was bailing. Yes, if we don't catch hell in the surf. Canton flannel gulls flew near and far. Sometimes they sat down on the sea, near patches of brown seaweed, that rolled out on the waves with a movement like carpets on a line in a gale. The birds sat comfortably in groups, and they were envied by some in the dinghy, for the wrath of the sea was no more to them than it was to a covey of prairie chickens a thousand miles inland. Often they came very close, and stared at the men with black bead-like eyes. At these times they were uncanny and sinister in their unblinking scrutiny, and the men hooted angrily at them telling them to be gone. One came, and evidently decided to alight on the top of the captain's head. The bird flew parallel to the boat, and did not circle, but made short sidelong jumps in the air, in chicken fashion. His black eyes were wistfully fixed upon the captain's head. "'Ugly brute,' said the oiler to the bird. "'You look as if you were made with a jackknife.' The cook and the correspondent swore darkly at the creature. The captain naturally wished to knock it away with the end of the heavy painter, but he did not dare to do it, because anything resembling an emphatic gesture would have capsized this freighted boat. And so, with his open hand, the captain gently and carefully waved the gull away. After it had been discouraged from the pursuit, the captain breathed easier on account of his hair, and others breathed easier, because the bird struck their minds at this time as being somehow gruesome and ominous. In the meantime, the oiler and the correspondent rode, and also they rode. They sat together in the same seat, and each rode an oar. Then the oiler took both oars, then the correspondent took both oars, then the oiler, then the correspondent. They rode and they rode. The very ticklish part of the business was when the time came for the reclining one in the stern to take his turn at the oars. By the very last star of truth, it is easier to steal eggs from under a hen than it was to change seats in the dinghy. First the man in the stern slid his hand along the thwart and moved with care, as if it were of Sevra. Then the man in the rowing seat slid his hand along the other thwart. It was all done with most extraordinary care. As the two sidled past each other, the whole party kept watchful eyes on the coming wave, and the captain cried, Look out now! Steady there! The brown mats of seaweed that appeared from time to time were like islands, bits of earth. They were traveling, apparently, neither one way nor the other. They were, to all intents, stationary. They informed the men in the boat that it was making progress slowly toward the land. The captain, rearing cautiously in the bow, after the dinghy soared on a great swell, said that he had seen the lighthouse at Mosquito Inlet. Presently the cook remarked that he had seen it. The correspondent was at the oars then, and for some reason he too wished to look at the lighthouse but his back was toward the far shore, and the waves were important, and for some time he could not seize an opportunity to turn his head. But at last there came a wave more gentle than the others, and when at the crest of it he swiftly scoured the western horizon. "'See it?' said the captain. "'No,' said the correspondent slowly. "'I didn't see anything.' "'Look again,' said the captain. He pointed. It's exactly in that direction. At the top of another wave, the correspondent did as he was bid, and this time his eyes chanced on a small still thing on the edge of the swaying horizon. It was precisely like the point of a pen. It took an anxious eye to find a lighthouse so tiny. Think we'll make it, Captain? 
If this wind holds and the boat don't swamp, we can't do much else, said the captain. The little boat, lifted by each towering sea, and splashed viciously by the crests, made progress that in the absence of seaweed was not apparent to those in her. She seemed just a wee thing, wallowing, miraculously top up, at the mercy of five oceans. Occasionally a great spread of water, like white flames, swarmed into her. "'Bail her, cook,' said the captain serenely. "'All right, captain,' said the cheerful cook. Three. It would be difficult to describe the subtle brotherhood of men that was here established on the seas. No one said that it was so, no one mentioned it, but it dwelt in the boat, and each man felt it warm him. They were a captain, an oiler, a cook, and a correspondent, and they were friends, friends in a more curiously iron-bound degree than may be common. The hurt captain, lying against the water-jar in the bow, spoke always in a low voice and calmly, but he could never command a more ready and swiftly obedient crew than the motley three of the dinghy. It was more than a mere recognition of what was best for the common safety. There was surely in it a quality that was personal and heartfelt. And after this devotion to the commander of the boat, there was this comradeship that the correspondent, for instance, who had been taught to be cynical of men, knew even at the time, was the best experience of his life. But no one said that it was so. No one mentioned it. "'I wish we had a sail,' remarked the captain. "'We might try my overcoat on the end of an oar, and give you two boys a chance to rest.' So the cook and the correspondent— held the mast, and spread wide the overcoat. The oiler steered, and the little boat made good way with her new rig. Sometimes the oiler had to scull sharply, to keep a sea from breaking into the boat, but otherwise sailing was a success. Meanwhile the lighthouse had been growing slowly larger. It had now almost assumed color, and appeared like a little gray shadow on the sky. The man at the oars could not be prevented from turning his head rather often, to try for a glimpse of this little gray shadow. At last, from the top of each wave, the men in the tossing boat could see land. Even as the lighthouse was an upright shadow on the sky, this land seemed a long black shadow on the sea. It certainly was thinner than paper. We must be about opposite New Smyrna said the cook, who had coasted this shore often in schooners. Captain, by the way, I believe they abandoned that life-saving station there, about a year ago. Did they? said the captain. The wind slowly died away. The cook and the correspondent were not now obliged to slave in order to hold high the oar. But the waves continued their old impetuous swooping at the dinghy, and the little craft, no longer under way, struggled woundily over them. The oiler, or the correspondent, took the oars again. Shipwrecks are apropos of nothing. If men could only train for them, and have them occur when the men had reached pink condition, there would be less drowning at sea. Of the four in the dinghy, none had slept any time worth mentioning, for two days and two nights previous to embarking in the dinghy, and in the excitement of clambering about the deck of a foundering ship, they had also forgotten to eat heartily. For these reasons, and for others, neither the oiler nor the correspondent was fond of rowing at this time. The correspondent wondered ingenuously how in the name of all that was sane could there be people who thought it was amusing to row a boat. It was not an amusement, it was a diabolical punishment, and even a genius of mental aberrations could never conclude that it was anything but a horror to the muscles and a crime against the back. He mentioned to the boat in general how the amusement of rowing struck him, and the weary-faced oiler smiled in full sympathy. Previously to the foundering, by the way, 
the oiler had worked double watch in the engine room of the ship. "'Take her easy now, boys,' said the captain. "'Don't spend yourselves. If we have to run a surf, you'll need all your strength, because we'll sure have to swim for it. Take your time.' Slowly the land arose from the sea. From a black line it became a line of black and a line of white, trees and sand. Finally the captain said that he could make out a house on the shore. "'That's the house of refuge, sure,' said the cook. "'They'll see us before long and come out after us.' The distant lighthouse reared high. "'The keeper ought to be able to make us out now, if he's looking through a glass.' said the captain. He'll notify the life-saving people. None of those other boats could have got ashore to give word of the wreck, said the oiler, in a low voice, else the lifeboat would be out hunting us. Slowly and beautifully the land loomed out of the sea. The wind came again. It had veered from the northeast to the southeast. Finally a new sound struck the ears of the men in the boat. It was the low thunder of the surf on the shore. "'We'll never be able to make the lighthouse now,' said the captain. "'Swing her head a little more north, Billy,' said he. "'A little more north, sir,' said the oiler. Whereupon the little boat turned her nose once more down the wind. And all but the oarsmen watched the shore grow. Under the influence of this expansion, doubt— and direful apprehension was leaving the minds of the men. The management of the boat was still most absorbing, but it could not prevent a quiet cheerfulness. In an hour, perhaps, they would be ashore. Their backbones had become thoroughly used to balancing in the boat, and they now rode this wild colt of a dinghy like circus men. The correspondent thought that he had been drenched to the skin, but happening to feel in the top pocket of his coat, he found therein eight cigars. Four of them were soaked with sea-water. Four were perfectly scathless. After a search, somebody produced three dry matches, and thereupon the four waifs rowed impudently in their little boat, and with an assurance of an impending rescue shining in their eyes, puffed at the big cigars and judged well and ill of all men. Everybody took a drink of water. 4. Cook, remarked the captain, there don't seem to be any signs of life about your house of refuge. No, replied the cook, funny they don't see us. A broad stretch of lowly coast lay before the eyes of the men. It was of dunes, topped with dark vegetation. The roar of the surf was plain, and sometimes they could see the white lip of a wave as it spun up the beach. A tiny house was blocked out black upon the sky. Southward, the slim lighthouse lifted its little gray length. Tide, wind, and waves were swinging the dinghy northward. "'Funny they don't see us,' said the men. The surf's roar was here dulled but its tone was, nevertheless, thunderous and mighty. As the boat swam over the great rollers, the men sat listening to this roar. "'We'll swamp, sure,' said everybody. It is fair to say here that there was not a life-saving station within twenty miles in either direction, but the men did not know this fact, and in consequence they made dark and opprobrious remarks concerning the eyesight of the nation's lifesavers. Four scowling men sat in the dinghy, and surpassed records in the invention of epithets. Funny they don't see us. The light-heartedness of a former time had completely faded. To their sharpened minds it was easy to conjure pictures of all kinds of incompetency and blindness, and, indeed, cowardice. There was the shore of the populous land, and it was bitter and bitter to them that from it came no sign. Well, said the captain, ultimately, I suppose we'll have to make a try for ourselves. If we stay out here too long, we'll none of us have strength left to swim after the boat swamps. And so the oiler, who was at the oars, 
turned the boat straight for the shore. There was a sudden tightening of muscle. There was some thinking. "'If we don't all get ashore,' said the captain, "'I suppose you fellows know where to send news of my finish.' They then briefly exchanged some addresses and admonitions. As for the reflections of the men, there was a great deal of rage in them. Perchance they might be formulated thus. If I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, why, in the name of the seven mad gods who rule the sea, was I allowed to come thus far and contemplate sand and trees? Was I brought here merely to have my nose dragged away? as I was about to nibble the sacred cheese of life. It is preposterous. If this old ninny-woman, Fate, cannot do better than this, she should be deprived of the management of men's fortunes. She is an old hen, who knows not her intention. If she has decided to drown me, why did she not do it in the beginning, and save me all this trouble? The whole affair is absurd." But no, she cannot mean to drown me. She dare not drown me. She cannot drown me. Not after all this work. Afterward, the man might have had an impulse to shake his fist at the clouds. You just drown me now, and then hear what I call you. The billows that came at this time were more formidable. They seemed always just about to break and roll over the little boat in a turmoil of foam. There was a preparatory and long growl in the speech of them. No mind unused to the sea would have concluded that the dinghy could ascend these sheer heights in time. The shore was still afar. The oiler was a wily surfman. Boys, he said swiftly, she won't live three minutes more, and we're too far out to swim. Shall I take her to sea again, Captain? Yes, go ahead, said the Captain. This oiler, by a series of quick miracles and fast and steady oarsmanship, turned the boat in the middle of the surf and took her safely to sea again. There was a considerable silence as the boat bumped over the furrowed sea to deeper water. Then somebody in gloom spoke. Well, anyhow, they must have seen us from the shore by now. The gulls went in slanting flight up the wind toward the gray desolate east. A squall, marked by dingy clouds, and clouds brick-red, like smoke from a burning building, appeared from the southeast. What do you think of those life-saving people? Ain't they peaches? Funny they haven't seen us. Maybe they think we're out here for sport. Maybe they think we're fishing. Maybe they think we're damned fools. It was a long afternoon. A changed tide tried to force them southward, but wind and wave said northward. Far ahead, where coastline, sea, and sky formed their mighty angle, there were little dots which seemed to indicate a city on the shore. St. Augustine! The captain shook his head. Too near Mosquito Inlet. And the oiler rode, and then the correspondent rode, then the oiler rode. It was a weary business. The human back can become the seat of more aches and pains than are registered in books for the composite anatomy of a regiment. It is a limited area, but it can become the theater of innumerable muscular conflicts, tangles, wrenches, knots, and other comforts. Did you ever like to row, Billy? asked the correspondent. No, said the oiler. Hang it. When one exchanged the rowing seat for a place in the bottom of the boat, he suffered a bodily depression that caused him to be careless of everything, save an obligation to wiggle one finger. There was cold seawater swashing to and fro in the boat, and he lay in it. His head, pillowed on a thwart, was within an inch of the swirl of a wave crest, and sometimes a particularly obstreperous sea came in board and drenched him once more. But these matters did not annoy him. It is almost certain that if the boat had capsized, he would have tumbled comfortably out upon the ocean, as if he felt sure that it was a great soft mattress. 
Look, there's a man on the shore. Where? There. See him? See him? Yes, sure. He's walking along. Now he's stopped. Look, he's facing us. He's waving at us. So he is, by thunder. Ah, oh, now we're all right. Now we're all right. There'll be a boat out here for us in half an hour. He's going on. He's running. He's going up to that house there. The remote beach seemed lower than the sea, and it required a searching glance to discern the little black figure. The captain saw a floating stick, and they rowed to it. A bath towel was by some weird chance in the boat, and, tying this on the stick, the captain waved it. The oarsman did not dare turn his head, so he was obliged to ask questions. What's he doing now? He's standing still again. He's looking, I think. There he goes again toward the house. Now he's stopped again. Is he waving at us? No, not now. He was, though. Look, there comes another man. He's running. Look at him go, would you? Why, he's on a bicycle. Now he's met the other man. They're both waving at us. Look. There comes something up the beach. What the devil is that thing? Why, it looks like a boat. Why, certainly it's a boat. No, it's on wheels. Yes, so it is. Well, that must be the lifeboat. They drag them along shore on a wagon. That's the lifeboat, sure. No, by. It's, it's an omnibus. I tell you, it's a lifeboat. It is not. It's an omnibus. I can see it plain. See? One of those big hotel omnibuses. By thunder, you're right. It's an omnibus sure as fate. What do you suppose they are doing with an omnibus? Maybe they are going around collecting the life crew, hey? That's it, likely. Look, there's a fellow waving a little black flag. He's standing on the steps of the omnibus. There come those other two fellows. Now they're all talking together. Look at the fellow with the flag. Maybe he ain't waving it. That ain't a flag, is it? That's his coat. Why, certainly that's his coat. So it is. It's his coat. He's taken it off and is waving it behind his head. But would you look at him swing it? Oh, say, there isn't any life-saving station there. That's just a winter resort hotel omnibus that has brought over some of the boarders to see us drown. What's that idiot with the coat mean? Why is he signaling, anyhow? It looks as if he were trying to tell us to go north. There must be a life-saving station up there. No, he thinks we're fishing. Just giving us a merry hand. See? Ah, there, Willie. Well, I wish I could make something of those signals. What do you suppose he means? He don't mean anything. He's just playing. Well, if he'd just signal us to try the surf again or to go to sea and wait, or go north, or go south, or go to hell. There would be some reason in it. But look at him. He just stands there and keeps his coat revolving like a wheel. The ass. Look, there come more people. Now there's quite a mob. Look, isn't that a boat? Where? Oh, I see what you mean. No, that's no boat. That fellow is still waving his coat. He must think we like to see him do that. Why don't he quit it? It don't mean anything. I don't know. I think he is trying to make us go north. It must be that there's a life-saving station there somewhere. Say, he ain't tired yet. Look at him wave. Wonder how long he can keep that up. He's been revolving his coat ever since he caught sight of us. He's an idiot. Why aren't they getting men to bring a boat out? A fishing boat. One of those big yawls could come out here all right. Why don't he do something? Oh, it's all right now. They'll have a boat out here for us in less than no time, now that they've seen us. A faint yellow tone came into the sky, over the low land. The shadows on the sea slowly deepened. The wind bore coldness with it, and the men began to shiver. Holy smoke, said one, allowing his voice to express his impious mood. If we keep on monkeying out here, if we've got to flounder out here all night. Oh, we'll never have to stay out here all night. Don't you worry. They've seen us now, and it won't be long before they'll come chasing out after us. The shore grew dusky. The man waving a coat blended gradually into this gloom, 
and it swallowed in the same manner the omnibus and the group of people. The spray, when it dashed uproariously over the side, made the voyager shrink and swear like men who had been branded. I'd like to catch the chump who waved the coat. I feel like soaking him one just for luck. Why, what did he do? Oh, nothing. But then he seemed so damn cheerful. In the meantime, the oiler rode, and then the correspondent rode, and then the oiler rode, gray-faced and bowed forward. They mechanically, turn by turn, plied the leaden oars. The form of the lighthouse had vanished from the southern horizon, and finally a pale star appeared, just lifting from the sea. The streaked saffron in the west passed before the all-merging darkness, and the sea to the east was black. The land had vanished, and was expressed only by the low and drear thunder of the surf. If I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, why, in the name of the seven mad gods who rule the sea, was I allowed to come thus far and contemplate sand and trees? Was I brought here merely to have my nose dragged away, as if I were about to nibble the sacred cheese of life? The patient captain, drooped over the water-jar, was sometimes obliged to speak to the oarsman. Keep her head up, keep her head up, keep her head up, sir. The voices were weary and low. This was surely a quiet evening. All save the oarsman lay heavily and listlessly in the boat's bottom. As for him, his eyes were just capable of noting the tall black waves that swept forward in a most sinister silence, save for an occasional subdued growl of a crest. The cook's head was on a thwart, and he looked without interest at the water under his nose. He was deep in other scenes. Finally he spoke. Billy, he murmured, dreamfully, what kind of pie do you like best? Five. Pie, said the oiler and the correspondent, agitatedly. Don't talk about those things, blast you. Well, said the cook, I was just thinking about ham sandwiches, and a night on the sea in an open boat is a long night. As darkness settled finally, the shine of the light, lifting from the sea in the south, changed to full gold. On the northern horizon a new light appeared, a small bluish gleam on the edge of the waters. These two lights were the furniture of the world, otherwise there was nothing but waves. Two men huddled in the stern, and distances were so magnificent in the dinghy that the rower was enabled to keep his feet partly warmed by thrusting them under his companions. Their legs indeed extended far under the rowing seat, until they touched the feet of the captain forward. Sometimes, despite the efforts of the tired oarsmen, a wave came piling into the boat, an icy wave of the night, and the chilling water soaked them anew. They would twist their bodies for a moment and groan, and sleep the dead sleep once more while the water in the boat gurgled about them as the craft rocked. The plan of the oiler and the correspondent was for one to row until he lost the ability, and then arouse the other from his seawater couch in the bottom of the boat. The oiler plied the oars until his head drooped forward, and the overpowering sleep blinded him, and he rowed yet afterward. Then he touched a man in the bottom of the boat and called his name. "'Will you spell me for a little while?' he said, meekly. "'Sure, Billy,' said the correspondent, awakening and dragging himself to a sitting position. They exchanged places carefully, and the oiler, cuddling down in the seawater at the cook's side, seemed to go to sleep instantly. The particular violence of the sea had ceased. The waves came without snarling. The obligation of the man at the oars was to keep the boat headed, so that the tilt of the rollers would not capsize her, and to preserve her from filling when the crest rushed past. The black waves were silent and hard to be seen in the darkness. 
often one was almost upon the boat before the oarsman was aware. In a low voice the correspondent addressed the captain. He was not sure that the captain was awake, although this iron man seemed to be always awake. Captain, shall I keep her making for the light north, sir? The same steady voice answered him. Yes, keep it about two points off the port bow. The cook had tied a life belt about himself, in order to get even the warmth which this clumsy cork contrivance could donate, and he seemed almost stove-like when a rower, whose teeth invariably chattered wildly as soon as he ceased his labor, dropped down to sleep. The correspondent, as he rowed, looked down at the two men asleep underfoot. The cook's arm was around the oiler's shoulders, and, with their fragmentary clothing and haggard faces, they were the babes of the sea, a grotesque rendering of the old babes in the wood. Later he must have grown stupid at his work, for suddenly there was a growling of water, and a crest came with a roar and a swash into the boat, and it was a wonder that it did not set the cook afloat in his life-belt. The cook continued to sleep, but the oiler sat up, blinking his eyes and shaking with the new cold. "'Oh, I'm awful sorry, Billy,' said the correspondent contritely. "'That's all right, old boy,' said the oiler, and lay down again, and was asleep. Presently it seemed that even the captain dozed, and the correspondent thought that he was the one man afloat on all the oceans. The wind had a voice as it came over the waves, and it was sadder than the end. There was a long, loud swishing astern of the boat, and a gleaming trail of phosphorescence, like blue flame, was furrowed on the black waters. It might have been made by a monstrous knife. Then there came a stillness, while the correspondent breathed with the open mouth and looked at the sea. Suddenly there was another swish and another long flash of bluish light, and this time it was alongside the boat and might almost have been reached with an oar. The correspondent saw an enormous fin speed like a shadow through the water, hurling the crystalline spray and leaving the long glowing trail. The correspondent looked over his shoulder at the captain. His face was hidden, and he seemed to be asleep. He looked at the babes of the sea. They were certainly asleep. So, being bereft of sympathy, he leaned a little way to one side and swore softly into the sea. But the thing did not then leave the vicinity of the boat, ahead or astern, on one side or the other, at intervals long or short, fled the long sparkling streak, and there was to be heard the whirru of the dark fin. The speed and power of the thing was greatly to be admired. It cut the water like a gigantic and keen projectile. The presence of this biting thing did not affect the man with the same horror that it would if he had been a picnicker. He simply looked at the sea dully and swore in an undertone. Nevertheless, it is true that he did not wish to be alone. He wished one of his companions to awaken by chance and keep him company with it. But the captain hung motionless over the water-jar, and the oiler and the cook in the bottom of the boat were plunged in slumber. 6. If I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, if I am going to be drowned, why, in the name of the seven mad gods who rule the sea, was I allowed to come thus far and contemplate sand and trees? During this dismal night it may be remarked that a man would conclude that it was really the intention of the seven mad gods to drown him, despite the abominable injustice of it, for it was certainly an abominable injustice to drown a man who had worked so hard, so hard. The man felt it would be a crime most unnatural. Other people had drowned at sea, since galleys swarmed with painted sails, but still. When it occurs to a man that nature does not regard him as important, 
and that she feels she would not maim the universe by disposing of him. He at first wishes to throw bricks at the temple, and he hates deeply the fact that there are no brick and no temples. Any visible expression of nature would surely be pelleted with his jeers. Then, if there be no tangible thing to hoot, he feels, perhaps, the desire to confront a personification and indulge in pleas, bowed to one knee, with hand supplicant, saying, Yes, but I love myself. A high cold star on a winter's night is the word he feels she says to him. Thereafter he knows the pathos of his situation. The men in the dinghy had not discussed these matters, but each had, no doubt, reflected upon them in silence and according to his mind. There was seldom any expression upon their faces, save the general one of complete weariness. Speech was devoted to the business of the boat. To chime the notes of his emotion, a verse mysteriously entered the correspondent's head. He had even forgotten that he had forgotten this verse, but it suddenly was in his mind. A soldier of the Legion lay dying in Algiers. There was a lack of woman's nursing, there was a dearth of woman's tears. But a comrade stood beside him, and he took that comrade's hand, and he said, I shall never see my own, my native land. In his childhood, the correspondent had been made acquainted with the fact that a soldier of the Legion lay dying in Algiers, but he had never regarded the fact as important. Myriads of his schoolfellows had informed him of the soldier's plight, but the dinning had naturally ended by making him perfectly indifferent. He had never considered it his affair that a soldier of the Legion lay dying in Algiers, nor had it appeared to him as a matter for sorrow. It was less to him than the breaking of a pencil's point. Now, however, it quaintly came to him as a human living thing. It was no longer merely a picture of a few throws in the breast of a poet. Meanwhile drinking tea and warming his feet at the grate, it was an actuality, stern, mournful, and fine. The correspondent plainly saw the soldier. He lay on the sand, with his feet out straight and still. While his pale left hand was upon his chest, in an attempt to thwart the going of his life, the blood came between his fingers. In the far Algerian distance, a city of low square forms was set against a sky that was faint with the last sunset hues. The correspondent, plying the oars, and dreaming of the slow and slower movements of the lips of the soldier, was moved by a profound and perfectly impersonal comprehension. He was sorry for the soldier of the Legion, who lay dying in Algiers. The thing which had followed the boat and waited had evidently grown bored at the delay. There was no longer to be heard the slash of the cut water, and there was no longer the flame of the long trail. The light in the north still glimmered, but it was apparently no nearer to the boat. Sometimes the boom of the surf rang in the correspondent's ears, and he turned the craft seaward then and rowed harder. Southward, someone had evidently built a watchfire on the beach. It was too low and too far to be seen but it made a shimmering, roseate reflection upon the bluff back of it, and this could be discerned from the boat. The wind came stronger, and sometimes a wave suddenly raged out like a mountain cat, and there was to be seen the sheen and sparkle of a broken crest. The captain, in the bow, moved on his water-jar and sat erect. "'Pretty long night,' he observed to the correspondent. He looked at the shore. Those life-saving people take their time. Did you see that shark playing around? Yes, I saw him. He was a big fellow, all right. Wish I had known you were awake. Later the correspondent spoke into the bottom of the boat. Billy! There was a slow and gradual disentanglement. Billy, will you spell me? Sure, said the oiler. 
As soon as the correspondent touched the cold, comfortable seawater in the bottom of the boat, and had huddled close to the cook's life-belt, he was deep in sleep, despite the fact that his teeth played all the popular airs. This sleep was so good to him that it was but a moment before he heard a voice call his name, in a tone that demonstrated the last stages of exhaustion. "'Will you spell me?' "'Sure, Billy.' The light in the north had mysteriously vanished, but the correspondent took his course from the wide-awake captain. Later in the night they took the boat farther out to sea, and the captain directed the cook to take one oar at the stern and keep the boat facing the seas. He was to call out if he should hear the thunder of the surf. This plan enabled the oiler and the correspondent to get respite together. We'll give those boys a chance to get into shape again, said the captain. They curled down and, after a few preliminary chatterings and trembles, slept once more the dead sleep. Neither knew they had bequeathed to the cook the company of another shark, or perhaps the same shark. As the boat caroused on the waves, spray occasionally bumped over the side and gave them a fresh soaking but this had no power to break their repose. The ominous slash of the wind and the water affected them as it would have affected mummies. Boys, said the cook, with the notes of every reluctance in his voice, she's drifted in pretty close. I guess one of you had better take her to sea again. The correspondent, aroused, heard the crash of the toppled crests. As he was rowing, the captain gave him some whiskey and water, and this steadied the chills out of him. If I ever get ashore and anybody shows me even a photograph of an oar. At last there was a short conversation. Billy, will you spell me? Sure, said the oiler. 7. When the correspondent again opened his eyes, the sea and the sky were each of the gray hue of the dawning. Later, carmine and gold was painted upon the waters. The morning appeared finally in its splendor, with a sky of pure blue, and the sunlight flamed on the tips of the waves. On the distant dunes were set many little black cottages, and a tall white windmill reared above them. No man, nor dog, nor bicycle appeared on the beach. The cottages might have formed a deserted village. The voyager scanned the shore. A conference was held in the boat. Well, said the captain, if no help is coming, we might better try a run through the surf right away. If we stay out here much longer, we will be too weak to do anything for ourselves at all. The other silently acquiesced in this reasoning. The boat was headed for the beach. The correspondent wondered if none ever ascended the tall wind tower and if then they never looked seaward. This tower was a giant, standing with its back to the plight of the ants. It represented in a degree, to the correspondent, the serenity of nature amid the struggles of the individual, nature in the wind, and nature in the vision of men. She did not seem cruel to him then, nor beneficent, nor treacherous, nor wise but she was indifferent, flatly indifferent. It is perhaps plausible that a man in this situation, impressed with the unconcern of the universe, should see the innumerable flaws of his life, and have them taste wickedly in his mind, and wish for another chance. A distinction between right and wrong seems absurdly clear to him, then, in this new ignorance of the grave edge, and he understands that if he were given another opportunity, he would mend his conduct and his words, and be better and brighter during an introduction or at a tea. Now, boys, said the captain, she is going to swamp, sure. All we can do is work her in as far as possible, and then when she swamps, pile out and scramble for the beach. Keep cool now, and don't jump until she swamps, sure. The oiler took the oars. Over his shoulder he scanned the surf. Captain, he said, 
I think I'd better bring her about, and keep her head on to the seas and back her in. All right, Billy, said the captain. Back her in. The oiler swung the boat then, and, seated in the stern, the cook and the correspondent were obliged to look over their shoulders to contemplate the lonely and indifferent shore. The monstrous inshore rollers heaved the boat high until the men were again enabled to see the white sheets of water scudding up the slanted beach. "'We won't get in very close,' said the captain. Each time a man would rest his attention from the rollers, he turned his glance toward the shore, and in the expression of the eyes during this contemplation there was a singular quality. The correspondent, observing the others, knew that they were not afraid, but the full meaning of their glances was shrouded. As for himself, he was too tired to grapple fundamentally with the fact. He tried to coerce his mind into thinking of it, but the mind was dominated at this time by the muscles, and the muscles said they did not care. It merely occurred to him that if he should drown it would be a shame. There were no hurried words, no pallor, no plain agitation. The men simply looked at the shore. Now, remember to get well clear of the boat when you jump, said the captain. Seaward, the crest of a roller, suddenly fell with a thunderous crash, and the long white comber came roaring down upon the boat. Steady now, said the captain. The men were silent. They turned their eyes from the shore to the comber and waited. The boat slid up the incline, leaped at the furious top, bounced over it, and swung down the long back of the wave. Some water had been shipped, and the cook bailed it out. But the next crest crashed also. The tumbling, boiling flood of white water caught the boat and whirled it almost perpendicular. Water swarmed in from all sides. The correspondent had his hands on the gunwale at this time, and when the water entered at that place he swiftly withdrew his fingers, as if he objected to wetting them. The little boat, drunken with this weight of water, reeled and snuggled deeper into the sea. "'Bail her out, cook! Bail her out!' said the captain. "'All right, captain,' said the cook. "'Now, boys, the next one will do for us sure,' said the oiler. "'Mind to jump clear of the boat.' The third wave moved forward, huge, furious, implacable. It fairly swallowed the dinghy, and almost simultaneously the men tumbled into the sea. A piece of life-belt had lain in the bottom of the boat, and as the correspondent went overboard, he held this to his chest with his left hand. The January water was icy, and he reflected immediately that it was colder than he had expected to find it on the coast of Florida. This appeared to his dazed mind as a fact important enough to be noted at the time. The coldness of the water was sad, it was tragic. This fact was somehow so mixed and confused with his opinion of his own situation that it seemed almost a proper reason for tears. The water was cold. When he came to the surface, he was conscious of little but the noisy water. Afterward he saw his companions in the sea. The oiler was ahead in the race. He was swimming strongly and rapidly. Off to the correspondent's left, the cook's great white and corked back bulged out of the water, and in the rear the captain was hanging with his one good hand to the keel of the overturned dinghy. There is a certain immovable quality to a shore, and the correspondent wondered at it amid the confusion of the sea. It seemed also very attractive, but the correspondent knew that it was a long journey, and he paddled leisurely. The piece of life preserver lay under him, and sometimes he whirled down the incline of a wave, as if he were on a hand sled. But finally he arrived at a place in the sea where travel was beset with difficulty. He did not pause swimming to inquire what manner of current had caught him, but there his progress ceased. The shore was set before him like a bit of scenery on a stage, 
and he looked at it and understood with his eyes each detail of it. As the cook passed, much farther to the left, the captain was calling to him, "'Turn over on your back, cook. Turn over on your back and use the oar. All right, sir.' The cook turned on his back and, paddling with an oar, went ahead as if he were a canoe. Presently the boat also passed to the left of the correspondent, with the captain clinging with one hand to the keel. He would have appeared like a man raising himself to look over a board fence, if it were not for the extraordinary gymnastics of the boat. The correspondent marveled that the captain could still hold to it. They passed on, nearer to shore, the oiler, the cook, the captain, and following them went the water-jar bouncing gaily over the seas. The correspondent remained in the grip of his strange new enemy, a current. The shore, with its white slope of sand and its green bluff, topped with little silent cottages, was spread like a picture before him. It was very near to him then, but he was impressed as one who in a gallery looks at a scene from Brittany or Holland. He thought, I am going to drown. Can it be possible? Can it be possible? Can it be possible? Perhaps an individual must consider his own death to be the final phenomenon of nature. But later, a wave, perhaps, whirled him out of this small deadly current, for he found suddenly that he could again make progress toward the shore. Later still, he was aware that the captain, clinging with one hand to the keel of the dinghy, had his face turned away from the shore and toward him, and was calling his name. Come, come to the boat! In his struggle to reach the captain and the boat, he reflected that when one gets properly wearied, drowning must really be a comfortable arrangement, a cessation of hostilities, accompanied by a large degree of relief, and he was glad of it, for the main thing in his mind for some months had been horror of the temporary agony. He did not wish to be hurt. Presently he saw a man running along the shore. He was undressing with most remarkable speed. Coat, trousers, shirt, everything flew magically off him. "'Come to the boat,' called the captain. "'All right, captain.' As the correspondent paddled, he saw the captain let himself down to bottom and leave the boat. Then the correspondent performed his one little marvel of the voyage. A large wave caught him and flung him with ease and supreme speed, completely over the boat and far beyond it. It struck him even then as an event in gymnastics and a true miracle of the sea. An overturned boat in the surf is not a plaything to a swimming man. The correspondent arrived in water that reached only to his waist, but his condition did not enable him to stand for more than a moment. Each wave knocked him into a heap, and the undertow pulled at him. Then he saw the man who had been running and undressing, and undressing and running, come bounding into the water. He dragged ashore the cook, and then waded towards the captain, but the captain waved him away and sent him to the correspondent. He was naked, naked as a tree in winter, but a halo was about his head, and he shone like a saint. He gave a strong pull and a long drag and a bully heave at the correspondent's hand. The correspondent, schooled in the minor formulae, said, Thanks, old man. But suddenly the man cried, What's that? He pointed a swift finger. The correspondent said, Go. In the shallows, face downward, lay the oiler. His forehead touched sand that was periodically, between each wave, clear of the sea. The correspondent did not know all that transpired afterward. When he achieved safe ground, he fell, striking the sand with each particular part of his body. It was as if he had dropped from a roof, but the thud was grateful to him. It seems that instantly the beach was populated with men with blankets, clothes, and flasks, 
and women with coffee-pots and all the remedies sacred to their minds. The welcome of the land to the men from the sea was warm and generous, but a still and dripping shape was carried slowly up the beach, and the land's welcome for it could only be the different and sinister hospitality of the grave. When it came night, the white waves paced to and fro in the moonlight, and the wind brought the sound of the great sea's voice to the men on shore, and they felt that they could then be interpreted. Section 5 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky. 1. The great Pullman was whirling onward with such dignity of motion that a glance from the window seemed simply to prove that the plains of Texas were pouring eastward. Vast flats of green grass, dull hued spaces of mesquite and cactus, Little groups of frame houses, woods of light and tender trees, all were sweeping into the east, sweeping over the horizon, a precipice. A newly married pair had boarded this train at San Antonio. The man's face was reddened from many days in the wind and sun, and the direct result of his new black clothes was that his brick-colored hands were constantly performing in a most conscious fashion. From time to time he looked down respectfully at his attire. He sat with a hand on each knee, like a man waiting in a barber shop. The glances he devoted to other passengers were furtive and shy. The bride was not pretty, nor was she very young. She wore a dress of blue cashmere, with small reservations of velvet here and there, and with steel buttons abounding. She continually twisted her head to regard her puff sleeves, very stiff, straight, and high. They embarrassed her. It was quite apparent that she had cooked, and that she expected to cook, dutifully. The blushes caused by the careless scrutiny of some passengers, as she had entered the car, were strange to see upon this plain, under-class countenance, which was drawn in placid, almost emotionless lines. They were evidently very happy. "'Ever been in a parlor car before?' he asked, smiling with delight. "'No,' she answered. "'I never was. It's fine, ain't it?' "'Great. And then after a while we'll go forward to the diner and get a big layout. Finest meal in the world. Charge a dollar.' "'Oh, do they?' cried the bride. "'Charge a dollar? Why, that's too much.' For us, ain't it, Jack? Not this trip, anyhow, he answered bravely. We're going to do the whole thing. Later, he explained to her about the train. You see, it's a thousand miles from one end of Texas to the other, and this train runs right across it and never stops but four times. He had the pride of an owner. He pointed out to her the dazzling fittings of the coach, and, in truth, her eyes opened wider as she contemplated the sea-green-figured velvet, the shining brass, silver, and glass, the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil. At one end, a bronze figure sturdily held a support for a separated chamber, and at convenient places on the ceiling were frescoes in olive and silver. To the minds of the pair, their surroundings reflected the glory of their marriage that morning in San Antonio. This was the environment of their new estate, and the man's face, in particular, beamed with an elation that made him appear ridiculous to the negro porter. This individual at times surveyed them from afar with an amused and superior grin. On other occasions he bullied them with skill in ways that did not make it exactly plain to them that they were being bullied. He subtly used all the manners of the most unconquerable kind of snobbery. He oppressed them, but of this oppression they had small knowledge, and they speedily forgot that unfrequently a number of travelers covered them with stares of derisive enjoyment. 
Historically, there was supposed to be something infinitely humorous in their situation. We are due in yellow sky at 342, he said, looking tenderly into her eyes. Oh, are we? she said, as if she had not been aware of it. To evince surprise at her husband's statement was part of her wifely amiability. She took from a pocket a little silver watch, and as she held it before her and stared at it with a frown of attention, the new husband's face shone. I bought it in San Antonio from a friend of mine, he told her gleefully. It's seventeen minutes past twelve, she said, looking up at him with a kind of shy and clumsy coquetry. A passenger, noting this play, grew excessively sardonic and winked at himself in one of the numerous mirrors. At last they went to the dining car. Two rows of negro waiters, in dazzling white suits, surveyed their entrance with the interest, and also the equanimity, of men who had been forewarned. The pair fell to the lot of a waiter, who happened to feel pleasure in steering them through their meal. He viewed them with the manner of a fatherly pilot, his countenance radiant with benevolence. The patronage, entwined with the ordinary deference, was not palpable to them, and yet as they returned to their coach, they showed in their faces a sense of escape. To the left, miles down a long purple slope, was a little ribbon of mist where moved the keening Rio Grande. The train was approaching it at an angle, and the apex was yellow sky. Presently it was apparent that as the distance from yellow sky grew shorter, the husband became commensurately restless. His brick-red hands were more insistent in their prominence. Occasionally he was even rather absent-minded and far away when the bride leaned forward and addressed him. As a matter of truth, Jack Potter was beginning to find the shadow of a deed weigh upon him like a leaden slab. He, the town marshal of Yellow Sky, a man known, liked, and feared in his corner, a prominent person, had gone to San Antonio to meet a girl he believed he loved, and there, after the usual prayers, had actually induced her to marry him without consulting Yellow Sky for any part of the transaction. He was now bringing his bride before an innocent and unsuspecting community. Of course, people in Yellow Sky married as it pleased them, in accordance with a general custom, but such was Potter's thought of his duty to his friends, or of their idea of his duty, or of an unspoken form, which does not control men in these matters, that he felt he was heinous. He had committed an extraordinary crime. Face to face with this girl in San Antonio, and spurred by his sharp impulse, he had gone headlong over all the social hedges. At San Antonio he was like a man hidden in the dark. A knife, to sever any friendly duty, any form, was easy to his hand in that remote city. But the hour of yellow sky, the hour of daylight, was approaching. He knew full well that his marriage was an important thing to his town. It could only be exceeded by the burning of the new hotel. His friends would not forgive him. Frequently he had reflected upon the advisability of telling them by telegraph, but a new cowardice had been upon him. He feared to do it. And now the train was hurrying him toward a scene of amazement, glee, reproach. He glanced out of the window at the line of haze, swinging slowly in toward the train. Yellow Sky had a kind of brass band which played painfully to the delight of the populace. He laughed without heart as he thought of it. If the citizens could dream of his prospective arrival with his bride, they would parade the band at the station and escort them, amid cheers and laughing congratulations, to his adobe home. He resolved that he would use all the devices of speed and planescraft in making the journey from the station to his house. Once within that safe citadel, he could issue some sort of a vocal bulletin and then not go among the citizens until they had time to wear off a little of their enthusiasm. The bride looked anxiously at him. What's worrying you, Jack? He laughed again. 
I'm not worrying, girl. I'm only thinking of yellow sky. She flushed in comprehension. A sense of mutual guilt invaded their minds, and developed a finer tenderness. They looked at each other with eyes softly aglow. But Potter often laughed the same nervous laugh. The flush upon the bride's face seemed quite permanent. The traitor to the feelings of yellow sky narrowly watched the speeding landscape. "'We're nearly there,' he said. Presently the porter came and announced the proximity of Potter's home. He held a brush in his hand, and, with all his airy superiority gone, he brushed Potter's new clothes as the latter slowly turned this way and that way. Potter fumbled out a coin and gave it to the porter as he had seen others do. It was a heavy and muscle-bound business, as that of a man shoeing his first horse. The porter took their bag, and, as the train began to slow, they moved forward to the hooded platform of the car. Presently the two engines and their long string of coaches rushed into the station of yellow sky. "'They have to take water here,' said Potter, from a constricted throat and in mournful cadence as one announcing death. Before the train stopped, his eye had swept the length of the platform, and he was glad and astonished to see there was no one upon it but the station agent, who, with a slightly hurried and anxious air, was walking toward the water tanks. When the train had halted, the porter alighted first, and placed in position a little temporary step. "'Come on, girl,' said Potter hoarsely. As he helped her down, they each laughed on a false note. He took the bag from the negro and bade his wife cling to his arm. As they slunk rapidly away, his hangdog glance perceived that they were unloading the two trunks, and also that the station agent, far ahead, near the baggage car, had turned and was running toward them, making gestures. He laughed and groaned as he laughed, when he noted the first effect of his marital bliss upon yellow sky. He gripped his wife's arm firmly to his side, and they fled. Behind them the porter stood, chuckling fatuously. 2. The California Express on the Southern Railway was due at Yellow Sky in twenty-one minutes. There were six men at the bar of the weary gentleman saloon. One was a drummer who talked a great deal and rapidly. Three were Texans who did not care to talk at that time and two were Mexican sheepherders, who did not talk as a general practice in the weary gentleman's saloon. The barkeeper's dog lay on the boardwalk that crossed in front of the door. His head was on his paws, and he glanced drowsily here and there with the constant vigilance of a dog that is kicked on occasion. Across the sandy street were some vivid green grass plots, so wonderful in appearance amid the sands that burned near them in a blazing sun, that they caused a doubt in the mind. They exactly resembled the grass mats used to represent lawns on the stage. At the cooler end of the railway station, a man without a coat sat in a tilted chair and smoked his pipe. The fresh-cut bank of the Rio Grande circled near the town, and there could be seen beyond it a great plum-colored plain of mesquite. Save for the busy drummer and his companions in the saloon, Yellow Sky was dozing. The newcomer leaned gracefully upon the bar, and recited many tales with the confidence of a bard who has come upon a new field. And at the moment that the old man fell downstairs with the bureau in his arms, the old woman was coming up with two scuttles of coal, and of course— the drummer's tale was interrupted by a young man, who suddenly appeared in the open door. He cried, "'Scratchy Wilson's drunk, and is turned loose with both hands!' The two Mexicans at once set down their glasses, and faded out of the rear entrance of the saloon. The drummer, innocent and jocular, answered, "'All right, old man, suppose he has. Come and have a drink anyhow.' But the information had made such an obvious cleft in every skull in the room, that the drummer was obliged to see its importance. All had become instantly morose. "'Say,' 
said he, mystified. What is this? His three companions made the introductory gesture of eloquent speech, but the young man at the door forestalled them. It means, my friend, he answered, as he came into the saloon, that for the next two hours this town won't be a health resort. The barkeeper went to the door and locked and barred it. Reaching out of the window, he pulled in heavy wooden shutters and barred them. Immediately, a solemn, chapel-like gloom was upon the place. The drummer was looking from one to another. "'But say,' he cried, "'what is this, anyhow? You don't mean there's going to be a gunfight?' "'Don't know whether there'll be a fight or not,' answered one man grimly. "'But there'll be some shootin', some good shootin'. The young man who had warned them waved his hand. "'Oh, there'll be a fight fast enough, if anyone wants it. Anybody can get a fight out there in the street. There's a fight just waiting.' The drummer seemed to be swayed between the interest of a foreigner and a perception of personal danger. "'What did you say his name was?' he asked. "'Scratchy Wilson,' they answered in chorus. "'And will he kill anybody? What are you going to do?' Does this happen often? Does he rampage round like this once a week or so? Can he break in that door? No, he can't break down that door, replied the barkeeper. He's tried it three times, but when he comes you'd better lay down on the floor, stranger. He's dead sure to shoot at it, and a bullet may come through. Thereafter the drummer kept a strict eye on the door. The time had not yet been called for him to hug the floor. But as a minor precaution, he sidled near to the wall. "'Will he kill anybody?' he said again. The men laughed low and scornfully at the question. "'He's out to shoot, and he's out for trouble. Don't see any good in experimenting with him.' "'But what do you do in a case like this? What do you do?' a man responded. "'Why, he and Jack Potter—' But, in chorus, the other men interrupted— Jack Potter's in San Antone. Well, who is he? What's he got to do with it? Oh, he's the town marshal. He goes out and fights Scratchy when he gets on one of these tears. Wow, said the drummer, mopping his brow. Nice job he's got. The voices had toned away to mere whisperings. The drummer wished to ask further questions, which were born of an increasing anxiety and bewilderment. But when he attempted them, the men merely looked at him in irritation and motioned him to remain silent. A tense waiting hush was upon them. In the deep shadows of the room, their eyes shone as they listened for sounds from the street. One man made three gestures at the barkeeper, and the latter, moving like a ghost, handed him a glass and a bottle. The man poured a full glass of whiskey and set down the bottle noiselessly. He gulped the whiskey in a swallow, and turned again toward the door, in immovable silence. The drummer saw that the barkeeper, without a sound, had taken a Winchester from beneath the bar. Later he saw this individual beckoning to him, so he tiptoed across the room. "'You better come with me back of the bar.' "'No, thanks,' said the drummer, perspiring. "'I'd rather be where I can make a break for the back door.' whereupon the man of bottles made a kindly but peremptory gesture. The drummer obeyed it, and finding himself seated on a box, with his head below the level of the bar, balm was laid upon his soul at sight of various zinc and copper fittings that bore a resemblance to plate armor. The barkeeper took a seat comfortably upon an adjacent box. "'You see,' he whispered, this here Scratchy Wilson is a wonder with a gun, a perfect wonder. And when he goes out on a war trail, we hunt our holes, naturally. He's about the last one of the old gang that used to hang out along the river here. He's a terror when he's drunk. When he's sober, he's all right. Kind of simple. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Nicest fellow in town. But when he's drunk, woo! There were periods of stillness. I wish Jack Potter was back from San Antone, said the barkeeper. He shot Wilson up once, in the leg, and he would sail in and pull out the kinks in this thing. Presently they heard from a distance the sound of a shot, followed by three wild yells. 
it instantly removed a bond from the men in the darkened saloon. There was a shuffling of feet. They looked at each other. Here he comes, they said. 3. A man in a maroon-colored flannel shirt, which had been purchased for purposes of decoration, and made, principally, by some Jewish women on the east side of New York, rounded a corner and walked into the middle of the main street of Yellow Sky. In either hand the man held a long, heavy, blue-black revolver. Often he yelled, and these cries rang through a semblance of a deserted village, shrilly flying over the roofs in a volume that seemed to have no relation to the ordinary vocal strength of a man. It was as if the surrounding stillness formed the arch of a tomb over him. These cries of ferocious challenge rang against walls of silence, and his boots had red tops with gilded imprints, of the kind beloved in winter by little sledging boys on the hillsides of New England. The man's face flamed in a rage begot of whiskey. His eyes, rolling and yet keen for ambush, hunted the still doorways and windows. He walked with the creeping movement of the midnight cat. As it occurred to him, he roared menacing information. The long revolvers in his hands were as easy as straws. They were moved with an electric swiftness. The little fingers of each hand played sometimes in a musician's way. Plain from the low collar of the shirt, the cords of his neck straightened and sank as passion moved him. The only sounds were his terrible invitations. The calm adobes preserved their demeanor at the passing of this small thing in the middle of the street. There was no offer of fight, no offer of fight. The man called to the sky. There were no attractions. He bellowed and fumed and swayed his revolver here and everywhere. The dog of the barkeeper of the weary gentleman saloon had not appreciated the advance of events. He yet lay dozing in front of his master's door. At sight of the dog, the man paused and raised his revolver humorously. At sight of the man, the dog sprang up and walked diagonally away with a sullen head and growling. The man yelled, and the dog broke into a gallop. As it was about to enter an alley, there was a loud noise, a whistling, and something spat the ground directly before it. The dog screamed, and, wheeling in terror, galloped headlong in a new direction. Again there was a noise, a whistling, and sand was kicked viciously before it. Fear-stricken, the dog turned and flurried like an animal in a pen. The man stood laughing, his weapons at his hips. Ultimately, the man was attracted by the closed door of the weary gentleman's saloon. He went to it and, hammering with a revolver, demanded drink. The door remaining imperturbable, he picked a bit of paper from the walk and nailed it to the framework with a knife. He then turned his back contemptuously upon this popular resort, and, walking to the opposite side of the street, and spinning there on his heel quickly and lithely, fired at the bit of paper. He missed it by a half inch. He swore at himself and went away. Later he comfortably fusilladed the windows of his most intimate friend. The man was playing with this town. It was a toy for him but still there was no offer of fight. The name of Jack Potter, his ancient antagonist, entered his mind, and he concluded that it would be a glad thing if he should go to Potter's house and, by bombardment, induce him to come out and fight. He moved in the direction of his desire, chanting Apache scalp music. When he arrived at it, Potter's house presented the same still, calm front as had the other adobes. Taking up a strategic position, the man howled a challenge. But this house regarded him as might a great stone god. It gave no sign. After a decent wait, the man howled further challenges, mingling with them wonderful epithets. Presently there came the spectacle of a man churning himself into deepest rage over the immobility of a house. He fumed at it 
as the winter wind attacks a prairie cabin in the north. To the distance there should have gone the sound of a tumult like the fighting of two hundred Mexicans. As necessity bade him, he paused for breath or to reload his revolvers. 4. Potter and his bride walked sheepishly and with speed. Sometimes they laughed together shamefacedly and low. "'Next corner, dear,' he said finally. They put forth the efforts of a pair-walking boat against a strong wind. Potter was about to raise a finger to point the first appearance of the new home, when, as they circled the corner, they came face to face with a man in a maroon-colored shirt, who was feverishly pushing cartridges into a large revolver. Upon the instant the man dropped this revolver to the ground, and, like lightning, whipped another from its holster. The second weapon was aimed at the bridegroom's chest. There was a silence. Potter's mouth seemed to be merely a grave for his tongue. He exhibited an instinct to at once loosen his arm from the woman's grip, and he dropped the bag to the sand. As for the bride, her face had gone as yellow as old cloth. She was a slave to hideous rites, gazing at the apparitional snake. The two men faced each other at a distance of three paces. He of the revolver smiled with a new and quiet ferocity. "'Tried to sneak up on me,' he said. "'Tried to sneak up on me.' His eyes grew more baleful. As Potter made a slight movement, the man thrust his revolver venomously forward. "'No, don't you do it, Jack Potter. Don't you move a finger towards a gun just yet. Don't you move an eyelash.' The time has come for me to settle with you, and I'm going to do it my own way, and loaf along with no interfering. So if you don't want a gun bent on you, just mind what I tell you. Potter looked at his enemy. I ain't got a gun on me, Scratchy, he said. Honest, I ain't. He was stiffening and steadying, but yet somewhere at the back of his mind a vision of the Pullman floated, the sea-green figured velvet, the shining brass, silver and glass the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil, all the glory of their marriage, the environment of the new estate. You know I fight when it comes to fighting, Scratchy Wilson, but I ain't got a gun on me. You'll have to do all the shooting yourself. His enemy's face went livid. He stepped forward and lashed his weapon to and fro before Potter's chest. Don't you tell me you ain't got no gun on you, you whelp. Don't tell me no lie like that. There ain't a man in Texas ever seen you without no gun. Don't take me for no kid. His eyes blazed with light, and his throat worked like a pump. I ain't taking you for no kid, answered Potter. His heels had not moved an inch backward. I'm taking you for a fool. I tell you I ain't got a gun, and I ain't. If you're going to shoot me up, you'd better begin now. You'll never get a chance like this again. So much enforced reasoning had hold on Wilson's rage, he was calmer. "'If you ain't got a gun, why ain't you got a gun?' he sneered. "'Been to Sunday school.' "'I ain't got a gun because I've just come from San Antonio with my wife. I'm married,' said Potter. "'And if I'd thought there was going to be any galoots like you prowling around when I brought my wife home, I'd had a gun, and don't you forget it.' "'Married?' said Scratchy, not at all comprehending. "'Yes, married. I'm married,' said Potter, distinctly. "'Married,' said Scratchy. Seeming for the first time, he saw the drooping, drowning woman at the other man's side. "'No,' he said. He was like a creature allowed a glimpse of another world. He moved a pace backward, and his arm with the revolver dropped to his side. "'Is this—' "'Is this the lady?' he asked. "'Yes, this is the lady,' answered Potter. There was another period of silence. "'Well,' said Wilson, at last, slowly, "'I suppose it's all off now.' "'It's all off if you say so, Scratchy. You know I didn't make the trouble.' Potter lifted his valise. "'Well, I allow it's off, Jack,' said Wilson. He was looking at the ground. "'Married!' He was not a student of chivalry. It was merely that in the presence of this foreign condition 
he was a simple child of the earlier plains. He picked up his starboard revolver, and placing both weapons in their holsters, he Section 6 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blue Hotel, 1. The Palace Hotel at Fort Romper was painted a light blue, a shade that is on the legs of a kind of heron, causing the bird to declare its position against any background. The Palace Hotel, then, was always screaming and howling in a way that made the dazzling winter landscape of Nebraska seem only a gray, swampish hush. It stood alone on the prairie, and when the snow was falling, the town two hundred yards away was not visible. But when the traveler alighted at the railway station, he was obliged to pass the Palace Hotel before he could come upon the company of low clabbered houses which composed Fort Romper and it was not to be thought that any traveller could pass the Palace Hotel without looking at it. Pat Scully, the proprietor, had proved himself a master of strategy when he chose his paints. It is true that on clear days, when the great transcontinental expresses, long lines of swaying Pullmans, swept through Fort Romper, passengers were overcome at the sight and the cult that knows the brown reds and the subdivisions of the dark greens of the east expressed shame, pity, horror, in a laugh. But to the citizens of this prairie town, and to the people who would naturally stop there, Pat Scully had performed a feat. With this opulence and splendor, these creeds, classes, egotisms, that streamed through romper on the rails day after day, they had no color in common. As if the displayed delights of such a blue hotel were not sufficiently enticing, it was Scully's habit to go every morning and evening to meet the leisurely trains that stopped at Romper, and work his seductions upon any man he might see wavering, grip-sack in hand. One morning, when a snow-crusted engine dragged its long string of freight cars and its one-passenger coach to the station, Scully performed the marvel of catching three men. One was a shaky and quick-eyed Swede, with a great shining cheap valise. One was a tall bronzed cowboy, who was on his way to a ranch near the Dakota line. One was a little silent man from the east, who didn't look it, and didn't announce it. Scully practically made them prisoners. He was so nimble and merry and kindly, that each probably felt it would be the height of brutality to try to escape. They trudged off over the creaking board sidewalks in the wake of the eager little Irishman. He wore a heavy fur cap, squeezed tightly down on his head. It caused his two red ears to stick out stiffly, as if they were made of tin. At last, Scully, elaborately, with boisterous hospitality, conducted them through the portals of the Blue Hotel. The room which they entered was small. It seemed to be merely a proper temple for an enormous stove, which, in the center, was humming with godlike violence. At various points on its surface the iron had become luminous and glowed yellow from the heat. Beside the stove Scully's son Johnny was playing high-five with an old farmer who had whiskers both gray and sandy. They were quarreling. Frequently the old farmer turned his face toward a box of sawdust, colored brown from tobacco juice, that was behind the stove, and spat with an air of great impatience and irritation. With a loud flourish of words, Scully destroyed the game of cards, and bustled his son upstairs with part of the baggage of the new guests. He himself conducted them to three basins of the coldest water in the world. The cowboy and the Easterner burnished themselves fiery red with this water, until it seemed to be some kind of a metal polish. The Swede, however, merely dipped his fingers gingerly and with trepidation. It was notable that throughout this series of small ceremonies, 
the three travelers were made to feel that Scully was very benevolent. He was conferring great favors upon them. He handed the towel from one to the other with an air of philanthropic impulse. Afterward they went to the first room, and, sitting about the stove, listened to Scully's officious clamor at his daughters, who were preparing the midday meal. They reflected in the silence of experienced men who tread carefully amid new people. Nevertheless, the old farmer, stationary, invincible in his chair near the warmest part of the stove, turned his face from the sawdust box frequently and addressed a glowing commonplace to the strangers. Usually he was answered in short but adequate sentences by either the cowboy or the Easterner. The Swede said nothing. He seemed to be occupied in making furtive estimates of each man in the room. One might have thought that he had the sense of silly suspicion which comes to guilt. He resembled a badly frightened man. Later, at dinner, he spoke a little, addressing his conversation entirely to Scully. He volunteered that he had come from New York, where for ten years he had worked as a tailor. These facts seemed to strike Scully as fascinating, and afterward he volunteered that he had lived at Romper for fourteen years. The Swede asked about the crops and the price of labor. He seemed barely to listen to Scully's extended replies. His eyes continued to rove from man to man. Finally, with a laugh and a wink, he said that some of these western communities were very dangerous, and after his statement he straightened his legs under the table, tilted his head, and laughed again, loudly. It was plain that the demonstration had no meaning to the others. They looked at him wondering and in silence. 2. As the men trooped heavily back into the front room, the two little windows presented views of a turmoiling sea of snow. The huge arms of the wind were making attempts, mighty, circular, futile, to embrace the flakes as they sped. A gatepost like a still man with a blanched face stood aghast amid this profligate fury. In a hearty voice, Scully announced the presence of a blizzard. The guests of the Blue Hotel, lighting their pipes, assented with grunts of lazy masculine contentment. No island of the sea could be exempt in the degree of this little room with its humming stove. Johnny, son of Scully, in a tone which defined his opinion of his ability as a card player, challenged the old farmer of gray and sandy whiskers to a game of high-five. The farmer agreed with a contemptuous and bitter scoff. They sat close to the stove and squared their knees under a wide board. The cowboy and the Easterner watched the game with interest. The Swede remained near the window, aloof, but with a countenance that showed signs of an inexplicable excitement. The play of Johnny and the Greybeard was suddenly ended by another quarrel. The old man arose, while casting looks of heated scorn, at his adversary. He slowly buttoned his coat, and then stalked with fabulous dignity from the room. In the discreet silence of all other men, the Swede laughed. His laughter rang, somehow childish. Men by this time had begun to look at him askance, as if they wished to inquire what ailed him. A new game was formed jocosely. The cowboy volunteered to become the partner of Johnny, and they all then turned to ask the Swede to throw in his lot with the little Easterner. He asked some questions about the game, and learning that it wore many names, and that he had played it when it was under an alias, he accepted the invitation. He strode toward the men nervously, as if he expected to be assaulted. Finally, seated, he gazed from face to face and laughed shrilly. This laugh was so strange that the Easterner looked up quickly, the cowboy sat intent with his mouth open, and Johnny paused, holding the cards with still fingers. Afterward there was a short silence. Then Johnny said, Well, let's get at it. Come on now. They pulled their chairs forward until their knees were bunched under the board. They began to play, and their interest in the game 
caused the others to forget the manner of the Swede. The cowboy was a board whacker. Each time he held superior cards he wanged them, one by one, with exceeding force, down upon the improvised table, and took the tricks with a glowing air of prowess and pride that sent thrills of indignation into the hearts of his opponents. A game with a board whacker in it is sure to become intense. The countenances of the Easterner and the Swede were miserable whenever the cowboy thundered down his aces and kings, while Johnny, his eyes gleaming with joy, chuckled and chuckled. Because of the absorbing play, none considered the strange ways of the Swede. They paid strict heed to the game. Finally, during a lull caused by a new deal, the Swede suddenly addressed Johnny. I suppose there have been a good many men killed in this room. The jaws of the others dropped, and they looked at him. What in hell are you talking about? said Johnny. The Swede laughed again, his blatant laugh, full of a kind of false courage and defiance. Oh, you know what I mean all right, he answered. I'm a liar if I do, Johnny protested. The card was halted, and the men stared at the Swede. Johnny evidently felt that as the son of the proprietor he should make a direct inquiry. "'Now what might you be driving at, mister?' he said. The Swede winked at him. It was a wink full of cunning. His fingers shook on the edge of the board. "'Oh, maybe you think I have been to nowheres. Maybe you think I'm a tenderfoot.' "'I don't know nothing about you,' answered Johnny. "'And I don't give a damn where you've been.' All I got to say is that I don't know what you're driving at. There hain't never been nobody killed in this room. The cowboy, who had been steadily gazing at the Swede, then spoke. What's wrong with you, mister? Apparently it seemed to the Swede that he was formidably menaced. He shivered and turned white near the corners of his mouth. He sent an appealing glance in the direction of the little Easterner. During these moments he did not forget to wear his air of advanced pot valor. "'They say they don't know what I mean,' he remarked mockingly to the Easterner. The latter answered after prolonged and cautious reflection. "'I don't understand you,' he said, impassively. The Swede made a movement then, which announced that he thought he had encountered treachery from the only quarter where he had expected sympathy, if not help. Oh, I see, you are all against me. I see. The cowboy was in a state of deep stupefaction. Say, he cried, as he tumbled the deck violently down upon the board. Say, what are you getting at, hey? The Swede sprang up with the celerity of a man escaping from a snake on the floor. I don't want to fight, he shouted. I don't want to fight. The cowboy stretched his long legs, indolently and deliberately. His hands were in his pockets. He spat into the sawdust box. "'Well, who the hell thought you did?' he inquired. The Swede backed rapidly toward a corner of the room. His hands were out protectingly in front of his chest, but he was making an obvious struggle to control his fright. "'Gentlemen,' he quavered, "'I suppose I'm going to be killed before I can leave this house. I suppose I'm going to be killed before I can leave this house.' In his eyes was the dying swan look. Through the windows could be seen the snow turning blue in the shadow of dusk. The wind tore at the house, and some loose thing beat regularly against the clapboards like a spirit tapping. A door opened, and Scully himself entered. He paused in surprise as he noted the tragic attitude of the Swede. Then he said, "'What's the matter here?' The Swede answered him swiftly and eagerly. "'These men are going to kill me.' "'Kill you?' ejaculated Scully. "'Kill you? What are you talking?' The Swede made a gesture of a martyr. Scully wheeled sternly upon his son. "'What is this, Johnny?' The lad had grown sullen. "'Damned if I know,' he answered. "'I can't make no sense of it.' He began to shuffle the cards, fluttering them together with an angry snap. He says a good many men have been killed in this room, or something like that. Andy says he's going to get killed here, too. I don't know what ails him. He's crazy, I shouldn't wonder. Scully then looked for explanation to the cowboy, 
but the cowboy simply shrugged his shoulders. "'Kill you?' said Scully again to the Swede. "'Kill you? Man, you're off your nut.' "'Oh, I know,' burst out the Swede. "'I know what will happen. Yes, I'm crazy, yes. Yes, of course I'm crazy, yes. But I know one thing.' There was a sort of sweat of misery and terror upon his face. I know I won't get out of here alive. The cowboy drew a deep breath, as if his mind was passing into the last stages of dissolution. Well, I'm doggone, he whispered to himself. Scully wheeled suddenly and faced his son. You've been troubling this man. Johnny's voice was loud with its burden of grievance. Why, good God, I ain't done nothing to him. The Swede broke in. "'Gentlemen, do not disturb yourselves. I will leave this house. I will go away because—' He accused them dramatically with his glance. "'Because I do not want to be killed.' Scully was furious with his son. "'Will you tell me what is the matter, you young devil? What's the matter, anyhow? Speak out.' "'Blame it!' cried Johnny in despair. "'Don't I tell you I don't know? He—he he says we want to kill him, and that's all I know.' I can't tell what ails him. The Swede continued to repeat, Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will leave this house. I will go away, because I do not wish to be killed. Yes, of course, I am crazy, yes. But I know one thing. I will go away. I will leave this house. Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will go away. You will not go away, said Scully. You will not go away until I hear the reason of this business. If anybody has troubled you, I will take care of him. This is my house. You are under my roof, and I will not allow any peaceable man to be troubled here. He cast a terrible eye upon Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner. Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will go away. I do not wish to be killed. The Swede moved toward the door, which opened upon the stairs. It was evidently his intention to go at once for his baggage. No, no, shouted Scully peremptorily, but the white-faced man slid by him and disappeared. Now, said Scully severely, what does this mean? Johnny and the cowboy cried together, why, we didn't do nothing to him. Scully's eyes were cold. No, he said, you didn't. Johnny swore a deep oath. Why, this is the wildest loon I ever see. We didn't do nothing at all. We were just sitting here playing cards, and he— The father suddenly spoke to the Easterner. Mr. Blank, he asked, what has these boys been doing? The Easterner reflected again. I didn't see anything wrong at all, he said at last, slowly. Scully began to howl. What does it mean? He stared ferociously at his son. I have a mind to lather you for this, my boy. Johnny was frantic. Well, what have I done? He bawled at his father. 3. I think you are tongue-tied, said Scully finally to his son, the cowboy, and the Easterner. And at the end of this scornful sentence, he left the room. Upstairs, the Swede was swiftly fastening the straps of his great valise. Once his back happened to be half-turned towards the door, and, hearing a noise there, he wheeled and sprang up, uttering a loud cry. Scully's wrinkled visage showed grimly in the light of the small lamp he carried. This yellow effulgence, streaming upward, colored only his prominent features, and left his eyes, for instance, in mysterious shadow. He resembled a murderer. "'Man, man!' he exclaimed. "'Have you gone daffy?' "'Oh, no, oh, no!' rejoined the other. There are people in this world who know pretty nearly as much as you do, understand? For a moment they stood gazing at each other. Upon the Swede's deathly pale cheeks were two spots brightly crimson and sharply edged, as if they had been carefully painted. Scully placed the light on the table and sat himself on the edge of the bed. He spoke ruminatively. By cracky, I never heard of such a thing in my life. It's a complete muddle. I can't for the soul of me think how you ever got this idea into your head. Presently he lifted his eyes and asked, And did you sure think they were going to kill you? The Swede scanned the old man as if he wished to see into his mind. 
I did, he said at last. He obviously suspected that this answer might precipitate an outbreak. As he pulled on a strap, his whole arm shook, the elbow wavering like a bit of paper. Scully banged his hand impressively on the footboard of the bed. Why, man, we're going to have a line of electric streetcars in this town next spring. A line of electric streetcars, repeated the Swede stupidly. And, said Scully, there's a new railroad going to be built down from Broken Arm to here, not to mention the four churches and the smashing big brick schoolhouse. Then there's the big factory, too. Why, in two years, Romper'll be a metropolis. Having finished the preparation of his baggage, the Swede straightened himself. Mr. Scully, he said, with sudden hardihood, how much do I owe you? You don't owe me anything, said the old man, angrily. Yes, I do, retorted the Swede. He took seventy-five cents from his pocket and tendered it to Scully, but the latter snapped his fingers in disdainful refusal. However, it happened that they both stood gazing in a strange fashion at three silver pieces on the Swede's open palm. I'll not take your money, said Scully at last. Not after what's been going on here. Then a plan seemed to strike him. Here, he cried, picking up his lamp and moving towards the door. Here, come with me a minute. No, said the Swede, in overwhelming alarm. Yes, urged the old man. Come on, I want you to come and see a picture, just across the hall, in my room. The Swede must have concluded that his hour was come. His jaw dropped and his teeth showed like a dead man's. He ultimately followed Scully across the corridor, but he had the step of one hung in chains. Scully flashed the light high on the wall of his own chamber. There was revealed a ridiculous photograph of a little girl. She was leaning against a balustrade of gorgeous decoration, and the formidable bang of her hair was prominent. The figure was as graceful as an upright sled stake, and withal, it was of the hue of lead. There, said Scully tenderly, that's the picture of my little girl that died. Her name was Carrie. She had the prettiest hair you ever saw. I was that fond of her, she... Turning then, he saw that the Swede was not contemplating the picture at all, but, instead, was keeping keen watch on the gloom in the rear. Look, man, said Scully heartily. That's the picture of my little gal that died. Her name was Carrie. And then here's the picture of my oldest boy, Michael. He's a lawyer in Lincoln and doing well. I gave that boy a grand education, and I'm glad for it now. He's a fine boy. Look at him now. Ain't he bold as blazes, him there in Lincoln? An honored and respected gentleman. An honored and respected gentleman, concluded Scully with a flourish. And, so saying, he smote the Swede jovially on the back. The Swede faintly smiled. Now, said the old man, there's only one more thing. He dropped suddenly to the floor and thrust his head beneath the bed. The Swede could hear his muffled voice. I'd keep it under me pillar if it wasn't for that boy Johnny. Then there's the old woman. Where is it now? I never put it twice in the same place. Ah, now come out with you. Presently he backed clumsily from under the bed, dragging with him an old coat rolled into a bundle. "'I fetched him,' he muttered. Kneeling on the floor, he unrolled the coat and extracted from its heart a little yellow-brown whiskey bottle. His first maneuver was to hold the bottle up to the light, reassured, apparently, that nobody had been tampering with it. He thrust it with a generous movement towards the Swede. The weak-kneed Swede was about to eagerly clutch this element of strength, but he suddenly jerked his hand away and cast a look of horror upon Scully. Drink, said the old man affectionately. He had risen to his feet and now stood facing the Swede. There was a silence. Then again Scully said, Drink! The Swede laughed wildly. He grabbed the bottle, put it to his mouth, and as his lips curled absurdly around the opening and his throat worked, he kept his glance, burning with hatred, upon the old man's face. 4. 
After the departure of Scully, the three men, with the cardboard still upon their knees, preserved for a long time an astounded silence. Then Johnny said, "'That's the dod-dangest Swede I ever see!' "'He ain't no Swede,' said the cowboy scornfully. "'Well, what is he, then?' cried Johnny. "'What is he, then?' "'It's my opinion,' replied the cowboy deliberately. "'He's some kind of a Dutchman.' It was a venerable custom of the country to entitle as Swedes all light-haired men who spoke with a heavy tongue. In consequence, the idea of the cowboy was not without its daring. "'Yes, sir,' he repeated. "'It's my opinion this feller is some kind of a Dutchman.' "'Well, he says he's a Swede, anyhow,' muttered Johnny sulkily. He turned to the Easterner. "'What do you think, Mr. Blank?' "'Oh, I don't know,' replied the Easterner. "'Well, what do you think makes him act that way?' asked the cowboy. "'Why, he's frightened.' The Easterner knocked his pipe against a rim of the stove. "'He's clear frightened out of his boots.' "'What at?' cried Johnny and the cowboy together. The Easterner reflected over his answer. "'What at?' cried the others again. "'Oh, I don't know.' but it seems to me this man has been reading dime novels, and he thinks he's right out in the middle of it, the shootin' and stabbin' and all. But, said the cowboy, deeply scandalized, this ain't Wyoming, nor none of them places. This is Nebraska. Yes, added Johnny, and why don't he wait till he gets out west? The traveled Easterner laughed. It isn't different there, even, not in these days. But he thinks he's right in the middle of hell. Johnny and the cowboy mused long. It's awful funny, remarked Johnny at last. Yes, said the cowboy. This is a queer game. I hope we don't get snowed in, because then we'd have to stand this here man being around us all the time. That wouldn't be no good. I wish Pop would throw him out, said Johnny. Presently they heard a loud stamping on the stairs accompanied by ringing jokes in the voice of old Scully, and laughter, evidently from the Swede. The men around the stove stared vacantly at each other. Gosh! said the cowboy. The door flew open, and old Scully, flushed and anecdotal, came into the room. He was jabbering at the Swede, who followed him, laughing bravely. It was the entry of two roisterers from a banquet hall. Come now! said Scully sharply to the three seated men. Move up and give us a chance at the stove. The cowboy and the Easterner obediently sidled their chairs to make room for the newcomers. Johnny, however, simply arranged himself in a more indolent attitude, and then remained motionless. Come, get over there, said Scully. Plenty of room on the other side of the stove, said Johnny. Do you think we want to sit in the draft? roared the father. But the Swede here interposed with a grandeur of confidence. No, no, let the boy sit where he likes, he cried in a bullying voice to the father. All right, all right, said Scully, deferentially. The cowboy and the Easterner exchanged glances of wonder. The five chairs were formed in a crescent about one side of the stove. The Swede began to talk. He talked arrogantly, profanely, angrily. Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner maintained a morose silence, while old Scully appeared to be receptive and eager, breaking in constantly with sympathetic ejaculations. Finally the Swede announced that he was thirsty. He moved in his chair and said that he would go for a drink of water. "'I'll get it for you,' cried Scully at once. "'No,' said the Swede, contemptuously. "'I'll get it for myself.' He arose and stalked with the air of an owner, off into the executive parts of the hotel. As soon as the Swede was out of hearing, Scully sprang to his feet and whispered intensely to the others. Upstairs he thought I was trying to poison him. Say, said Johnny, this makes me sick. Why don't you throw him out in the snow? Why, he's all right now, declared Scully. It was only that he was from the east and he thought this was a tough place, that's all. He's all right now. The cowboy looked with admiration upon the Easterner. You were straight, he said. 
you were on to that there Dutchman. Well, said Johnny to his father, he may be all right now, but I don't see it. Other time he was scared, but now he's too fresh. Scully's speech was always a combination of Irish brogue and idiom, western twang and idiom, and scraps of curiously formed diction taken from the storybooks and newspapers. He now hurled a strange mass of language at the head of his son. What do I keep? What do I keep? What do I keep? He demanded, in a voice of thunder. He slapped his knee impressively, to indicate that he himself was going to make reply, and that all should heed. I keep a hotel, he shouted. A hotel, do you mind? A guest under my roof has sacred privileges. He is to be intimidated by none. Not one word shall he hear that would prejudice him in favor of going away. I'll not have it. There's no place in this here town where they can say they ever took in a guest of mine, because he was afraid to stay here. He wheeled suddenly upon the cowboy and the Easterner. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Scully, said the cowboy. I think you're right. Yes, Mr. Scully, said the Easterner. I think you're right. 5. At six o'clock supper, the Swede fizzed like a firewheel. He sometimes seemed to be on the point of bursting into riotous song, and in all his madness he was encouraged by old Scully. The Easterner was encased in reserve. The cowboy sat in wide-mouthed amazement, forgetting to eat, while Johnny wrathily demolished great plates of food. The daughters of the house, when they were obliged to replenish the biscuits, approached as warily as Indians, and, having succeeded in their purpose, fled with ill-concealed trepidation. The Swede domineered the whole feast, and he gave it the appearance of a cruel bacchanal. He seemed to have grown suddenly taller. He gazed, brutally disdainful, into every face. His voice rang through the room. Once when he jabbed out harpoon fashion with his fork to pinion a biscuit, the weapon nearly impaled the hand of the Easterner, which had been stretched quietly out for the same biscuit. After supper, as the men filed towards the other room, the Swede smote Scully ruthlessly on the shoulder. Well, old boy, that was a good square meal. Johnny looked hopefully at his father. He knew that shoulder was tender from an old fall. And, indeed, it appeared for a moment as if Scully was going to flame out over the matter, but in the end he smiled a sickly smile and remained silent. The others understood from his manner that he was admitting his responsibility for the Swede's new viewpoint. Johnny, however, addressed his parent in an aside. "'Why don't you license somebody to kick you downstairs?' Scully scowled darkly by way of reply. When they were gathered about the stove, the Swede insisted on another game of high-five. Scully gently deprecated the plan at first, but the Swede turned a wolfish glare upon him. The old man subsided, and the Swede canvassed the others. In his tone there was always a great threat. The cowboy and the Easterner both remarked indifferently that they would play. Scully said that he would presently have to go to meet the 658 train and so the Swede turned menacingly upon Johnny. For a moment their glances crossed like blades, and then Johnny smiled and said, Yes, I'll play. They formed a square, with the little board on their knees. The Easterner and the Swede were again partners. As the play went on, it was noticeable that the cowboy was not board-whacking as usual. Meanwhile, Scully, near the lamp, had put on his spectacles and— with an appearance curiously like an old priest, was reading a newspaper. In time he went out to meet the 658 train, and, despite his precautions, a gust of polar wind whirled into the room as he opened the door. Besides scattering the cards, it dulled the players to the marrow. The Swede cursed frightfully. When Scully returned, his entrance disturbed a cozy and friendly scene. The Swede again cursed, but presently they were once more intent, their heads bent forward and their hands moving swiftly. The Swede had adopted the fashion of board-whacking. 
Scully took up his paper and for a long time remained immersed in matters which were extraordinarily remote from him. The lamp burned badly, and once he turned to adjust the wick. The newspaper, as he turned from page to page, rustled with a slow and comfortable sound. Then suddenly he heard three terrible words. You are cheatin! Such scenes often prove that there can be little of dramatic import in environment. Any room can present a tragic front, any room can be comic. This little den was now hideous as a torture chamber. The new faces of the men themselves had changed it upon the instant. The Swede held a huge fist in front of Johnny's face, while the latter looked steadily over it into the blazing orbs of his accuser. The Easterner had grown pallid, the cowboy's jaw had dropped in that expression of bovine amazement, which was one of his important mannerisms. After the three words, the first sound in the room was made by Scully's paper as it floated forgotten to his feet. His spectacles had also fallen from his nose, but by a clutch he had saved them in air. His hand, grasping the spectacles, now remained poised awkwardly and near his shoulder. He stared at the card players. Probably the silence was while a second elapsed. Then, if the floor had suddenly been twitched out from under the men, they could not have moved quicker. The five had projected themselves headlong towards a common point. It happened that Johnny, in rising to hurl himself upon the Swede, had stumbled slightly because of his curiously instinctive care for the cards and the board. The loss of the moment allowed time for the arrival of Scully, and also allowed the cowboy time to give the Swede a great push, which sent him staggering back. The men found tongue together, and hoarse shouts of rage, appeal, or fear burst from every throat. The cowboy pushed and jostled feverishly at the Swede, and the Easterner and Scully clung wildly to Johnny. But through the smoky air, Above the swaying bodies of the peace compellers, the eyes of the two warriors ever sought each other in glances of challenge that were at once hot and steely. Of course, the board had been overturned, and now the whole company of cards was scattered over the floor, where the boots of the men trampled the fat and painted kings and queens as they gazed with their silly eyes at the war that was waging above them. Scully's voice was dominating the yells. Stop now! Stop, I say! Stop now! Johnny, as he struggled to burst through the rank formed by Scully and the Easterner, was crying, Well, he says I cheated! He says I cheated! I won't allow no man to say I cheated! If he says I cheated, he's a... The cowboy was telling the Swede, Quit now! Quit, do you hear? The screams of the Swede never ceased. He did cheat! I saw him! I saw him! As for the Easterner, he was importuning in a voice that was not heeded. Wait a moment, can't you? Oh, wait a moment! What's the good of a fight over a game of cards? Wait a moment! In this tumult no complete sentences were clear. Cheat! Quit! He says! These fragments pierced the uproar and rang out sharply. It was remarkable that, whereas Scully undoubtedly made the most noise, he was the least heard of any of the riotous band. Then suddenly there was a great cessation. It was as if each man had paused for breath, and although the room was still lighted with the anger of men, it could be seen that there was no danger of immediate conflict, and at once Johnny, shouldering his way forward, almost succeeded in confronting the Swede. "'What did you say I cheated for? What did you say I cheated for? I don't cheat!' and I won't let any man say I do. The Swede said, I saw you, I saw you. Well, cried Johnny, I'll fight any man what says I cheat. No, you won't, said the cowboy, not here. Ah, be still, can't you, said Scully, coming between them. The quiet was sufficient to allow the Easterner's voice to be heard. He was repeating, Oh, wait a minute, can't you? What's the good of a fight over a game of cards? Wait a moment. Johnny, his red face appearing above his father's shoulder, hailed the Swede again. Did you say I cheated? The Swede showed his teeth. Yes. 
Then, said Johnny, we must fight. Yes, fight, roared the Swede. He was like a demoniac. Yes, fight. I'll show you what kind of a man I am. I'll show you who you want to fight. Maybe you think I can't fight. Maybe you think I can't. I'll show you, you skin, you card sharp. Yes, you cheated, you cheated, you cheated. Well, let's go at it then, mister, said Johnny, coolly. The cowboy's brow was beaded with sweat from his efforts at intercepting all sorts of raids. He turned in despair to Scully. What are you going to do now? A change had come over the Celtic visage of the old man. He now seemed all eagerness. His eyes glowed. We'll let them fight, he answered stalwartly. I can't put up with this any longer. I've stood this damn sweet till I'm sick. We'll let them fight. 6. The men prepared to go out of doors. The Easterner was so nervous that he had great difficulty in getting his arms into the sleeves of his new leather coat. As the cowboy drew his fur cap down over his ears, his hands trembled. In fact, Johnny and Old Scully were the only ones who displayed no agitation. These preliminaries were conducted without words. Scully threw open the door. "'Well, come on,' he said. Instantly a terrific wind caused the flame of the lamp to struggle at its wick, while a puff of black smoke sprang from the chimney-top. The stove was in a mid-current of the blast, and its voice swelled to equal the roar of the storm. Some of the scarred and bedabbled cards were caught up from the floor and dashed helplessly against the farther wall. The men lowered their heads and plunged into the tempest as into a sea. No snow was falling, but great whirls and clouds of flakes, swept up from the ground by the frantic winds, were streaming southward with the speed of bullets. The covered land was blue, with the sheen of an unearthly satin, and there was no other hue save where, at the low black railway station, which seemed incredibly distant, one light gleamed like a tiny jewel. As the men floundered into a thigh-deep drift, it was known that the Swede was bawling out something. Scully went to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and projected an ear. "'What's that you say?' he shouted. "'I say,' bawled the Swede again, "'I won't stand much show against this gang. I know you'll all pitch on me.' Scully smote him reproachfully on the arm. "'Tut, man!' he yelled. The wind tore the words from Scully's lips and scattered them far a lee. "'You are all a gang of—' boomed the Swede. But the storm also seized the remainder of this sentence." Immediately turning their backs upon the wind, the men had swung around a corner to the sheltered side of the hotel. It was the function of the little house to preserve here, amid this great devastation of snow, an irregular V-shape of heavily encrusted grass, which crackled beneath the feet. One could imagine the great drifts piled against the windward side. When the party reached the comparative peace of this spot, it was found that the Swede was still bellowing. "'Oh, I know what kind of a thing this is. I know you'll all pitch on me. I can't lick you all.' Scully turned upon him panther fashion. "'You'll not have to whip all of us. You'll have to whip my son Johnny. And the man that troubles you during that time will have me to deal with.' The arrangements were swiftly made. The two men faced each other, obedient to the harsh commands of Scully whose face, in the subtly luminous gloom, could be seen set in the austere impersonal lines that are pictured on the countenances of Roman veterans. The Easterner's teeth were chattering, and he was hopping up and down like a mechanical toy. The cowboy stood rock-like. The contestants had not stripped off any clothing. Each was in his ordinary attire. Their fists were up, and they eyed each other in a calm that had the elements of leonine cruelty in it. During this pause, the Easterner's mind, like a film, took lasting impressions of three men, the iron-nerved master of the ceremony, the Swede, pale, motionless, terrible, and Johnny, serene yet ferocious, brutish yet heroic. 
the entire prelude had in it a tragedy greater than the tragedy of action, and this aspect was accentuated by the long, mellow cry of the blizzard as it sped the tumbling wind and wailing flakes into the black abyss of the south. Now, said Scully, the two combatants leaped forward and crashed together like bullocks. There was heard the cushioned sound of blows, and a curse squeezing out between the tight teeth of one. As for the spectators, the Easterner's pent-up breath exploded from him with a pop of relief, absolute relief from the tension of the preliminaries. The cowboy bounded into the air with a yowl. Scully was immovable, as from supreme amazement and fear, at the fury of the fight which he himself had permitted and arranged. For a time the encounter in the darkness was such a perplexity of flying arms that it presented no more detail than would a swiftly revolving wheel. Occasionally a face, as if illuminated by a flash of light, would shine out, ghastly and marked with pink spots. A moment later the men might have been known as shadows, if it were not for the involuntary utterance of oaths that came from them in whispers. Suddenly a holocaust of warlike desire caught the cowboy, and he bolted forward with the speed of a bronco. "'Go it, Johnny! Go it! Kill him! Kill him!' Scully confronted him. "'Cape back!' he said. And by his glance the cowboy could tell that this man was Johnny's father. To the Easterner there was a monotony of unchangeable fighting that was an abomination. This confused mingling was eternal to his sense, which was concentrated in a longing for the end, the priceless end. Once the fighters lurched near him, and as he scrambled hastily backward, he heard them breathe like men on the rack. "'Kill him, Johnny! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him!' The cowboy's face was contorted like one of those agony masks in museums. "'Keep still,' said Scully, icily. Then there was a sudden loud grunt, incomplete but short, and Johnny's body swung away from the Swede, and fell with sickening heaviness to the grass. The cowboy was barely in time to prevent the mad Swede from flinging himself upon his prone adversary. "'No, you don't,' said the cowboy." interposing an arm. Wait a second. Scully was at his son's side. Johnny, Johnny, me boy. His voice had a quality of melancholy tenderness. Johnny, can you go on with it? He looked anxiously down into the bloody, pulpy face of his son. There was a moment of silence, and then Johnny answered in his ordinary voice. Yes, I, it, yes. Assisted by his father, he struggled to his feet. "'Wait a bit now till you get your wind,' said the old man. A few paces away the cowboy was lecturing the Swede. "'No, you don't. Wait a second. The Easterner was plucking at Scully's sleeve. "'Oh, this is enough,' he pleaded. "'This is enough. Let it go as it stands. This is enough.' "'Bill,' said Scully, "'get out of the road.' The cowboy stepped aside. Now, the combatants were actuated by a new caution as they advanced towards collision. They glared at each other, and then the Swede aimed a lightning blow that carried with it his entire weight. Johnny was evidently half stupid from weakness, but he miraculously dodged, and his fist sent the overbalanced Swede sprawling. The cowboy, Scully, and the Easterner burst into a cheer that was like a chorus of triumphant soldiery. But before its conclusion, the Swede had scuffled agilely to his feet and come in berserk abandon at his foe. There was another perplexity of flying arms, and Johnny's body again swung away and fell, even as a bundle might fall from a roof. The Swede instantly staggered to a little wind-wave tree and leaned upon it, breathing like an engine while his savage and flame-lit eyes roamed from face to face as the men bent over Johnny. There was a splendor of isolation in his situation at this time, which the Easterner felt once when, lifting his eyes from the man on the ground, he beheld that mysterious and lonely figure waiting. "'Are you any good yet, Johnny?' asked Scully in a broken voice. 
The son gasped and opened his eyes languidly. After a moment, he answered, No, I ain't any good, any more. Then, from shame and bodily ill, he began to weep, the tears furrowing down through the blood stains of his face. He was too, too, too heavy for me. Scully straightened and addressed the waiting figure. Stranger, he said evenly, it's all up with our side. Then his voice changed into that vibrant huskiness, which is commonly the tone of the most simple and deadly announcements. Johnny is whipped. Without replying, the victor moved off on the route to the front door of the hotel. The cowboy was formulating new and unspellable blasphemies. The Easterner was startled to find that they were out in a wind that seemed to come direct from the shadowed arctic flows. He heard again the wail of the snow as it was flung to its grave in the south. He knew now that all this time the cold had been sinking into him deeper and deeper, and he wondered that he had not perished. He felt indifferent to the condition of the vanquished man. "'Johnny, can you walk?' asked Scully. "'Did I hurt, hurt him any?' asked the son. "'Can you walk, boy? Can you walk?' Johnny's voice was suddenly strong. There was a robust impatience in it. I asked you whether I heard him any. Yes, yes, Johnny, answered the cowboy consolingly. He's heard a good deal. They raised him off the ground, and as soon as he was on his feet he went tottering off, rebuffing all attempts at assistance. When the party rounded the corner, they were fairly blinded by the pelting of the snow. It burned their faces like fire. The cowboy carried Johnny through the drift to the door. As they entered, some cards again rose from the floor and beat against the wall. The Easterner rushed to the stove. He was so profoundly chilled that he almost dared to embrace the glowing iron. The Swede was not in the room. Johnny sank into a chair and, folding his arms on his knees, buried his face in them. Scully, warming one foot and then another at the rim of the stove, muttered to himself with Celtic mournfulness. The cowboy had removed his fur cap, and, with a dazed and rueful air, he was running one hand through his tousled locks. From overhead they could hear the creaking of boards, as the Swede tramped here and there in his room. The sad quiet was broken by the sudden flinging open of a door that led towards the kitchen. It was instantly followed by an inrush of women. They precipitated themselves upon Johnny amid a chorus of lamentation before they carried their prey off to the kitchen, there to be bathed and harangued with that mixture of sympathy and abuse which is a feat of their sex. The mother straightened herself and fixed old Scully with an eye of stern reproach. "'Shame be upon you, Patrick Scully,' she cried. "'Your own son, too. Shame be upon you.' "'There now, be quiet now,' said the old man weakly. "'Shame upon you, Patrick Scully.' The girls, rallying to this slogan, sniffed disdainfully in the direction of those trembling accomplices, the cowboy and the Easterner. Presently they bore Johnny away, and left the three men to dismal reflection. 7. I'd like to fight this here Dutchman myself, said the cowboy, breaking a long silence. Scully wagged his head sadly. No, that wouldn't do. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be right. Well, why wouldn't it? argued the cowboy. I don't see no harm in it. No, answered Scully, with mournful heroism. It wouldn't be right. It was Johnny's fight, and now we mustn't whip the man just because he whipped Johnny. Yes, that's true enough, said the cowboy, but he better not get fresh with me, because I couldn't stand no more of it. You'll not say a word to him, commanded Scully, and even then they heard the tread of the Swede on the stairs. His entrance was made theatric. He swept the door back with a bang and swaggered to the middle of the room. No one looked at him. Well, he cried, insolently at Scully, I suppose you'll tell me how much I owe you. 
The old man remained stolid. You don't owe me nothing. Huh, said the Swede. Huh, don't owe him nothing. The cowboy addressed the Swede. Stranger, I don't see how you come to be so gay around here. Old Scully was instantly alert. Stop, he shouted, holding his hand forth, fingers upward. Bill, you shut up. The cowboy spat carelessly into the sawdust box. I didn't say a word, did I? he asked. Mr. Scully, called the Swede, how much do I owe you? It was seen that he was attired for departure, and that he had his valise in his hand. You don't owe me nothing, repeated Scully, in his same imperturbable way. Huh, said the Swede, I guess you're right. I guess if it was any way at all you'd owe me something. That's what I guess. He turned to the cowboy. Kill him, kill him, kill him, he mimicked, and then guffawed victoriously. Kill him. He was convulsed with ironical humor. But he might have been jeering the dead. The three men were immovable and silent, staring with glassy eyes at the stove. The Swede opened the door and passed into the storm, giving one derisive glance backward at the still group. As soon as the door was closed, Scully and the cowboy leaped to their feet and began to curse. They trampled to and fro, waving their arms and smashing into the air with their fists. Oh, but that was a hard minute, wailed Scully. That was a hard minute, him there leering and scoffing. One bang at his nose was worth forty dollars to me that minute. How did you stand it, Bill? How did I stand it? cried the cowboy in a quivering voice. How did I stand it? Oh! The old man burst into sudden brogue. Oh, I'd like to take that suede, he wailed, and old him down in stone floor and bait him to a jelly with a stick. The cowboy groaned in sympathy. I'd like to get him by the neck and hammer him. He brought his hand down on a chair with a noise like a pistol shot. Hammer that there Dutchman until he couldn't tell himself from a dead coyote. I'd bait him until he... I'd show him some things. And together they raised a yearning, fanatic cry. Oh, if we only could. Yes, and then I'd... Oh! Eight. The Swede, tightly gripping his valise, tacked across the face of the storm as if he carried sails. He was following a line of little naked gasping trees, which he knew must mark the way of the road. His face, fresh from the pounding of Johnny's fists, felt more pleasure than pain in the wind and the driving snow. A number of square shapes loomed upon him finally, and he knew them as the houses of the main body of the town. He found a street and made travel along it, leaning heavily upon the wind whenever, at a corner, a terrific blast caught him. He might have been in a deserted village. We picture the world as thick with conquering and elate humanity, but here, with the bugles of the tempest peeling, it was hard to imagine a peopled earth. One viewed the existence of man, then, as a marvel, and conceded a glamour of wonder to these lice, which were caused to cling to a whirling, fire-smote, ice-locked, disease-stricken, space-lost bulb. The conceit of man was explained by the storm to be the very engine of life. One was a coxcomb not to die in it. However, the Swede found a saloon. In front of it an indomitable red light was burning, and the snowflakes were made blood-color as they flew through the circumscribed territory of the lamp shining. The Swede pushed open the door of the saloon and entered. A sanded expanse was before him and at the end of it four men sat about a table drinking. Down one side of the room extended a radiant bar, and its guardian was leaning upon his elbows, listening to the talk of the men at the table. The Swede dropped his valise upon the floor, and, smiling fraternally upon the barkeeper, said, "'Give me some whiskey, will you?' The man placed a bottle, a whiskey glass, and a glass of ice-thick water upon the bar, the Swede poured himself an abnormal portion of whiskey and drank it in three gulps. "'Pretty bad night,' remarked the bartender, indifferently. 
he was making the pretension of blindness, which is usually a distinction of his class, but it could have been seen that he was furtively studying the half-erased bloodstains on the face of the Swede. "'Bad night,' he said again. "'Oh, it's good enough for me,' replied the Swede, heartily, as he poured himself some more whiskey. The barkeeper took his coin and maneuvered it through its reception by the highly nickeled cash machine. A bell rang. A card labeled twenty cents had appeared. No, continued the Swede. This isn't too bad weather. It's good enough for me. So, murmured the barkeeper, languidly. The copious drams made the Swede's eyes swim, and he breathed a trifle heavier. Yes, I like this weather. I like it. It suits me. It was apparently his design to impart a deep significance to these words. So, murmured the bartender again, he turned to gaze dreamily at the scroll-like birds and bird-like scrolls, which had been drawn with soap upon the mirrors back of the bar. Well, I guess I'll take another drink, said the Swede presently. Have something? No, thanks. I'm not drinking, answered the bartender. Afterwards he asked, how did you hurt your face? The Swede immediately began to boast loudly. Why, in a fight, I thumped the soul out of a man down there at Scully's Hotel. The interest of the four men at the table was at last aroused. Who was it? said one. Johnny Scully, blustered the Swede. Son of the man what runs it. He will be pretty near dead for some weeks, I can tell you. I made a nice thing of him, I did. He couldn't get up. They carried him in the house. Have a drink? Instantly the men in some subtle way encased themselves in reserve. No thanks, said one. The group was of curious formation. Two were prominent local businessmen. One was the district attorney, and one was a professional gambler of the kind known as Square. But a scrutiny of the group would not have enabled an observer to pick the gambler from the men of more reputable pursuits. He was, in fact, a man so delicate in manner, when among people of fair class, and so judicious in his choice of victims, that in the strictly masculine part of the town's life he had come to be explicitly trusted and admired. People called him a thoroughbred. The fear and contempt with which his craft was regarded was undoubtedly the reason that his quiet dignity shone conspicuous above the quiet dignity of men who might be merely hatters billiard-markers, or grocery clerks. Beyond an occasional unwary traveler who came by rail, this gambler was supposed to prey solely upon reckless and senile farmers who, when flush with good crops, drove into town in all the pride and confidence of an absolutely invulnerable stupidity. Hearing at times in circuitous fashion of the despoilment of such a farmer, the important men of Romper invariably laughed in contempt of the victim, and, if they thought of the wolf at all, it was with a kind of pride at the knowledge that he would never dare think of attacking their wisdom and courage. Besides, it was popular that this gambler had a real wife and two children in a neat cottage in a suburb, where he led an exemplary home life, and when anyone even suggested a discrepancy in his character— the crowd immediately vociferated descriptions of this virtuous family circle. Then men who led exemplary home lives, and men who did not lead exemplary home lives, all subsided in a bunch, remarking that there was nothing more to be said. However, when a restriction was placed upon him, as, for instance, when a strong clique of members of the new Pollywog Club refused to permit him, even as a spectator, to appear in the rooms of the organization, the candor and gentleness with which he accepted the judgment disarmed many of his foes and made his friends more desperately partisan. He invariably distinguished between himself and a respectable romper man so quickly and frankly that his manner actually appeared to be a continual broadcast compliment. And one must not forget to declare the fundamental fact of his entire position in romper. It is irrefutable that in all affairs outside of his business, in all matters that occur eternally and commonly between man and man, this thieving card-player was so generous, so just, so moral, that, 
in a contest, he could have put to flight the consciences of nine-tenths of the citizens of Romper. And so it happened that he was seated in this saloon, with the two prominent local merchants and the district attorney. The Swede continued to drink raw whiskey, meanwhile babbling at the barkeeper and trying to induce him to indulge in potations. "'Come on, have a drink. Come on. What? No? Well, have a little one, then. By God, I've whipped a man tonight, and I want to celebrate. I whipped him good, too. Gentlemen,' the Swede cried to the men at the table, "'Have a drink?' "'Shh!' said the barkeeper. The group at the table, although furtively attentive, had been pretending to be deep in talk, but now a man lifted his eyes towards the Swede and said shortly, "'Thanks. We don't want any more.' At this reply the Swede ruffled out his chest like a rooster. "'Well,' he exploded, "'it seems I can't get anybody to drink with me in this town. Seems so, don't it? Well—' "'Shh!' said the barkeeper. "'Say,' snarled the Swede, "'don't you try to shut me up. I won't have it. I'm a gentleman, and I want people to drink with me. And I want them to drink with me now. Now, do you understand?' He rapped the bar with his knuckles. Years of experience had calloused the bartender. He merely grew sulky. I hear you, he answered. Well, cried the Swede, listen hard, then. See those men over there? Well, they're going to drink with me, and don't you forget it. Now you watch. Hi, yelled the barkeeper. This won't do. Why won't it? demanded the Swede. He stalked over to the table, and by chance laid his hand upon the shoulder of the gambler. How about this? he asked, wrathfully. I asked you to drink with me. The gambler simply twisted his head and spoke over his shoulder. My friend, I don't know you. Oh, hell, answered the Swede. Come and have a drink. Now, my boy, advised the gambler, kindly, take your hand off my shoulder and go away and mind your own business. He was a little slim man, and it seemed strange to hear him use this tone of heroic patronage to the burly Swede. The other men at the table said nothing. "'What? You won't drink with me, you little dude. I'll make you, then. I'll make you.' The Swede had grasped the gambler frenziedly at the throat, and was dragging him from his chair. The other men sprang up. The barkeeper dashed around the corner of his bar. There was a great tumult, and then was seen a long blade in the hand of the gambler. It shot forward, and a human body— this citadel of virtue, wisdom, power, was pierced as easily as if it had been a melon. The Swede fell with a cry of supreme astonishment. The prominent merchants and the district attorney must have at once tumbled out of the place backward. The bartender found himself hanging limply to the arm of a chair and gazing into the eyes of a murderer. Henry, said the latter, as he wiped the knife on one of the towels that hung beneath the bar rail, you tell him where to find me. I'll be home, waiting for him. Then he vanished. A moment afterwards, the barkeeper was in the street, dinning through the storm for help and, moreover, companionship. The corpse of the Swede, alone in the saloon, had its eyes fixed upon the dreadful legend that dwelt atop the cash machine. This registers the amount of your purchase. 9. Months later, the cowboy was frying pork over the stove of a little ranch near the Dakota line, when there was a quick thud of hoofs outside, and presently the Easterner entered with the letters and the papers. Well, said the Easterner at once, the chap that killed the Swede got three years. Wasn't much, was it? He has three years. The cowboy poised his pan of pork while he ruminated upon the news. Three years, that ain't much. No, it was a light sentence, replied the Easterner, as he unbuckled his spurs. Seems there was a good deal of sympathy for him in Romper. If the bartender had been any good, observed the cowboy thoughtfully, he would have gone in and cracked that there Dutchman on the head with a bottle in the beginning of it, and stopped all this here murderin'. Yes, a thousand things might have happened, said the Easterner tartly. The cowboy returned his pan of pork to the fire but his philosophy continued. It's funny, ain't it? If he hadn't said Johnny was cheatin', he'd be alive this minute. He was an awful fool. Game played for fun, too, not for money. 
I believe he was crazy. I feel sorry for that gambler, said the Easterner. Oh, so do I, said the cowboy. He don't deserve none of it for killing who he did. The Swede might not have been killed if everything had been square. Might not have been killed, exclaimed the cowboy. Everything square. Why, when he said that Johnny was cheating and acted like such a jackass, and then in the saloon he fairly walked up to get hurt. With these arguments, the cowboy browbeat the Easterner and reduced him to rage. You're a fool, cried the Easterner viciously. You're a bigger jackass than the Swede by a million majority. Now let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you something. Listen, Johnny was cheating. Johnny, said the cowboy blankly. There was a minute of silence, and then he said robustly, Why, no, the game was only for fun. Fun or not, said the Easterner, Johnny was cheating. I saw him. I know it. I saw him. And I refused to stand up and be a man. I let the Swede fight it out alone. And you, you were simply puffing around the place and wanting to fight. And then old Scully himself. We were all in it. This poor gambler isn't even a noun. He is a kind of adverb. Every sin is the result of a collaboration. We, five of us, have collaborated in the murder of this Swede. Usually there are from a dozen to forty women really involved in every murder. But in this case it seems to be only five men. You, I, Johnny, and old Scully, and that fool of an unfortunate gambler, came merely as a culmination, the apex of a human movement, and gets all the punishment. The cowboy, injured and rebellious, cried out blindly into this fog of mysterious theory. Well, I... Section 7 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 of The Monster 1. Little Jim was, for the time, engine number 36, and he was making the run between Syracuse and Rochester. He was fourteen minutes behind time, and the throttle was wide open. In consequence, when he swung around the curve at the flower bed, a wheel of his cart destroyed a peony. Number 36 slowed down at once and looked guiltily at his father, who was mowing the lawn. The doctor had his back to this accident, and he continued to pace slowly to and fro, pushing the mower. Jim dropped the tongue of the cart. He looked at his father and at the broken flower. Finally he went to the peony and tried to stand it on its pins, resuscitated, but the spine of it was hurt, and it would only hang limply from his hand. Jim could do no reparation. He looked again towards his father. He went on to the lawn, very slowly, and kicking wretchedly at the turf. Presently his father came along with the whirring machine, while the sweet new grass blade spun from the knives. In a low voice, Jim said, Pa! The doctor was shaving this lawn as if it were a priest's chin. All during the season he had worked at it in the coolness and peace of the evenings after supper. Even in the shadow of the cherry trees the grass was strong and healthy. Jim raised his voice a trifle. Pa! The doctor paused, and with the howl of the machine no longer occupying the sense, one could hear the robins in the cherry trees arranging their affairs. Jim's hands were behind his back, and sometimes his fingers clasped and unclasped. Again he said, Pa! The child's fresh and rosy lip was lowered. The doctor stared down at his son, thrusting his head forward and frowning attentively. What is it, Jimmy? Pa! repeated the child at length. Then he raised his finger and pointed at the flower bed. There! What? said the doctor, frowning more. What is it, Jim? After a period of silence, during which the child may have undergone a severe mental tumult, he raised his finger and repeated his former word. There! 
The father had respected this silence with perfect courtesy. Afterwards, his glance carefully followed the direction indicated by the child's finger, but he could see nothing which explained to him. "'I don't understand what you mean, Jimmy,' he said. It seemed that the importance of the whole thing had taken away the boy's vocabulary. He could only reiterate, There! The doctor mused upon the situation, but he could make nothing of it. At last he said, Come, show me. Together they crossed the lawn towards the flower bed. At some yards from the broken peony, Jimmy began to lag. There! The word came almost breathlessly. Where? said the doctor. Jimmy kicked at the grass. There, he replied. The doctor was obliged to go forward alone. After some trouble, he found the subject of the incident, the broken flower. Turning then, he saw the child lurking at the rear and scanning his countenance. The father reflected. After a time, he said, Jimmy, come here. With an infinite modesty of demeanor, the child came forward. Jimmy, how did this happen? The child answered, Now I was playing train, and now I runned over it. You were doing what? I was playing train. The father reflected again. Well, Jimmy, he said, slowly, I guess you had better not play train any more today. Do you think you would better? No, sir, said Jimmy. During the delivery of the judgment, the child had not faced his father, and afterwards he went away with his head lowered, shuffling his feet. 2. It was apparent from Jimmy's manner that he felt some kind of desire to efface himself. He went down to the stable. Henry Johnson, the negro who cared for the doctor's horses, was sponging the buggy. He grinned fraternally when he saw Jimmy coming. These two were pals. In regard to almost everything in life, they seemed to have minds precisely alike. Of course there were points of emphatic divergence. For instance, it was plain from Henry's talk that he was a very handsome negro, and he was known to be a light, a weight, and an eminence in the suburb of the town, where lived the larger number of the negroes, and obviously this glory was over Jimmy's horizon but he vaguely appreciated it, and paid deference to Henry for it, mainly because Henry appreciated it and deferred to himself. However, on all points of conduct, as related to the doctor, who was the moon, they were in complete but unexpressed understanding. Whenever Jimmy became the victim of an eclipse, he went to the stable to solace himself with Henry's crimes. Henry with the elasticity of his race, could usually provide a sin to place himself on a footing with the disgraced one. Perhaps he would remember that he had forgotten to put the hitching strap in the back of the buggy on some recent occasion, and had been reprimanded by the doctor. Then these two would commune suddenly and without words concerning their moon, holding themselves sympathetically as people who had committed similar treasons. On the other hand, Henry would sometimes choose to absolutely repudiate this idea, and when Jimmy appeared in his shame, would bully him most virtuously, preaching with assurance the precepts of the doctor's creed, and pointing out to Jimmy all his abominations. Jimmy did not discover that this was odious in his comrade. He accepted it, and lived in its shadow with humility, merely trying to conciliate the saintly Henry with acts of deference. Won by this attitude, Henry would sometimes allow the child to enjoy the felicity of squeezing the sponge over a buggy wheel, even while Jimmy was still gory from unspeakable deeds. Whenever Henry dwelt for a time in sackcloth, Jimmy did not patronize him at all. This was a justice of his age, his condition. He did not know. Besides, Henry could drive a horse, and Jimmy had a full sense of this sublimity. 
Henry personally conducted the moon during the splendid journeys through the country roads, where farms spread on all sides with sheep, cows, and other marvels abounding. "'Hello, Jim,' said Henry, poising his sponge. Water was dripping from the buggy. Sometimes the horses in the stall stamped thunderingly on the pine floor. There was an atmosphere of hay and of harness. For a minute Jimmy refused to take an interest in anything. He was very downcast. He could not even feel the wonders of wagon-washing. Henry, while at his work, narrowly observed him. "'Your pop done wallop here, didn't he?' he said at last. "'No,' said Jimmy defensively. "'He didn't.' After this casual remark, Henry continued his labor, with a scowl of occupation. Presently he said, "'I done told yer, many's the time not to go a-foolin' and a-projectin' with them flowers. Your pop don't like it nohow.' As a matter of fact, Henry had never mentioned flowers to the boy. Jimmy preserved a gloomy silence, so Henry began to use seductive wiles in this affair of washing a wagon. It was not until he began to spin a wheel on the tree, and the sprinkling water flew everywhere, that the boy was visibly moved. He had been seated on the sill of the carriage-house door, but at the beginning of this ceremony he arose and circled toward the buggy with an interest that slowly consumed the remembrance of a late disgrace. Johnson could then display all the dignity of a man whose duty it was to protect Jimmy from a splashing. "'Look out, boy, look out! You don't go spile your pants. I reckon your mama don't allow this foolishness. She knows it. I ain't going to have you round here spilling your pants and have Miss Trescott light on me presently. Deed I ain't.' He spoke with an air of great irritation, but he was not annoyed at all. This tone was merely a part of his importance. In reality, he was always delighted to have the child there to witness the business of the stable. For one thing, Jimmy was invariably overcome with reverence when he was told how beautifully a harness was polished or a horse groomed. Henry explained each detail of this kind with unction procuring great joy from the child's admiration. 3. After Johnson had taken his supper in the kitchen, he went to his loft in the carriage-house and dressed himself with much care. No bell of a court circle could bestow more mind on a toilet than did Johnson. On second thought, he was more like a priest, arraying himself for some parade of the church. As he emerged from his room, and sauntered down the carriage drive. No one would have suspected him of ever having washed a buggy. It was not altogether a matter of the lavender trousers, nor yet the straw hat with its bright silk band. The change was somewhere, far in the interior of Henry. But there was no cakewalk hyperbole in it. He was simply a quiet, well-bred gentleman of position, wealth, and other necessary achievements out on an evening stroll, and he had never washed a wagon in his life. In the morning, when in his working clothes, he had met a friend. Hello, Pete. Hello, Henry. Now, in his effulgence, he encountered the same friend. His bow was not at all haughty. If it expressed anything, it expressed consummate generosity. Good evening, Mr. Washington. Pete, who was very dirty, being at work in a potato patch, responded in a mixture of abasement and appreciation. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. The shimmering blue of the electric arc lamps was strong in the main street of the town. At numerous points, it was conquered by the orange glare of the outnumbering gaslights in the windows of shops. Through this radiant lane moved a crowd, which culminated in a throng before the post-office, awaiting the distribution of the evening mails. Occasionally there came into it a shrill electric streetcar, the motor singing like a cage full of grasshoppers, and possessing a great gong that clanged forth both warnings and simple noise. At the little theater 
which was a varnish and red plush miniature of the famous New York theaters, a company of strollers was to play East Lynn. The young men of the town were mainly gathered at the corners, in distinctive groups, which expressed various shades and lines of chumship, and had little to do with any social gradations. There they discussed everything with critical insight, passing the whole town in review as it swarmed in the street. When the gongs of the electric cars ceased for a moment to harry the ears, there could be heard the sound of the feet of the leisurely crowd on the blue stone pavement, and it was like the peaceful evening lashing at the shore of a lake. At the foot of the hill, where two lines of maple sentineled the way, an electric lamp glowed high among the embowering branches, and made most wonderful shadow etchings on the road below it. When Johnson appeared amid the throng, a member of one of the profane groups at a corner instantly telegraphed news of this extraordinary arrival to his companions. They hailed him. Hello, Henry. Going to walk for a cake tonight. Ain't he smooth? Why, you've got that cake right in your pocket, Henry. Throw out your chest a little more. Henry was not ruffled in any way by these quiet admonitions and compliments. In reply, he laughed a supremely good-natured chuckling laugh, which nevertheless expressed an underground complacency of superior metal. Young Griscom, the lawyer, was just emerging from Reef Snyder's barber shop, rubbing his chin contentedly. On the steps he dropped his hand and looked with wide eyes into the crowd. Suddenly he bolted back into the shop. Wow, he cried to the Parliament, you ought to see the coon that's coming. Reef Snyder and his assistant instantly poised their razors high and turned towards the window. Two belathered heads reared from the chairs. The electric shine in the street caused an effect like water to them who looked through the glass from the yellow glamour of Reef Snyder's shop. In fact, the people without resembled the inhabitants of a great aquarium that here had a square pane in it. Presently into this frame swam the graceful form of Henry Johnson. Gee, said Reef Snyder. He and his assistant, with one accord, threw their obligations to the winds, and leaving their lathered victims helpless, advanced to the window. Ain't he a tazy? said Reef Snyder, marveling. But the man in the first chair, with a grievance in his mind, had found a weapon. Why, that's only Henry Johnson, you blamed idiots. Come on now, Reef, and shave me. What do you think I am, a mummy? Reef Snyder turned, in a great excitement. I bait you any money that that was not Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson, rats! The scorn put into this last word made it an explosion. That man was a Pullman car porter or something. How could that be Henry Johnson? He demanded, turbulently. You have us crazy. The man in the first chair faced the barber in a storm of indignation. Didn't I give him those lavender trousers? He roared. And young Griscom, who had remained attentively at the window, said, Yes, I guess that was Henry. It looked like him. Oh, well said Reef Snyder, returning to his business. If you think so, oh well. He implied that he was stumbling for the sake of amiability. Finally the man in the second chair, mumbling from a mouth made timid by adjacent lather, said, That was Henry Johnson all right. Why, he always dresses like that when he wants to make a front. He's the biggest dude in town. Anybody knows that. Jinger said Reef Snyder. Henry was not at all oblivious of the wake of wondering ejaculation that streamed out behind him. On other occasions he had reaped the same joy, and he always had an eye for the demonstration. With a face beaming with happiness, he turned away from the scene of his victories into a narrow side street, where the electric light still hung high but only to exhibit a row of tumble-down houses, leaning together like paralytics. The saffron Miss Bella Farragut, 
in a calico frock, had been crouched on the front stoop, gossiping at long range, but she espied her approaching caller at a distance. She dashed around the corner of the house, galloping like a horse. Henry saw it all, but he preserved the polite demeanor of a guest when a waiter spills claret down his cuff. In this awkward situation he was simply perfect. The duty of receiving Mr. Johnson fell upon Mrs. Farragut, because Bella, in another room, was scrambling wildly into her best gown. The fat old woman met him with a great ivory smile, sweeping back with the door and bowing low. "'Walk in, Mr. Johnson, walk in. How is you this evening, Mr. Johnson? How is you?' Henry's face showed like a reflector as he bowed and bowed, bending almost from his head to his ankles. "'Good evening, Miss Fergot. Good evening. How is you this evening? Is all you folks well, Miss Fergot? After a great deal of kowtow, they were planted in two chairs opposite each other in the living room. Here they exchanged the most tremendous civilities, until Miss Bella swept into the room— when there was more kowtow on all sides, and a smiling show of teeth that was like an illumination. The cooking stove was, of course, in this drawing-room, and on the fire was some kind of a long-winded stew. Mrs. Farragut was obliged to arise and attend to it from time to time. Also young Slim came in and went to bed on his pallet in the corner. But to all these domesticities, the three maintained an absolute dumbness. They bowed and smiled, and ignored and imitated, until a late hour. And if they had been the occupants of the most gorgeous salon in the world, they could not have been more like three monkeys. After Henry had gone, Bella, who encouraged herself in the appropriation of phrases, said, "'Oh, Ma, isn't he divine?' Four. A Saturday evening was always a sign for a larger crowd to parade the thoroughfare. In summer the band played until ten o'clock in the little park. Most of the men of the town affected to be superior to this band, even to despise it, but in the still and fragrant evenings they invariably turned out in force, because the girls were sure to attend this concert, strolling slowly over the grass, linked closely in pairs or preferably in threes, in the curious public dependence upon one another which was their inheritance. There was no particular social aspect to this gathering, save that group regarded group with interest, but mainly in silence. Perhaps one girl would nudge another girl and suddenly say, Look, there goes Gertie Hoxton and her sister and they would appear to regard this as an event of importance. On a particular evening, a rather large company of young men were gathered on the sidewalk that edged the park. They remained thus beyond the borders of the festivities because of their dignity, which would not exactly allow them to appear in anything which was so much fun for the younger lads. These latter were careening madly through the crowd, precipitating minor accidents from time to time, but usually fleeing like mist swept by the wind before retribution could lay hands upon them. The band played a waltz, which involved a gift of prominence to the bass horn, and one of the young men on the sidewalk said that the music reminded him of the new engines on the hill pumping water into the reservoir. A similarity of this kind was not inconceivable but the young man did not say it because he disliked the band's playing. He said it because it was fashionable to say that manner of thing concerning the band. However, over in the stand, Billy Harris, who played the snare drum, was always surrounded by a throng of boys who adored his every whack. After the mails from New York and Rochester had been finally distributed, the crowd from the post office added to the mass already in the park. The wind waved the leaves of the maples, and, high in the air, the blue burning globes of the arc lamps caused the wonderful traceries of leaf shadows on the ground. 
when the light fell upon the upturned face of a girl, it caused it to glow with a wonderful pallor. A policeman came suddenly from the darkness and chased a gang of obstreperous little boys. They hooted him from a distance. The leader of the band had some of the mannerisms of the great musicians, and during a period of silence the crowd smiled when they saw him raise his hand to his brow, stroke it sentimentally, and glance upward with a look of poetic anguish. In the shivering light, which gave to the park an effect like a great vaulted hall, the throng swarmed, with a gentle murmur of dresses switching the turf, and with a steady hum of voices. Suddenly, without preliminary bars, there arose from afar the great hoarse roar of a factory whistle. It raised and swelled to a sinister note, and then it sang on the night wind one long call that held the crowd in the park immovable, speechless. The bandmaster had been about to vehemently let fall his hand to start the band on a thundering career through a popular march, but, smitten by this giant voice from the night, his hand dropped slowly to his knee, and, his mouth agape, he looked at his men in silence. The cry died away to a wail, and then to stillness. It released the muscles of the company of young men on the sidewalk, who had been like statues, posed eagerly, lithely, their ears turned. And then they wheeled upon each other simultaneously, and, in a single explosion, they shouted, One! Again the sound swelled in the night, and roared its long, ominous cry, and as it died away the crowd of young men wheeled upon each other, and, in chorus, yelled, Two! There was a moment of breathless waiting, then they bawled, Second District! In a flash, the company of indolent and cynical young men had vanished like a snowball, disrupted by dynamite. Five. Jake Rogers was the first man to reach the home of Tuscarora Hose Company No. 6. He had wrenched the key from his pocket as he tore down the street, and he jumped at the spring lock like a demon. As the doors flew back before his hands, he leaped and kicked the wedges from a pair of wheels, loosening a tongue from its clasp, and in the glare of the electric light, which the town placed before each of its hose-houses, the next comers beheld the spectacle of Jake Rogers, bent like hickory, in the manfulness of his pulling, and the heavy cart was moving slowly towards the doors. Four men joined him at the time, and as they swung with the cart out into the street, dark figures sped towards them, from the ponderous shadows back of the electric lamps. Some set up the inevitable question, What district? Second, was replied to them in a compact howl. Tuscarora Hose Company No. 6 swept on a perilous wheel into Niagara Avenue, and as the men, attached to the cart by the rope, which had been paid out from the windlass under the tongue, pulled madly in their fervor and abandon, the gong under the axle clanged incitingly, and sometimes the same cry was heard, What district? Second! On a grade, Johnny Thorpe fell, and exercising a singular muscular ability, rolled out in time from the track of the oncoming wheel, and arose, disheveled and aggrieved, casting a look of mournful disenchantment upon the black crowd that poured after the machine. The cart seemed to be the apex of a dark wave that was whirling as if it had been a broken dam. Back of the lad were stretches of lawn, and in that direction front doors were banged by men who hoarsely shouted out into the clamorous avenue, "'What district?' At one of these houses a woman came to the door bearing a lamp, shielding her face from its rays with her hands. Across the cropped grass the avenue represented to her a kind of black torrent, upon which, nevertheless, fled numerous miraculous figures upon bicycles. She did not know that the towering light at the corner 
was continuing its nightly whine. Suddenly a little boy somersaulted around the corner of the house, as if he had been projected down a flight of stairs by a catapultian boot. He halted himself in front of the house by dint of a rather extraordinary evolution with his legs. "'Oh, Ma!' he gasped. "'Can I go? Can I, Ma?' She straightened with the coldness of the exterior mother judgment, although the hand that held the lamp trembled slightly. "'No, Willie, you had better come to bed.' Instantly he began to buck and fume like a mustang. "'Oh, Ma!' he cried, contorting himself. "'Oh, Ma, can I go? Please, Ma, can I go? Can I go, Ma?' "'It's half-past nine now, Willie.' He ended by wailing out a compromise. "'Well, just let me go down to the corner, Ma, just down to the corner.' From the avenue came the sound of rushing men who wildly shouted. Somebody had grappled the bell-rope in the Methodist church, and now over the town rang this solemn and terrible voice, speaking from the clouds. Moved from its peaceful business, this bell gained a new spirit in the portentous night, and it swung the heart to and fro, up and down, with each peal of it. Just down to the corner, Ma. Willie, it's half-past nine now. 6. The outlines of the house of Dr. Trescott had faded quietly into the evening, hiding a shape such as we call Queen Anne against the pall of the blackened sky. The neighborhood was at this time so quiet and seemed so devoid of obstructions that Hannigan's dog thought it a good opportunity to prowl in forbidden precincts, and so came and pawed Trescott's lawn growling, and considering himself a formidable beast. Later, Peter Washington strolled past the house and whistled, but there was no dim light shining from Henry's loft, and presently Peter went his way. The rays from the street, creeping in silvery waves over the grass, caused the row of shrubs above the drive to throw a clear, bold shade. A wisp of smoke came from one of the windows at the end of the house, and drifted quietly into the branches of a cherry tree. Its companions followed it in slowly increasing numbers, and finally there was a current controlled by invisible banks, which poured into the fruit-laden boughs of the cherry tree. It was no more to be noted than if a troop of dim and silent gray monkeys had been climbing a grapevine into the clouds. After a moment the window brightened as if the four panes of it had been stained with blood, and a quick ear might have been led to imagine the fire imps calling and calling, clan joining clan, gathering to the colors. From the street, however, the house maintained its dark quiet, insisting to a passer-by that it was the safe dwelling of people who chose to retire early to tranquil dreams. No one could have heard this low droning of the gathering clans. Suddenly the panes of the red window tinkled and crashed to the ground, and at other windows there suddenly reared other flames, like bloody specters at the apertures of a haunted house. This outbreak had been well planned, as if by professional revolutionists. A man's voice suddenly shouted, Fire! 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 Hannigan had flung his pipe frenziedly from him, because his lungs demanded room. He tumbled down from his perch, swung over the fence, and ran shouting towards the front door of the Trescots. Then he hammered on the door, using his fists as if they were mallets. Mrs. Trescott instantly came to one of the windows on the second floor. Afterwards, she knew she had been about to say, The doctor is not at home, but if you will leave your name, I will let him know as soon as he comes. Hannigan's bawling was for a minute incoherent, but she understood that it was not about croup. What? she said, raising the window swiftly. Your house is on fire. You're all ablaze. Move quick if— 
His cries were resounding in the street, as if it were a cave of echoes. Many feet pattered swiftly on the stones. There was one man who ran with an almost fabulous speed. He wore lavender trousers. A straw hat with a bright silk band was held half crumpled in his hand. As Henry reached the front door, Hannigan had just broken the lock with a kick. A thick cloud of smoke poured over them, and Henry, ducking his head, rushed into it. From Hannigan's clamor he knew only one thing, but it turned him blue with horror. In the hall a lick of flame had found the cord that supported signing the declaration. The engraving slumped suddenly down at one end, and then dropped to the floor, where it burst with the sound of a bomb. The fire was already roaring like a winter wind among the pines. At the head of the stairs, Mrs. Trescott was waving her arms, as if they were two reeds. "'Jimmy! Save Jimmy!' she screamed in Henry's face. He plunged past her and disappeared, taking the long familiar roots among these upper chambers, where he had once held office as a sort of second assistant housemaid. Hannigan had followed him up the stairs, and grappled the arm of the maniacal woman there. His face was black with rage. "'You must come down!' he bellowed. She would only scream at him in reply, "'Jimmy! Jimmy! Save Jimmy!' But he dragged her forth while she babbled at him. As they swung out into the open air, a man ran across the lawn, and seizing a shutter, pulled it from its hinges, and flung it far out upon the grass. Then he frantically attacked the other shutters one by one. It was a kind of temporary insanity. "'Here, you!' howled Hannigan. "'Hold Mrs. Trescott, and stop!' The news had been telegraphed by a twist of the wrist of a neighbor, who had gone to the firebox at the corner, and the time when Hannigan and his charge struggled out of the house was the time when the whistle roared its hoarse night call, smiting the crowd in the park, causing the leader of the band, who was about to order the first triumphal clang of a military march, to let his hand drop slowly to his knees. 7. Henry pawed awkwardly through the smoke in the upper halls. He had attempted to guide himself by the walls, but they were too hot. The paper was crimpling, and he expected at any moment to have a flame burst from under his hands. Jimmy! He did not call very loud, as if in fear that the humming flames below would overhear him. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! Stumbling and panting, he speedily reached the entrance to Jimmy's room and flung open the door. The little chamber had no smoke in it at all. It was faintly illuminated by a beautiful rosy light, reflected circuitously from the flames that were consuming the house. The boy had apparently just been aroused by the noise. He sat in his bed, his lips apart, his eyes wide, while upon his little white-robed figure played caressingly the light from the fire. As the door flew open, he had before him this apparition of his pal, a terror-stricken negro, all tousled and with wool scorching, who leaped upon him and bore him up in a blanket, as if the whole affair were a case of kidnapping by a dreadful robber chief. Without waiting to go through the usual short but complete process of wrinkling up his face, Jimmy let out a gorgeous bawl, which resembled the expression of a calf's deepest terror. As Johnson, bearing him, reeled into the smoke of the hall. He flung his arms about his neck and buried his face in the blanket. He called twice in muffled tones, Mama! Mama! When Johnson came to the top of the stairs with his burden, he took a quick step backward. Through the smoke that rolled to him, he could see that the lower hall was all ablaze. He cried out then in a howl, that resembled Jimmy's former achievement. 
His legs gained a frightful faculty of bending sideways. Swinging about precariously on these reedy legs, he made his way back slowly, back along the upper hall. From the way of him then, he had given up almost all idea of escaping from the burning house, and with it the desire. He was submitting, submitting because of his father's, bending his mind in a most perfect slavery to this conflagration. He now clutched Jimmy as unconsciously as when, running toward the house, he had clutched the hat with the bright silk band. Suddenly he remembered a little private staircase, which led from a bedroom to an apartment which the doctor had fitted up as a laboratory and workhouse, where he used some of his leisure, and also hours when he might have been sleeping, in devoting himself to experiments which came in the way of his study and interest. When Johnson recalled this stairway, the submission to the blaze departed instantly. He had been perfectly familiar with it, but his confusion had destroyed the memory of it. In his sudden momentary apathy, there had been little that resembled fear, but now, as a way of safety came to him, the old frantic terror caught him. He was no longer creature to the flames, and he was afraid of the battle with them. It was a singular and swift set of alternations, in which he feared twice without submission, and submitted once without fear. Jimmy, he wailed, as he staggered on his way. He wished this little inanimate body at his breast to participate in his tremblings, but the child had lain limp and still during these headlong charges and counter-charges, and no sign came from him. Johnson passed through two rooms and came to the head of the stairs. As he opened the door great billows of smoke poured out. But gripping Jimmy closer, he plunged down through them. All manner of odors assailed him during this flight. They seemed to be alive with envy, hatred, and malice. At the entrance to the laboratory he confronted a strange spectacle. The room was like a garden in the region where might be burning flowers. Flames of violet, crimson, green, blue, orange, and purple were blooming everywhere. There was one blaze that was precisely the hue of a delicate coral. In another place was a mass that lay merely in phosphorescent inaction, like a pile of emeralds. But all these marvels were to be seen dimly through clouds of heaving, turning, deadly smoke. Johnson halted for a moment on the threshold. He cried out again in the negro wail that had in it the sadness of the swamps. Then he rushed across the room. An orange-colored flame leaped like a panther at the lavender trousers. This animal bit deeply into Johnson. There was an explosion at one side, and suddenly before him there reared a delicate, trembling sapphire shape, like a fairy lady. With a quiet smile she blocked his path and doomed him and Jimmy. Johnson shrieked and then ducked in the manner of his race in fights. He aimed to pass under the left guard of the sapphire lady, but she was swifter than eagles, and her talons caught in him as he plunged past her. Bowing his head as if his neck had been struck, Johnson lurched forward, twisting this way and that way. He fell on his back. The still form in the blanket flung from his arms, rolled to the edge of the floor and beneath the window. Johnson had fallen with his head at the base of an old-fashioned desk. There was a row of jars upon the top of this desk. For the most part they were silent amid this rioting, but there was one which seemed to hold a scintillant and writhing serpent. Suddenly the glass splintered and a ruby-red snake-like thing poured its thick length out upon the top of the old desk. It coiled and hesitated, and then began to swim a languorous way down the mahogany slant. At the angle it waved its sizzling molten head to and fro over the closed eyes of the man beneath it. Then, in a moment, with a mystic impulse, it moved again 
and the red snake flowed directly down into Johnson's upturned face. Afterwards the trail of this creature seemed to reek, and amid flames and low explosions, drops like red-hot jewels, pattered softly down it at leisurely intervals. 8. Suddenly all roads led to Dr. Trescott's. The whole town flowed towards one point. Chippeway Hose Company No. 1 toiled desperately up Bridge Street Hill, even as the Tuscaroras came in an impetuous sweep down Niagara Avenue. Meanwhile the machine of the hook-and-ladder experts from across the creek was spinning on its way. The chief of the fire department had been playing poker in the rear room of Whiteley's cigar store, but at the first breath of the alarm he sprang through the door like a man escaping with the kitty. In Willemville, on these occasions, there was always a number of people who instantly turned their attention to the bells in the churches and schoolhouses. The bells not only emphasized the alarm, but it was the habit to send these sounds rolling across the sky in a stirring brazen uproar until the flames were practically vanquished. There was also a kind of rivalry as to which bell should be made to produce the greatest din. Even the valley church, four miles away among the farms, had heard the voices of its brethren and immediately added a quaint little yelp. Dr. Trescott had been driving homeward, slowly smoking a cigar, and feeling glad that this last case was now in complete obedience to him, like a wild animal that he had subdued, when he heard the long whistle and chirped to his horse under the unlicensed but perfectly distinct impression that a fire had broken out in Oakhurst, a new and rather high-flying suburb of the town which was at least two miles from his own home. But in the second blast, and in the ensuing silence, he read the designation of his own district. He was then only a few blocks from his house. He took out the whip and laid it lightly on the mare. Surprised and frightened at this extraordinary action, she leaped forward, and as the rain straightened like steel bands, the doctor leaned backward a trifle. When the mare whirled him up to the closed gate, he was wondering whose house could be a fire. The man who had rung the signal box yelled something at him, but he already knew. He left the mare to her will. In front of his house was a maniacal woman in a wrapper. Ned! she screamed at sight of him. Jimmy! Save Jimmy! Trescott had grown hard and chill. Where? he said. Where? Mrs. Trescott's voice began to bubble. Up, up, up. She pointed at the second-story windows. Hannigan was already shouting, Don't go in that way. You can't go in that way. Trescott ran around the corner of the house and disappeared from them. He knew from the view he had taken of the main hall that it would be impossible to ascend from there. His hopes were fastened now to the stairway which led from the laboratory. The door which opened from this room out upon the lawn was fastened with a bolt and lock, but he kicked close to the lock, and then close to the bolt. The door with a loud crash flew back. The doctor recoiled from the roll of smoke, and then bending low, he stepped into the garden of burning flowers. On the floor, his stinging eyes could make out a form in a smoldering blanket near the window. Then, as he carried his son towards the door, he saw that the whole lawn seemed now alive with men and boys, the leaders in the great charge that the whole town was making. They seized him and his burden, and overpowered him in wet blankets and water. But Hannigan was howling, "'Johnson! Henry Johnson is in there yet!' He went in after the kid. Johnson is in there yet. These cries penetrated to the sleepy senses of Trescott, and he struggled with his captors, swearing, unknown to him and to them, all the deep blasphemies of his medical student days. He rose to his feet and went again towards the door of the laboratory. They endeavored to restrain him, although they were much affrighted at him. 
but a young man who was a brakeman on the railway, and lived in one of the rear streets near the Trescots, had gone into the laboratory and brought forth a thing which he laid upon the grass. Section 8 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 of The Monster. 9. There were hoarse commands from in front of the house. Turn on your water, five! Let her go, one! The gathering crowd swayed this way and that way. The flames, towering high, cast a high red light on their faces. There came the clangor of a gong from across some adjacent street. The crowd exclaimed at it. Here comes number three. That's three a-comin'. A panting and irregular mob dashed into view, dragging a hose-cart. A cry of exultation arose from the little boys. Here's three. The lads welcomed never-die hose-company number three, as if it was composed of a chariot dragged by a band of gods. The perspiring citizens flung themselves into the fray. The boys danced in impish joy at the displays of prowess. They acclaimed the approach of number two. They welcomed number four with cheers. They were so deeply moved by this whole affair that they bitterly guyed the late appearance of the hook-and-ladder company, whose heavy apparatus had almost stalled them on the Bridge Street Hill. The lads hated and feared a fire, of course. They did not particularly want to have anybody's house burn, but still it was fine to see the gathering of the companies, and amid a great noise to watch their heroes perform all manner of prodigies. They were divided into parties over the worth of different companies, and supported their creeds with no small violence. For instance, in the part of the little city where Number 4 had its home, it would be the most daring for a boy to contend the superiority of any other company. Likewise, in another quarter, where a strange boy was asked which fire company was the best in Willemville, he was expected to answer number one. Feuds, which the boys forgot and remembered according to chance, or the importance of some recent event, existed all through the town. They did not care much for John Shipley, the chief of the department. It was true that he went to a fire with the speed of a falling angel, but when there he invariably lapsed into a certain still mood, which was almost a preoccupation, moving leisurely around the burning structure and surveying it, puffing meanwhile at a cigar. This quiet man, who even when life was in danger, seldom raised his voice, was not much to their fancy. Now, old Sykes Huntington, when he was chief, used to bellow continually like a bull and gesticulate in a sort of delirium. He was much finer as a spectacle than this Shipley, who viewed a fire with the same steadiness that he viewed a raise in a large jackpot. The greater number of boys could never understand why the members of these companies persisted in re-electing Shipley although they often pretended to understand it, because, my father says, was a very formidable phrase in argument, and the father seemed almost unanimous in advocating Shipley. At this time there was considerable discussion as to which company had gotten the first stream of water on the fire. Most of the boys claimed that number five owned this distinction, but there was a determined minority who contended for number one, Boys who were the blood adherents of other companies were obliged to choose between the two on this occasion, and the talk waxed warm. But a great rumor went among the crowds. It was told with hushed voices. Afterwards, a reverent silence fell even upon the boys. Jimmy Trescott and Henry Johnson had been burned to death, and Dr. Trescott himself had been most savagely hurt. The crowd did not even feel the police pushing at them. They raised their eyes, shining now with awe, towards the high flames. 
the man who had information was at his best. In low tones he described the whole affair. That was the kid's room, in the corner there. He had measles or something, and this coon, Johnson, was a settin' up with him. And Johnson got sleepy or something and upset the lamp. And the doctor, he was down in his office, and he came running up. And they all got burned together till they dragged him out. Another man, always preserved for the deliverance of the final judgment, was saying, Oh, they'll die, sure. Burned to flinders. No chance. Whole lot of them. Anybody can see. The crowd concentrated its gaze still more closely upon these flags of fire, which waved joyfully against the black sky. The bells of the town were clashing unceasingly. A little procession moved across the lawn and towards the street. There were three cots, borne by twelve of the firemen. The police moved sternly, but it needed no effort of theirs to open a lane for this slow cortege. The men who bore the cots were well known to the crowd, but in this solemn parade, during the ringing of the bells and the shouting, and with the red glare upon the sky, they seemed utterly foreign, and Willemville paid them a deep respect. Each man in this stretcher party had gained a reflected majesty. They were footmen to death, and the crowd made subtle obeisance to this august dignity derived from three prospective graves. One woman turned away with a shriek at sight of the covered body on the first stretcher, and people faced her suddenly in silent and mournful indignation. Otherwise there was barely a sound, as these twelve important men with measured tread carried their burdens through the throng. The little boys no longer discussed the merits of the different fire companies. For the greater part they had been routed. Only the more courageous viewed closely the three figures veiled in yellow blankets. 10. Old Judge Denning Hagenthorpe, who lived nearly opposite the Trescotts, had thrown his door wide open to receive the afflicted family. When it was publicly learned that the doctor and his son and the negro were still alive, it required a specially detailed policeman to prevent people from scaling the front porch and interviewing these sorely wounded. One old lady appeared with a miraculous poultice, and she quoted most damning scripture to the officer when he said that she could not pass him. Throughout the night some lads old enough to be given privileges or to compel them from their mothers remained vigilantly upon the curb in anticipation of a death or some such event. The reporter of the Morning Tribune rode thither on his bicycle every hour until three o'clock. Six of the ten doctors in Willemville attended at Judge Hagenthorpe's house. Almost at once they were able to know that Trescott's burns were not vitally important. The child would probably be scarred badly, but his life was undoubtedly safe. As for the Negro Henry Johnson, he could not live. His body was frightfully seared, but more than that, he now had no face. His face had simply been burned away. Trescott was always asking news of the two other patients. In the morning he seemed fresh and strong, so they told him that Johnson was doomed. They then saw him stir on the bed, and sprang quickly to see if the bandages needed readjusting. In the sudden glance he threw from one to another, he impressed them as being both leonine and impracticable. The morning paper announced the death of Henry Johnson. It contained a long interview with Henry J. Hannigan, in which the latter described in full the performance of Johnson at the fire. There was also an editorial, built from all the best words in the vocabulary of the staff. The town halted in its accustomed road of thought, and turned a reverent attention to the memory of this hostler. In the breasts of many people was the regret that they had not known enough to give him a hand and a lift when he was alive, and they judged themselves stupid and ungenerous for this failure. The name of Henry Johnson became suddenly the title of a saint to the little boys. The one who thought of it first could by quoting it in an argument, 
at once overthrow his antagonist, whether it applied to the subject or whether it did not. Nigger, nigger, never die, black face and shiny eye. Boys who had called this odious couplet in the rear of Johnson's march buried the fact at the bottom of their hearts. Later in the day Miss Bella Farragut, of Number 7 Watermelon Alley, announced that she had been engaged to marry Mr. Henry Johnson. 11. The old judge had a cane with an ivory head. He could never think at his best until he was leaning slightly on this stick and smoothing the white top with slow movements of his hands. It was also to him a kind of narcotic. If by any chance he mislaid it, he grew at once very irritable, and was likely to speak sharply to his sister, whose mental incapacity he had patiently endured for thirty years in the old mansion on Ontario Street. She was not at all aware of her brother's opinion of her endowments, and so it might be said that the judge had successfully dissembled for more than a quarter of a century, only risking the truth at the times when his cane was lost. On a particular day the judge sat in his armchair on the porch. The sunshine sprinkled through the lilac bushes and poured great coins on the boards. The sparrows disputed in the trees that lined the pavements. The judge mused deeply, while his hands gently caressed the ivory head of his cane. Finally he arose and entered his house, his brow still furrowed in a thoughtful frown. His stick thumped solemnly in regular beats. On the second floor he entered a bedroom where Dr. Trescott was working about the bedside of Henry Johnson. The bandages on the negro's head allowed only one thing to appear, an eye, which unwinkingly stared at the judge. The latter spoke to Trescott on the condition of the patient. Afterward he evidently had something further to say, but he seemed to be kept from it by the scrutiny of the unwinking eye at which he furtively glanced from time to time. When Jimmy Trescott was sufficiently recovered, his mother had taken him to pay a visit to his grandparents in Connecticut. The doctor had remained to take care of his patients, but as a matter of truth he spent most of his time at Judge Hagenthorpe's house, where lay Henry Johnson. Here he slept and ate almost every meal in the long nights and days of his vigil. At dinner, and away from the magic of the unwinking eye, the judge said, suddenly, Trescott, do you think it is? As Trescott paused expectantly, the judge fingered his knife. He said, thoughtfully, No one wants to advance such ideas, but somehow I think that the poor fellow ought to die. There was in Trescott's face at once a look of recognition as if in this tangent of the judge he saw an old problem. He merely sighed and answered, Who knows? The words were spoken in a deep tone that gave them an elusive kind of significance. The judge retreated to the cold manner of the bench. Perhaps we may not talk with propriety of this kind of action, but I am induced to say that you are performing a questionable charity in preserving this negro's life. As near as I can understand, he will hereafter be a monster, a perfect monster, and probably with an affected brain. No man can observe you, as I have observed you, and not know that it was a matter of conscience with you, but I am afraid, my friend, that it is one of the blunders of virtue. The judge had delivered his views with his habitual oratory. The last three words he spoke with a particular emphasis as if the phrase was his discovery. The doctor made a weary gesture. He saved my boy's life. Yes, said the judge swiftly. Yes, I know. And what am I to do? said Trescott, his eyes suddenly lighting like an outburst from smoldering peat. What am I to do? He gave himself for, for Jimmy. What am I to do for him? The judge abased himself completely before these words. He lowered his eyes for a moment. He picked at his cucumbers. Presently he braced himself straightly in his chair. He will be your creation, you understand, 
He is purely your creation. Nature has very evidently given him up. He is dead. You are restoring him to life. You are making him, and he will be a monster, and with no mind. He will be what you like, Judge, cried Trescott, in sudden polite fury. He will be anything, but, by God, he saved my boy. The judge interrupted in a voice trembling with emotion. Trescott, Trescott, don't I know? Trescott had subsided to a sullen mood. Yes, you know, he answered acidly. But you don't know all about your own boy being saved from death. This was a perfectly childish allusion to the judge's bachelorhood. Trescott knew that the remark was infantile, but he seemed to take desperate delight in it. But it passed the judge completely. It was not his spot. I am puzzled, said he, in profound thought. I don't know what to say. Trescott had become repentant. Don't think I don't appreciate what you say, judge, but— Of course, responded the judge quickly, of course. It— began Trescott. Of course, said the judge. In silence they resumed their dinner. Well, said the judge ultimately, it is hard for a man to know what to do. It is, said the doctor fervidly. There was another silence. It was broken by the judge. Look here, Trescott, I don't want you to think. No, certainly not, answered the doctor earnestly. Well, well, I don't want you to think I would say anything to— It was only that I thought that I might be able to suggest to you that, perhaps, the affair was a little dubious. With an appearance of suddenly disclosing his real mental perturbation, the doctor said, Well, what would you do? Would you kill him? He asked, suddenly and sternly. Trescott, you fool, said the old man gently. Oh, well, I know, Judge, but then— He turned red and spoke with new violence. Say, he saved my boy. Do you see? He saved my boy. You bet he did, cried the judge with enthusiasm. You bet he did. And they remained for a time gazing at each other, their faces illuminated with memories of a certain deed. After another silence, the judge said— it is hard for a man to know what to do. 12. Late one evening, Trescott, returning from a professional call, paused his buggy at the Hagenthorpe gate. He tied the mare to the old tin-covered post and entered the house. Ultimately he appeared with a companion, a man who walked slowly and carefully, as if he were learning. He was wrapped to the heels in an old-fashioned ulster. They entered the buggy and drove away. After a silence only broken by the swift and musical humming of the wheels on the smooth road, Trescott spoke. Henry, he said, I've got you a home here with old Alec Williams. You will have everything you want to eat and a good place to sleep, and I hope you will get along there all right. I will pay all your expenses and come to see you as often as I can. If you don't get along, I want you to let me know as soon as possible, and then we will do what we can to make it better. The dark figure on the doctor's side answered with a cheerful laugh. These buggy wheels don't look like I washed them yesterday, doctor, he said. Trescott hesitated a moment, and then went on insistently. I am taking you to Alec Williams, Henry, and I— the figure chuckled again. No, deed, no, sir. Alec Williams don't know a hoss. Deed he don't. He don't know a hoss from a pig. The laugh that followed was like the rattle of pebbles. Trescott turned and looked sternly and coldly at the dim form in the gloom from the buggy top. Henry, he said, I didn't say anything about horses. I was saying, Hoss, hoss said the quavering voice from these near shadows. Hoss? Deed I don't know all about a hoss. Deed I don't. There was a satirical chuckle. At the end of three miles the mare slackened, and the doctor leaned forward, peering, while holding tight reins. The wheels of the buggy bumped often over the outcropping boulders. 
A window shone forth, a simple square of topaz, on a great black hillside. Four dogs charged the buggy with ferocity, and when it did not promptly retreat, they circled courageously around the flanks, baying. A door opened near the windows in the hillside, and a man came and stood on a beach of yellow light. Yah, yah, you Rova, you Susie, come yah, come yah this minute. Truscott called across the dark sea of grass. Hello, Alec. Hello. Come down here and show me where to drive. The man plunged from the beach into the surf, and Trescott could then only trace his course by the fervid and polite ejaculations of a host who was somewhere approaching. Presently Williams took the mare by the head, and uttering cries of welcome, and scolding the swarming dogs, led the equipage towards the lights. When they halted at the door, and Trescott was climbing out, Williams cried, "'Will she stand, doctor?' She'll stand all right, but you better hold her for a minute. Now, Henry. The doctor turned and held both arms to the dark figure. It crawled to him painfully, like a man going down a ladder. Williams took the mare away to be tied to a little tree, and when he returned he found them awaiting him in the gloom beyond the rays from the door. He burst out then, like a siphon pressed by a nervous thumb. Henry, Henry, my old friend, well, if I ain't glad, if I ain't glad. Trescott had taken the silent shape by the arm, and led it forward into the full revelation of the light. Well, now, Alec, you can take Henry and put him to bed, and in the morning I will— Near the end of this sentence, old Williams had come front to front with Johnson. He gasped for a second— and then yelled the yell of a man stabbed in the heart. For a fraction of a moment Trescott seemed to be looking for epithets. Then he roared, "'You old black chump! You old black! Shut up! Shut up! Do you hear?' Williams obeyed instantly in the matter of his screams, but he continued in a lowered voice, "'My lot of mercy! Who'd ever think? My lot of mercy!' Trescott spoke again in the manner of a commander of a battalion. Alec! The old negro again surrendered, but to himself he repeated in a whisper, My lord! He was aghast and trembling. As these three points of widening shadows approached the golden doorway, a hale old negress appeared there, bowing. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. Come in, come in. She had evidently just retired from a tempestuous struggle to place the room in order, but she was now bowing rapidly. She made the effort of a person swimming. "'Don't trouble yourself, Mary,' said Trescott, entering. "'I've brought Henry for you to take care of, and all you've got to do is carry out what I tell you.' Learning that he was not followed, he faced the door and said, "'Come in, Henry.' Johnson entered. Wee! shrieked Mrs. Williams. She almost achieved a back somersault. Six young members of the tribe of Williams made a simultaneous plunge for a position behind the stove, and formed a wailing heap. 13. You know very well that you and your family lived usually on less than three dollars a week, and now that Dr. Trescott pays you five dollars a week for Johnson's board— you live like millionaires. You haven't done a stroke of work since Johnson began to board with you. Everybody knows that. And so what are you kicking about? The judge sat in his chair on the porch, fondling his cane, and gazing down at old Williams, who stood under the lilac bushes. Yes, I know, Judge, said the negro, wagging his head in a puzzled manner. Tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what the doctor done, but, but, well— you see, Jedge, he added, gaining a new impetus, it's, it's hard work. This old man never did work so hard. Lord, no. Don't talk such nonsense, Alec, spoke the judge sharply. You have never really worked in your life, anyhow, enough to support a family of sparrows. And now when you are in a more prosperous condition than ever before, you come around talking like an old fool. 
the negro began to scratch his head. "'You see, Jedge, he said at last, "'my old woman, she can't see no lady callers, no how.' "'Hang lady callers,' said the judge irascibly. "'If you have flour in the barrel and meat in the pot, "'your wife can get along without receiving lady callers, can't she?' "'But they won't come anyhow, Jedge," replied Williams, "'with an air of still deeper stupefaction. "'None of my wife's friends nor none of my friends will come near my residence.' "'Well, let them stay home if they are such silly people.' The old negro seemed to be seeking a way to elude this argument, but evidently finding none, he was about to shuffle meekly off. He halted, however. "'Jedge,' said he, "'my old woman's near driv abstracted.' "'Your old woman is an idiot,' responded the judge. Williams came very close and peered solemnly through a branch of lilac. Jedge, he whispered, the chillins. What about them? Dropping his voice to funereal depths, William said, They, they can't eat. Can't eat, scoffed the judge loudly. Can't eat. You must think I'm as big an old fool as you are. Can't eat, the little rascals. What's to prevent them from eating? In answer, William said, with mournful emphasis, Henry. Moved with a kind of satisfaction at his tragic use of the name, he remained staring at the judge for a sign of its effect. The judge made a gesture of irritation. "'Come now, you old scoundrel. Don't beat around the bush any more. What are you up to? What do you want? Speak out like a man, and don't give me any more of this tiresome rigmarole.' "'I ain't her beatin' round bout nothing, Jedge,' replied Williams indignantly. "'No, sir.' I say what I got to say right out, deed I do. Well, say it then. Jedge, began the negro, taking off his hat and switching his knee with it. Lord knows I do just about as much for five dollars a week as any culled man, but, but this year business is awful, Jedge. I reckon ain't been no sleep in, in my house since doctor come fetch him. Well, what do you propose to do about it? Williams lifted his eyes from the ground and gazed off through the trees. "'Reckon I got good appetite, and sleep just like a dog, but he, he's done broke me all up. Tain't no good, no how. I wake up in the night, I hear him maybe, or whimpering, and her whimpering, and I sneak and I sneak until I try the dough to see if he locked in, and he keep me her puzzling and her quaking all night long. Don't know how do in the winter.' Can't let him out where the chillin' is. He'll done freeze where he is now. William spoke these sentences as if he were talking to himself. After a silence of deep reflection, he continued. Folks go round saying he ain't Henry Johnson at all. They say he's a devil. What? cried the judge. Yes, sir, repeated Williams in tones of injury, as if his veracity had been challenged. Yes, sir, I'm a tellin' it to you straight, Jedge. Plenty called folks up my way say it is a devil. Well, you don't think so yourself, do you? No, tain't no devil. It's Henry Johnson. Well, then, what is the matter with you? You don't care what a lot of foolish people say. Go on tending to your business and pay no attention to such idle nonsense. Tis nonsense, Jedge, but he looks like a devil. What do you care what he looks like? demanded the judge. "'My rent is two dollars and a half a month,' said William slowly. "'It might just as well be ten thousand dollars a month,' responded the judge. "'You never pay it anyhow.' "'Then another thing,' continued Williams, in his reflective tone. "'If he was all right in his head, I could stand it. But, Jedge, he's crazier than a loon.' Then when he looks like a devil and done scares all my friends away, and my chillins can't eat, and my old woman's just raising cane all the time, and my rent two dollars and a half a month, and him not right in his head, it seems like five dollars a week. The judge's stick came down sharply and suddenly upon the floor of the porch. There, he said, I thought that was what you were driving at. Williams began swinging his head from side to side, in the strange racial mannerism. "'Now hold on a minute, Jedge,' 
he said defensively. "'Tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what the doctor done. "'Tain't that. Dr. Trescott is a kind man, "'and tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what he done, but, but... "'But what? You are getting painful, Alec. "'Now tell me this. "'Did you ever have five dollars a week regularly before in your life?' "'Williams at once drew himself up with great dignity. "'But in the pause after that question, "'he drooped gradually to another attitude.' In the end, he answered heroically, "'No, Jedge, I ain't, and tain't like as if I were saying five dollars wasn't a lot of money for a man like me. But, Jedge, what a man ought to get for this kind of work is a salary. Yes, sir, Jedge,' he repeated with a great impressive gesture. "'For this kind of work a man ought to get a salary.' He laid a terrible emphasis upon the final word. The judge laughed. I know Dr. Trescott's mind concerning this affair, Alec, and if you are dissatisfied with your boarder, he is quite ready to move him to some other place. So if you care to leave word with me that you are tired of the arrangement and wish it changed, he will come and take Johnson away. William scratched his head again in deep perplexity. Five dollars is a big price for board, but tain't no big price for the board of a crazy man, he said finally. "'What do you think you ought to get?' asked the judge. "'Well,' answered Alec, in the manner of one deep in a balancing of the scales, "'he looks like a devil, and done scares everybody, "'and my chillins can't eat, and I can't sleep, "'and he ain't right in his head, and... "'You told me all those things.' "'After scratching his wool, and beating his knee with his hat, "'and gazing off through the trees and down at the ground, "'William said,' as he kicked nervously at the gravel. "'Well, Jedge, I think it is worth—' He stuttered. "'Worth what?' Six dollars,' answered Williams, in a desperate outburst. The judge lay back in his great armchair, and went through all the motions of a man laughing heartily, but he made no sound save a slight cough. Williams had been watching him with apprehension. "'Well,' said the judge, do you call six dollars a salary? No, sir, promptly responded Williams. Tain't a salary, no deed, tain't a salary. He looked with some anger upon the man who questioned his intelligence in this way. Well, supposing your children can't eat? Aye, and supposing he looks like a devil, and supposing all those things continue, would you be satisfied with six dollars a week? Recollection seemed to throng in William's mind at these interrogations, and he answered dubiously, "'Of course a man who ain't right in his head and looks like a devil, but six dollars!' After these two attempts at a sentence, William suddenly appeared as an orator, with a great shiny palm waving in the air. "'I tell you, Jedge, six dollars is six dollars. But if I get six dollars for boarding Henry Johnson, I earns it.' I earns it. I don't doubt that you earn six dollars for every week's work you do, said the judge. Well, if I bought Henry Johnson for six dollars a week, I earns it. I earns it, cried Williams wildly. Fourteen. Reef Snyder's assistant had gone to his supper, and the owner of the shop was trying to placate four men who wished to be shaved at once. Reef Snyder was very garrulous a fact which made him rather remarkable among barbers, who, as a class, are austerely speechless, having been taught silence by the hammering reiteration of a tradition. It is the customers who talk in the ordinary event. As Reef Snyder waved his razor down the cheek of a man in the chair, he turned often to cool the impatience of the others with pleasant talk, which they did not particularly heed. Oh, he should have let him die! said Bainbridge, a railway engineer, finally replying to one of the barber's orations. Shut up, Reef, and go on with your business. Instead, Reef Snyder paused shaving entirely and turned to front the speaker. Let him die, he demanded. How was that? How can you let a man die? By letting him die, you chump, said the engineer. The others laughed a little, and Reef Snyder turned at once to his work, sullenly as a man overwhelmed by the derision of numbers. How was that? he grumbled later. 
How can you let a man die when he has done so much for you? When he has done so much for you, repeated Bainbridge, you better shave some people. How was that? Maybe this ain't a barber shop. A man hitherto silent now said, If I had been the doctor, I would have done the same thing. Of course, said Reefsnyder. Any man would do it. Any man that was not like you, you old flint-hearted fish. He had sought the final words with painful care, and he delivered the collection triumphantly at Bainbridge. The engineer laughed. The man in the chair now lifted himself higher, while Reefsnyder began an elaborate ceremony of anointing and combing his hair. Now free to join comfortably in the talk, the man said, They say he is the most terrible thing in the world, young Johnny Bernard, that drives the grocery wagon. Saw him up at Alec William's shanty, and he says he couldn't eat anything for two days. Gee, said Reefsnyder. Well, what makes him so terrible? asked another. Because he hasn't got any face, replied the barber and the engineer in duct. Hasn't got any face, repeated the man. How can he do without any face? He has no face in the front of his head, in the place where his face ought to grow. Bainbridge sang these lines pathetically as he arose and hung his hat on a hook. The man in the chair was about to abdicate in his favor. Get a gate on you now, he said to Reefsnyder. I go out at 731. As the barber foamed the lather on the cheeks of the engineer, he seemed to be thinking heavily. Then suddenly he burst out. How would you like to be with no face? he cried to the assemblage. Oh, if I had to have a face like yours, answered one customer. Bainbridge's voice came from a sea of lather. You're kicking because if losing faces became popular, you'd have to go out of business. I don't think it will become so popular, said Reefsnyder. Not if it's got to be taken off in the way his was taken off, said another man. I'd rather keep mine, if you don't mind. I guess so, cried the barber. Just think. The shaving of Bainbridge had arrived at a time of comparative liberty for him. I wonder what the doctor says to himself, he observed. He may be sorry he made him live. It was the only thing he could do, replied a man. The other seemed to agree with him. Supposing you were in his place, said one, and Johnson had saved your kid, what would you do? Certainly, of course, you would do anything on earth for him. You'd take all the trouble in the world for him, and spend your last dollar on him. Well, then. I wonder how it feels to be without any face, said Reefsnyder, musingly. The man who had previously spoken, feeling that he had expressed himself well, repeated the whole thing. You would do anything on earth for him. You'd take all the trouble in the world for him, and spend your last dollar on him. Well, then. No, but look, said Reefsnyder. Supposing you don't got a face. Fifteen. As soon as Williams was hidden from the view of the old judge, he began to gesture and talk to himself. An elation had evidently penetrated to his vitals, and caused him to dilate as if he had been filled with gas. He snapped his fingers in the air, and whistled fragments of triumphal music. At times, in his progress towards his shanty, he indulged in a shuffling movement that was really a dance. It was to be learned from the intermediate monologue that he had emerged from his trials, laureled and proud. He was the unconquerable Alexander Williams. Nothing could exceed the bold self-reliance of his manner. His kingly stride, his heroic song, the derisive flourish of his hands, all betokened a man who had successfully defied the world. On his way, he saw Zeke Patterson coming to town. They hailed each other at a distance of fifty yards. How do, how do, Brother Patterson? How do, Brother Williams? They were both deacons. Is your folks well, Brother Patterson? Midland, Midland, how's you folks, Brother Williams? Neither of them had slowed his pace in the smallest degree. They had simply begun this talk when a considerable space separated them, continued it as they passed, and added polite questions as they drifted steadily apart. Williams's mind seemed to be a balloon. He had been so inflated 
that he had not noticed that Patterson had definitely shied into the dry ditch as they came to the point of ordinary contact. Afterwards, as he went a lonely way, he burst out again in song and pantomimic celebration of his estate. His feet moved in prancing steps. When he came inside of his cabin, the fields were bathed in a blue dusk, and the light in the window was pale. Cavorting and gesticulating, he gazed joyfully for some moments upon this light. Then suddenly another idea seemed to attack his mind, and he stopped with an air of being suddenly dampened. In the end he approached his home as if it were the fortress of an enemy. Some dogs disputed his advance for a loud moment, and then discovering their lord, slunk away embarrassed. His reproaches were addressed to them in muffled tones. Arriving at the door, he pushed it open with the timidity of a new thief. He thrust his head cautiously sideways, and his eyes met the eyes of his wife, who sat by the table, the lamplight defining a half of her face. Shh, he said, uselessly. His glance traveled swiftly to the inner door, which shielded the one bedchamber. The pickaninnies, strewn upon the floor of the living room, were softly snoring. After a hearty meal, they had promptly dispersed themselves about the place and gone to sleep. Shh, said Williams again to his motionless and silent wife. He had allowed only his head to appear. His wife, with one hand upon the edge of the table and the other at her knee, was regarding him with wide eyes and parted lips as if he were a specter. She looked to be one who was living in terror and even the familiar face at the door had thrilled her, because it had come suddenly. Williams broke the tense silence. "'Is he all right?' he whispered, waving his eyes towards the inner door. Following his glance timorously, his wife nodded, and in a low tone answered, "'I reckon he's done gone to sleep.' Williams then slunk noiselessly across his threshold. He lifted a chair, and with infinite care placed it so that it faced the dreaded inner door. His wife moved slightly, so as to also squarely face it. A silence came upon them, in which they seemed to be waiting for a calamity, peeling and deadly. Williams finally coughed behind his hand. His wife started, and looked upon him in alarm. "'Pears like we done gwan keep him quiet tonight,' he breathed. They continually pointed their speech and their looks at the inner door, paying it the homage to a corpse or a phantom. Another long stillness followed this sentence. Their eyes shone white and wide. A wagon rattled down the distant road. From their chairs they looked at the window, and the effect of the light in the cabin was a presentation of an intensely black and solemn night. The old woman adopted the attitude used always in church at funerals. At times she seemed to be upon the point of breaking out in prayer. "'He mighty quiet tonight,' whispered Williams. "'Was he good today?' For answer, his wife raised her eyes to the ceiling in the supplication of Job. Williams moved restlessly. Finally he tiptoed to the door. He knelt slowly and without a sound, and placed his ear near the keyhole. Hearing a noise behind him, he turned quickly. His wife was staring at him aghast. She stood in front of the stove, and her arms were spread out in the natural movement to protect all her sleeping ducklings. But Williams arose without having touched the door. "'I reckon he asleep,' he said, fingering his wool. He debated with himself for some time. During this interval his wife remained a great fat statue of a mother shielding her children. It was plain that his mind was swept suddenly by a wave of temerity. With a sounding step he moved towards the door. His fingers were almost upon the knob when he swiftly ducked and dodged away, clapping his hands to the back of his head. It was as if the portal had threatened him. There was a little tumult near the stove, where Mrs. Williams's desperate retreat had involved her feet with the prostrate children. After the panic, Williams bore traces of a feeling of shame. He returned to the charge. He firmly grasped the doorknob with his left hand, and with his other hand turned the key in the lock. He pushed the door, 
and as it swung portentously open, he sprang nimbly to one side, like the fearful slave liberating the lion. Near the stove a group had formed, the terror-stricken mother, with her arms stretched, and the aroused children, clinging frenziedly to her skirts. The light streamed after the swinging door, and disclosed a room six feet one way and six feet the other way. It was small enough to enable the radiance to lay it plain. Williams peered warily around the corner made by the doorpost. Suddenly he advanced, retired, and advanced again with a howl. His palsied family had expected him to spring backward, and at his howl they heaped themselves wondrously. But William simply stood in the little room, emitting his howls before an open window. He's gone! He's gone! He's gone! His eye and his hand had speedily proved the fact. He had even thrown open a little cupboard. Presently he came flying out. He grabbed his hat and hurled the outer door back upon its hinges. Then he tumbled headlong into the night. He was yelling, Dr. Trescott! Dr. Trescott! He ran wildly through the fields and galloped in the direction of town. He continued to call to Trescott, as if the latter was within easy hearing. It was as if Trescott was poised in the contemplative sky over the running negro, and could heed this reaching voice. Dr. Trescott! In the cabin, Mrs. Williams, supported by relays from the battalion of children, stood quaking watch until the truth of daylight came as reinforcement and made the arrogant, strutting swashbuckler children, and a mother who proclaimed her illimitable courage. 16. Teresa Page was giving a party. It was the outcome of a long series of arguments addressed to her mother, which had been overheard in part by her father. He had at last said five words, Oh, let her have it. The mother had then gladly capitulated. Teresa had written nineteen invitations and distributed them at recess to her schoolmates. Later her mother had composed five large cakes, and still later a vast amount of lemonade. So the nine little girls and the ten little boys sat quite primly in the dining room, while Teresa and her mother plied them with cake and lemonade, and also with ice cream. This primness sat now quite strangely upon them. It was owing to the presence of Mrs. Page. Previously in the parlor alone with their games, they had overturned a chair. The boys had let more or less of their hoodlum spirit shine forth. But when circumstances could be possibly magnified to warrant it, the girls made the boys victim of an insufferable pride, snubbing them mercilessly. So in the dining room they resembled a class at Sunday school. If it were not for the subterranean smiles, gestures, rebuffs, and poutings, which stamped the affair as a children's party. Two little girls of this subdued gathering were planted in a settee with their backs to the broad window. They were beaming lovingly upon each other with an effect of scorning the boys. Hearing a noise behind her at the window, one little girl turned to face it. Instantly she screamed and sprang away, covering her face with her hands. "'What was it? What was it?' cried everyone in a roar. Some slight movement of the eyes of the weeping and shuddering child informed the company that she had been frightened by an appearance at the window. At once they all faced the imperturbable window, and for a moment there was silence. An astute lad made an immediate census of the other lads. The prank of slipping out and looming spectrally at a window was too venerable. But the little boys were all present and astonished. As they recovered their minds, they uttered warlike cries, and through a side door sallied rapidly out against the terror. They vied with each other in daring. None wished particularly to encounter a dragon in the darkness of the garden, but there could be no faltering when the fair ones in the dining room were present. Calling to each other in stern voices, they went dragooning over the lawn, attacking the shadows with ferocity but still with the caution of reasonable beings. They found, however, nothing new to the peace of the night. Of course there was a lad who told a great lie. He described a grim figure, bending low and slinking off along the fence. 
He gave a number of details, rendering his lie more splendid by a repetition of certain forms which he recalled from romances. For instance, he insisted that he had heard the creature emit a hollow laugh. Inside the house, the little girl who had raised the alarm was still shuddering and weeping. With the utmost difficulty was she brought to a state approximating calmness by Mrs. Page. Then she wanted to go home at once. Page entered the house at this time. He had exiled himself until he concluded that this children's party was finished and gone. He was obliged to escort the little girl home, because she screamed again when they opened the door and she saw the night. She was not coherent even to her mother. Was it a man? She didn't know. It was simply a thing, a dreadful... Section 9 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 3 of The Monster. 17. In Watermelon Alley, the Farraguts were spending their evening as usual on the little rickety porch. Sometimes they howled gossip to other people on other rickety porches. The thin wail of a baby arose from a near house. A man had a terrific altercation with his wife, to which the alley paid no attention at all. There appeared suddenly before the Farraguts a monster making a low and sweeping bow. There was an instant's pause, and then occurred something that resembled the effect of an upheaval of the earth's surface. The old woman hurled herself backward with a dreadful cry. Young Sim had been perched gracefully on a railing. At sight of the monster, he simply fell over it to the ground. He made no sound, his eyes stuck out, his nerveless hands tried to grapple the rail to prevent a tumble, and then he vanished. Bella, blubbering, and with her hair suddenly and mysteriously disheveled, was crawling on her hands and knees fearsomely up the steps. Standing before this wreck of a family gathering, the monster continued to bow. It even raised a deprecatory claw. "'Don't make no botheration about me, Miss Fergot. it said politely. "'No, deed. I just drap in to ax if you're well this evening, Miss Fergot. Don't make no botheration. No, deed. I gwine ax you to go to a dance with me, Miss Fergot. I ax you if I can have the magnificent gratitude of your company for that occasion, Miss Fergot. The girl cast a miserable glance behind her. She was still crawling away. On the ground beside the porch, young Swim raised a strange bleat, which expressed both his fright and his lack of wind. Presently the monster, with a fashionable amble, ascended the steps after the girl. She groveled in a corner of the room as the creature took a chair. It seated itself very elegantly on the edge. It held an old cap in both hands. Don't make no botheration, Miss Fergot. Don't make no botherations. No deed. I just drap in to ax if you won't do me the proud of accepting my humble invitation to her dance, Miss Fergot. She shielded her eyes with her arms and tried to crawl past it, but the genial monster blocked the way. I just drop in to ax you about her dance, Miss Fergot. I ax you if I can have the magnificent gratitude of your company on that occasion, Miss Fergot. In a last outbreak of despair, the girl, shuddering and wailing, threw herself face downward on the floor, while the monster sat on the edge of the chair, gabbling courteous invitations, and holding the old hat daintily to his stomach. At the back of the house, Mrs. Farragut, who was of enormous weight, and who for eight years had done little more than sit in an armchair and describe her various ailments had with speed and agility scaled a high-board fence. 18. The black mass in the middle of Trescott's property was hardly allowed to cool before the builders were at work on another house. It had sprung upward at a fabulous rate. It was like a magical composition born of the ashes. 
The doctor's office was the first part to be completed, and he had already moved in his new books and instruments and medicines. Trescott sat before his desk when the chief of police arrived. "'Well, we found him,' said the latter. "'Did you?' cried the doctor. "'Where?' "'Shambling around the streets at daylight this morning. "'I'll be blamed if I can figure on where he passed the night. "'Where is he now?' "'Oh, we jugged him. "'I didn't know what else to do with him. "'That's what I want you to tell me. "'Of course we can't keep him. "'No charge could be made, you know. "'I'll come down and get him.' "'The official grinned retrospectively. "'Must say he had a fine career while he was out.' First thing he did was to break up a children's party at Page's. Then he went to Watermelon Alley. Woo! He stampeded the whole outfit, men, women, and children running pell-mell and yelling. They say one old woman broke her leg or something, shinning over a fence. Then he went right out on the main street, and an Irish girl threw a fit, and there was some sort of a riot. He began to run, and a big crowd chased him, firing rocks but he gave them the slip somehow down there in the foundry and in the railroad yard. We looked for him all night, but couldn't find him. Was he hurt any? Did anybody hit him with a stone? Guess there isn't much of him to hurt any more, is there? Guess he's been hurt up to the limit. No, they never touched him. Of course nobody really wanted to hit him, but you know how a crowd gets. It's like, it's like, yes, I know. For a moment, the chief of police looked reflectively at the floor. Then he spoke hesitatingly. You know, Jake Winter's little girl was the one that he scared at the party. She is pretty sick, they say. Is she? Why, they didn't call me. I always attend the Winter family. No, didn't they? Asked the chief slowly. Well, you know, Winter is. Well, Winter has gone clean crazy over this business. He wanted to have you arrested. Have me arrested? The idiot! What in the name of wonder could he have me arrested for? Of course, he is a fool. I told him to keep his trap shut. But then you know how he'll get all over town yapping about the thing. I thought I'd better tip you. Oh, he is of no consequence. But then, of course, I'm obliged to you, Sam. That's all right. Well, you'll be down tonight and take him out, eh? You'll get a good welcome from the jailer. He don't like his job for a cent. He says you can have your man whenever you want him. He's got no use for him. But what is this business of winners about having me arrested? Oh, it's a lot of chin about your having no right to allow this, this, this man to be at large. But I told him to tend his own business. Only I thought I'd better let you know. And I might as well say right now, doctor that there is a good deal of talk about this thing. If I were you, I'd come to the jail pretty late at night, because there is likely to be a crowd around the door, and I'd bring a, er, mask or some kind of a veil, anyhow. 19. Martha Goodwin was single, and well along into the thin years. She lived with her married sister in Willemville. She performed nearly all the housework, in exchange for the privilege of existence. Everyone tacitly recognized her labor as a form of penance for the early end of her betrothed, who had died of smallpox, which he had not caught from her. But despite the strenuous and unceasing workaday of her life, she was a woman of great mind. She had adamantine opinions about the situation in Armenia, the condition of women in China, the flirtation between Mrs. Minster of Niagara Avenue and young Griscom, the conflict in the Bible class of the Baptist Sunday School, the duty of the United States towards the Cuban insurgents, and many other colossal matters. Her fullest experience of violence was gained on an occasion when she had seen a hound clubbed, but in the plan which she had made for the reform of the world, she advocated drastic measures. For instance, she contended that all the Turks should be pushed into the sea and drowned, and that Mrs. Minster and young Griscom should be hanged side by side on twin gallows. In fact, 
this woman of peace, who had seen only peace, argued constantly for a creed of illimitable ferocity. She was invulnerable on these questions, because eventually she overrode all opponents with a sniff. This sniff was an active force. It was to her antagonists like a bang over the head, and none was known to recover from this expression of exalted contempt. It left them windless and conquered. They never again came forward as candidates for suppression. And Martha walked her kitchen with a stern brow, an invincible being like Napoleon. Nevertheless, her acquaintances, from the pain of their defeats, had been long in secret revolt. It was in no wise a conspiracy, because they did not care to state their open rebellion, but nevertheless it was understood that any woman who could not coincide with one of Martha's contentions was entitled to the support of others in the small circle. It amounted to an arrangement by which all were required to disbelieve any theory for which Martha fought. This, however, did not prevent them from speaking of her mind with profound respect. Two people bore the brunt of her ability. Her sister Kate was visibly afraid of her, while Carrie Dungeon sailed across from her kitchen to sit respectfully at Martha's feet and learn the business of the world. To be sure, afterwards, under another sun, she always laughed at Martha and pretended to deride her ideas, but in the presence of the sovereign she always remained silent or admiring. Kate, the sister, was of no consequence at all. Her principal delusion was that she did all the work in the upstairs rooms of the house, while Martha did it downstairs. The truth was seen only by the husband, who treated Martha with a kindness that was half banter, half deference. Martha herself had no suspicion that she was the only pillar of the domestic edifice. The situation was without definitions. Martha made definitions, but she devoted them entirely to the Armenians and Griscom and the Chinese and other subjects. Her dreams, which in early days had been of love of meadows and the shade of trees, of the face of a man, were now involved otherwise, and they were companioned in the kitchen curiously, Cuba, the hot water kettle, Armenia the washing of the dishes, and the whole thing being jumbled. In regard to social misdemeanors, she who was simply the mausoleum of a dead passion was probably the most savage critic in town. This unknown woman, hidden in a kitchen as in a well, was sure to have a considerable effect of the one kind or the other in the life of the town. Every time it moved a yard, she had personally contributed an inch. She could hammer so stoutly upon the door of a proposition that it would break from its hinges and fall upon her, but, at any rate, it moved. She was an engine, and the fact that she did not know that she was an engine contributed largely to the effect. One reason that she was formidable was that she did not even imagine that she was formidable. She remained a weak, innocent, and pig-headed creature, who alone would defy the universe if she thought the universe merited this proceeding. One day Carrie Dingen came across from her kitchen with speed. She had a great deal of grist. Oh, she cried, Henry Johnson got away from where they was keeping him, and came to town last night, and scared everybody almost to death. Martha was shining a dishpan, polishing madly. No reasonable person could see the cause for this operation, because the pan already glistened like silver. Well, she ejaculated. She imparted to the word a deep meaning. My prophecy has come to pass. It was a habit. The overplus of information was choking Carrie. Before she could go on, she was obliged to struggle for a moment. And oh, little Sadie Winter is awful sick, and they say Jake Winter was around this morning trying to get Dr. Trescott arrested, and poor old Mrs. Farragut sprained her ankle in trying to climb a fence, 
and there's a crowd around the jail all the time. They put Henry in jail because they don't know what else to do with him, I guess. They say he is perfectly terrible. Martha finally released the dishpan and confronted the headlong speaker. Well, she said again, poising a great brown rag. Kate had heard the excited newcomer and drifted down from the novel in her room. She was a shivery little woman. Her shoulder blade seemed to be two panes of ice, for she was constantly shrugging and shrugging. Serves him right if he was to lose all his patience, she said suddenly, in bloodthirsty tones. She snipped her words out, as if her lips were scissors. Well, he's likely to, shouted Carrie Dungeon. Don't a lot of people say that they won't have him any more? If you're sick and nervous, Dr. Trescott will scare the life out of you, wouldn't he? He would me, I keep thinking. Martha, stalking to and fro, sometimes surveyed the two other women with a contemplative frown. 20. After the return from Connecticut, little Jimmy was at first much afraid of the monster who lived in the room over the carriage house. He could not identify it in any way. Gradually, however, his fear dwindled under the influence of a weird fascination. He sidled into closer and closer relations with it. One time the monster was seated on a box behind the stable, basking in the rays of the afternoon sun. A heavy crepe veil was swathed about its head. Little Jimmy and many companions came around the corner of the stable. They were all in what was popularly known as the baby class, and consequently escaped from school a half hour before the other children. They halted abruptly at sight of the figure on the box. Jimmy waved his hand with the air of a proprietor. There he is, he said. Ooh, murmured all the little boys. Ooh. They shrank back and grouped according to courage or experience. As at the sound, the monster slowly turned its head. Jimmy had remained in the van alone. Don't be afraid. I won't let him hurt you, he said, delighted. Huh? they replied contemptuously. We ain't afraid. Jimmy seemed to reap all the joys of the owner and exhibitor of one of the world's marvels while his audience remained at a distance, awed and entranced, fearful and envious. One of them addressed Jimmy gloomily. Bet you dasn't walk right up to him. He was an older boy than Jimmy, and habitually oppressed him to a small degree. This new social elevation of the smaller lad probably seemed revolutionary to him. Huh? said Jimmy, with deep scorn. Das and I, das and I, hey, das and I. The group was immensely excited. It turned its eyes upon the boy that Jimmy addressed. No, you dasn't, he said stolidly, facing a moral defeat. He could see that Jimmy was resolved. No, you dasn't, he repeated doggedly. Ho, oh, cried Jimmy, just you watch. Amid a silence, he turned and marched towards the monster. But possibly the palpable wariness of his companions had an effect upon him that weighed more than his previous experience, for suddenly, when near to the monster, he halted dubiously. But his playmates immediately uttered a derisive shout, and it seemed to force him forward. He went to the monster and laid his hand delicately on its shoulder. Hello, Henry, he said, in a voice that trembled a trifle. The monster was crooning a weird line of negro melody that was scarcely more than a thread of sound, and it paid no heed to the boy. Jimmy strutted back to his companions. They acclaimed him and hooted his opponent. Amid this clamor, the larger boy with difficulty preserved a dignified attitude. I dasn't, dasn't I? said Jimmy to him. Now you're so smart, let's see you do it. This challenge brought forth renewed taunts from the others, 
the larger boy puffed out his cheeks. "'Well, I ain't afraid,' he explained sullenly. He had made a mistake in diplomacy, and now his small enemies were tumbling his prestige all about his ears. They crowed like roosters and bleated like lambs, and made many other noises which were supposed to bury him in ridicule and dishonor. "'Well, I ain't afraid,' he continued to explain through the din. Jimmy, the hero of the mob, was pitiless. "'You ain't afraid, hey?' he sneered. "'If you ain't afraid, go do it, then.' "'Well, I would if I wanted to,' the other retorted. His eyes wore an expression of profound misery, but he preserved steadily other portions of a pot-valiant air. He suddenly faced one of his persecutors. "'If you're so smart, why don't you go do it?' This persecutor sank promptly through the group to the rear. The incident gave the badgered one a breathing spell, and for a moment even turned the derision in another direction. He took advantage of his interval. "'I'll do it if anybody else will,' he announced, swaggering to and fro. Candidates for the adventure did not come forward. To defend themselves from this counter-charge, the other boys again set up their crowing and bleeding. For a while they would hear nothing from him. Each time he opened his lips, their chorus of noises made oratory impossible. But at last he was able to repeat that he would volunteer to dare as much in the affair as any other boy. "'Well, you go first they shouted. But Jimmy intervened to once more lead the populace against the large boy. "'You're mighty brave, ain't you?' he said to him. "'You dared me to do it, and I did, didn't I? Now who's afraid?' The others cheered this view loudly, and they instantly resumed the baiting of the large boy. He shamefacedly scratched his left shin with his right foot. "'Well, I ain't afraid.' He cast an eye at the monster. Well, I ain't afraid. With a glare of hatred at his squalling tormentors, he finally announced a grim intention. Well, I'll do it then, since you're so fresh. Now. The mob subsided as with a formidable countenance. He turned towards the impassive figure on the box. The advance was also a regular progression, from high daring to craven hesitation. At last, when some yards from the monster, the lad came to a full halt, as if he had encountered a stone wall. The observant little boys in the distance promptly hooted. Stung again by these cries, the lad sneaked two yards forward. He was crouched like a young cat, ready for a backward spring. The crowd at the rear, beginning to respect this display, uttered some encouraging cries. Suddenly the lad gathered himself together, made a white and desperate rush forward, touched the monster's shoulder with a far outstretched finger, and sped away, while his laughter rang out wild, shrill, and exultant. The crowd of boys reverenced him at once, and began to throng into his camp, and look at him, and be his admirers. Jimmy was discomfited for a moment, but he and the larger boy, without agreement or word of any kind, seemed to recognize a truce, and they swiftly combined and began to parade before the others. "'Why, it's just as easy as nothing,' puffed the larger boy. "'Ain't it, Jim?' "'Course,' blew Jimmy. "'Why, it's as easy!' They were people of another class. If they had been decorated for courage on twelve battlefields, they could not have made the other boys more ashamed of the situation. Meanwhile they condescended to explain the emotions of the excursion, expressing unqualified contempt for anyone who could hang back. "'Why, it ain't nothing. He won't do nothing to you,' they told the others, in tones of exasperation. One of the very smallest boys in the party showed signs of a wistful desire to distinguish himself and they turned their attention to him, pushing at his shoulders while he swung away from them, and hesitated dreamily. 
He was eventually induced to make furtive expedition, but it was only for a few yards. Then he paused, motionless, gazing with open mouth. The vociferous entreaties of Jimmy and the large boy had no power over him. Mrs. Hannigan had come out on her back porch with a pail of water. From this coin she had a view of the secluded portion of the Trescott grounds that was behind the stable. She perceived the group of boys and the monster on the box. She shaded her eyes with her hand to benefit her vision. She screeched then as if she was being murdered. Eddie, Eddie, you come home this minute. Her son querulously demanded, Ah, oh, what for? You come home this minute, do you hear? The other boys seemed to think this visitation upon one of their number required them to preserve for a time the hangdog air of a collection of culprits, and they remained in guilty silence until the little Hannigan, wrathfully protesting, was pushed through the door of his home. Mrs. Hannigan cast a piercing glance over the group stared with a bitter face at the Trescott house, as if this new and handsome edifice was insulting her, and then followed her son. There was wavering in the party. An inroad by one mother always caused them to carefully sweep the horizon to see if there were more coming. "'This is my yard,' said Jimmy proudly. "'We don't have to go home.' The monster on the box had turned its black crepe countenance towards the sky, and was waving its arms in time to a religious chant. "'Look at him now!' cried a little boy. They turned and were transfixed by the solemnity and mystery of the indefinable gestures. The wail of the melody was mournful and slow. They drew back. It seemed to spellbind them with the power of a funeral. They were so absorbed that they did not hear the doctor's buggy drive up to the stable. Trescott got out, tied his horse, and approached the group. Jimmy saw him first, and at his look of dismay the others wheeled. "'What's all this, Jimmy?' asked Trescott in surprise. The lad advanced to the front of his companions, halted, and said nothing. Trescott's face gloomed slightly as he scanned the scene. "'What are you doing, Jimmy?' "'We was playin,' answered Jimmy huskily. "'Playing at what? Just playin?' Trescott looked gravely at the other boys, and asked them to please go home. They proceeded to the street, much in the manner of frustrated and revealed assassins. The crime of trespass on another boy's place was still a crime, when they had only accepted the other boy's cordial invitation— and they were used to being sent out of all manner of gardens upon the sudden appearance of a father or a mother. Jimmy had wretchedly watched the departure of his companions. It involved the loss of his position as a lad who controlled the privileges of his father's grounds. But then he knew that in the beginning he had no right to ask so many boys to be his guests. Once on the sidewalk, however, they speedily forgot their shame as trespassers, and the large boy launched forth in a description of his success in the late trial of courage. As they went rapidly up the street, the little boy who had made the furtive expedition cried out confidently from the rear, "'Yes, and I almost went up to him, didn't I, Willie?' The large boy crushed him in a few words. "'Huh?' he scoffed. "'You only went a little way.' I went clear up to him. The pace of the other boys was so manly that the tiny thing had to trot, and he remained at the rear, getting entangled in their legs in his attempts to reach the front rank and become of some importance, dodging this way and that way, and always piping out his little claim to glory. 21. By the way, Grace, said Trescott, looking into the dining-room from his office door. I wish you would send Jimmy to me before school time. When Jimmy came, he advanced so quietly that Trescott did not at first note him. Oh, he said, wheeling from a cabinet, here you are, young man. Yes, sir. Trescott dropped into his chair and tapped the desk with a thoughtful finger. 
Jimmy, what were you doing in the back garden yesterday, you and the other boys, to Henry? We weren't doing anything, Pa. Trescott looked sternly into the raised eyes of his son. Are you sure you were not annoying him in any way? Now what were you doing exactly? Why, we... why, we... now... Willie Dazzle said I dasn't go right up to him, and I did, and then he did, and then the other boys were afraid, and then you comed. Trescott groaned deeply. His countenance was so clouded in sorrow that the lad, bewildered by the mystery of it, burst suddenly forth in dismal lamentations. There, there, don't cry, Jim, said Trescott, going round the desk. Only— he sat in a great leather reading chair and took the boy on his knee. Only I want to explain to you. After Jimmy had gone to school, and as Trescott was about to start on his round of morning calls, a message arrived from Dr. Moser. It set forth that the latter's sister was dying in the old homestead, twenty miles away up the valley, and asked Trescott to care for his patients for the day at least. There was also in the envelope a little history of each case, and of what had already been done. Trescott replied to the messenger that he would gladly assent to the arrangement. He noted that the first name on Moser's list was Winter, but this did not seem to strike him as an important fact. When its turn came, he rang the Winter bell. "'Good morning, Mrs. Winter,' he said, cheerfully, as the door was opened." Dr. Moser has been obliged to leave town today, and he has asked me to come in his stead. How is the little girl this morning? Mrs. Winter had regarded him in stony surprise. At last, she said, Come in, I'll see my husband. She bolted into the house. Trescott entered the hall, and turned to the left into the sitting-room. Presently Winter shuffled through the door. His eyes flashed towards Trescott. He did not betray any desire to advance far into the room. "'What do you want?' he said. "'What do I want? What do I want?' repeated Trescott, lifting his head suddenly. He had heard an utterly new challenge in the night of the jungle. "'Yes, that's what I want to know,' snapped Winter. "'What do you want?' Trescott was silent for a moment. He consulted Moser's memoranda. I see your little girl's case is a trifle serious, he remarked. I would advise you to call a physician soon. I will leave you a copy of Dr. Moser's record to give to anyone you may call. He paused to transcribe the record on a sheet of his notebook. Tearing out the leaf, he extended it to Winter as he moved towards the door. The latter shrunk against the wall. His head was hanging as he reached for the paper. This caused him to grasp air, and so Trescott simply let the paper flutter to the feet of the other man. "'Good morning,' said Trescott from the hall. This placid retreat seemed to suddenly arouse Winter to ferocity. It was as if he had then recalled all the truths which he had formulated to hurl at Trescott. So he followed him into the hall, and down the hall to the door, and through the door to the porch— barking in fiery rage from a respectful distance. As Trescott imperturbably turned the mare's head down the road, Winter stood on the porch, still yelping. He was like a little dog. 22. "'Have you heard the news?' cried Carrie Dungeon, as she sped towards Martha's kitchen. "'Have you heard the news?' Her eyes were shining with delight. "'No,' answered Martha's sister Kate, bending forward eagerly. "'What is it? What is it?' Carrie appeared triumphantly in the open door. "'Oh, there's been an awful scene between Dr. Trescott and Jake Winter. I never thought that Jake Winter had any pluck at all, but this morning he told the doctor just what he thought of him.' "'Well, what did he think of him?' asked Martha. "'Oh, he called him everything.' Mrs. Howarth heard it through her front blinds. It was terrible, she says. It's all over town now. Everybody knows it. Didn't the doctor answer back? No. Mrs. Howarth, she says he never said a word. 
he just walked down to his buggy and got in and drove off as cool. But Jake gave him jinx by all accounts. What did he say? cried Kate, shrill and excited. She was evidently at some kind of a feast. Oh, he told him that Sadie had never been well since that night Henry Johnson frightened her at Teresa Page's party, and he held him responsible. And how dared he cross his threshold, and, and, and... And what? said Martha. Did he swear at him? said Kate, in fearsome glee. No, not much. He did swear at him a little. But not more than a man does anyhow when he is real mad, Mrs. Howarth says. Oh, breathed Kate, and did he call him any names? Martha, at her work, had been for a time in deep thought. She now interrupted the others. It don't seem as if Sadie Winter had been sick since that time Henry Johnson got loose. She's been to school almost the whole time since then, hasn't she? They combined upon her in immediate indignation. School, school, I should say not. Don't think for a moment. School! Martha wheeled from the sink. She held an iron spoon, and it seemed as if she was going to attack them. Sadie Winter has passed here many a morning since then carrying her school bag. Where was she going? To a wedding? The others, long accustomed to mental tyranny, speedily surrendered. Did she? stammered Kate. I never saw her. Carrie Dungeon made a weak gesture. If I had been Dr. Trescott, exclaimed Martha, loudly. I'd have knocked that miserable Jake Winter's head off. Kate and Carrie, exchanging glances, made an alliance in the air. I don't see why you say that, Martha, replied Carrie, with considerable boldness, gaining support and sympathy from Kate's smile. I don't see how anybody can be blamed for getting angry when their little girl gets almost scared to death and gets sick from it, and all that. Besides, everybody says. Oh, I don't care what everybody says, said Martha. Well, you can't go against the whole town, answered Carrie, in sudden sharp defiance. No, Martha, you can't go against the whole town, piped Kate, following the leader rapidly. The whole town, cried Martha. I'd like to know what you call the whole town. Do you call these silly people who are scared of Henry Johnson the whole town? Why, Martha, cried Carrie, in a reasoning tone, you talk as if you wouldn't be scared of him. No more would I, retorted Martha. Oh, Martha, how you talk, said Kate. Why, the idea! Everybody's afraid of him. Carrie was grinning. You've never seen him, have you? she asked seductively. No, admitted Martha. Well, then, how do you know that you wouldn't be scared? Martha confronted her. Have you seen him? No. Well, then, how do you know you would be scared? The Allied forces broke out in chorus. But, Martha, everybody says so. Everybody says so. Everybody says what? Everybody that's seen him say they were frightened almost to death. Tisn't only women, but it's men, too. It's awful. Martha wagged her head solemnly. I'll try not to be afraid of him. But supposing you could not help it, said Kate. Yes, and look here, cried Carrie. I'll tell you another thing. The Hannigans are going to move out of the house next door. On account of him demanded Martha. Carrie nodded. Mrs. Hannigan says so herself. Well, of all things, ejaculated Martha. Going to move, eh? You don't say so. Where are they going to move to? Down on Orchard Avenue. Well, of all things, nice house. I don't know about that. I haven't heard. But there's lots of nice houses on Orchard. Yes, but they're all taken, said Kate. There isn't a vacant house on Orchard Avenue. Oh, yes, there is, said Martha. The old Hampstead house is vacant. Oh, of course, said Kate. But then I don't believe Mrs. Hannigan would like it there. I wonder where they can be going to move to. I'm sure I don't know, sighed Martha. 
It must be to some place we don't know about. Well, said Carrie Dungeon, after a general, reflective silence, it's easy enough to find out anyhow. Who knows, around here? asked Kate. Why, Mrs. Smith, and there she is in her garden, said Carrie, jumping to her feet. As she dashed out of the door, Kate and Martha crowded at the window. Carrie's voice rang out from near the steps. Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, do you know where the Hannigans are going to move to? 23. The autumn smote the leaves, and the trees of Willemville were panoplied in crimson and yellow. The winds grew stronger, and in the melancholy purple of the nights, the home shine of a window became a finer thing. The little boys, watching the sere and sorrowful leaves drifting down from the maples, dreamed of the near time when they could heap bushels in the street and burn them during the abrupt evenings. Three men walked down the Niagara Avenue. As they approached Judge Hagenthorpe's house, he came down his walk to meet them, in the manner of one who has been waiting. "'Are you ready, Judge?' one said. "'All ready,' he answered. The four then walked to Trescott's house. He received them in his office, where he had been reading. He seemed surprised at this visit of four very active and influential citizens, but he had nothing to say of it. After they were all seated, Trescott looked expectantly from one face to another. There was a little silence. It was broken by John Twelve, the wholesale grocer, who was worth four hundred thousand dollars and reported to be worth over a million. "'Well, doctor,' he said, with a short laugh, "'I suppose we might as well admit at once that we've come to interfere in something which is none of our business.' "'Why, what is it?' asked Trescott, again looking from one face to another. He seemed to appeal particularly to Judge Hagenthorpe, but the old man had his chin lowered musingly to his cane and would not look at him. "'It's about what nobody talks of, much,' said Twelve. "'It's about Henry Johnson.' Trescott squared himself in his chair. "'Yes,' he said. Having delivered himself of the title, Twelve seemed to become more easy. "'Yes,' he answered blandly. "'We wanted to talk to you about it.' "'Yes,' said Trescott. Twelve abruptly advanced the main attack. Now see here, Trescott, we like you. And we have come to talk right out about this business. It may be none of our affairs and all that, and as for me, I don't mind if you tell me so. But I am not going to keep quiet and see you ruin yourself, and that's how we all feel. I am not ruining myself, answered Trescott. No, maybe you are not exactly ruining yourself, said Twelve slowly but you are doing yourself a great deal of harm. You have changed from being the leading doctor in town to about the last one. It is mainly because there are always a large number of people who are very thoughtless fools, of course, but then that doesn't change the condition. A man who had not heretofore spoken said, solemnly, It's the women. Well, what I want to say is this, resumed Twelve. Even if there are a lot of fools in the world, we can't see any reason why you should ruin yourself by opposing them. You can't teach them anything, you know. I am not trying to teach them anything, Trescott smiled wearily. I, it is a matter of, well. And there are a good many of us that admire you for it immensely, interrupted Twelve. But that isn't going to change the minds of all those ninnies. It's the women, stated the advocate of this view again. Well, what I want to say is this, said Twelve. We want you to get out of this trouble and strike your old gate again. You are simply killing your practice through your infernal pig-headedness. Now this thing is out of the ordinary, but there must be ways to, to beat the game somehow, you see. So we've talked it over, about a dozen of us, and, as I say, if you want to tell us to mind our own business, why, go ahead. But we've talked it over and we've come to the conclusion that the only way to do is to get Johnson a place somewhere off up the valley 
and... Truscott wearily gestured. You don't know, my friend. Everybody is so afraid of him, they can't even give him good care. Nobody can attend to him as I do myself. But I have a little no-good farm up beyond Clarence Mountain that I was going to give to Henry, cried Twelve, aggrieved. And if you, and if you, if you threw your house burning down or anything, why, why all the boys were prepared to take him right off your hands, and, and... Trescott arose and went to the window. He turned his back upon them. They sat waiting in silence. When he returned, he kept his face in the shadow. No, John Twelve, he said, it can't be done. There was another stillness. Suddenly a man stirred on his chair. Well, then, a public institution, he began. No, said Trescott. Public institutions are all very good, but he is not going to one. In the background of the group, old Judge Hagenthorpe was thoughtfully smoothing the polished ivory head of his cane. 24. Trescott loudly stamped the snow from his feet and shook the flakes from his shoulders. When he entered the house, he went at once to the dining room and then to the sitting room. Jimmy was there, reading painfully in a large book concerning giraffes and tigers and crocodiles. "'Where is your mother, Jimmy?' asked Trescott. "'I don't know, Pa,' answered the boy. "'I think she is upstairs.' Trescott went to the foot of the stairs and called, but there came no answer. Seeing that the door of the little drawing-room was open, he entered. The room was bathed in the half-light that came from the four dull panes of mica in the front of the great stove. As his eyes grew used to the shadows, he saw his wife curled in an armchair. He went to her. "'Why, Grace,' he said, "'didn't you hear me calling you?' She made no answer, and as he bent over the chair, he heard her trying to smother a sob in the cushion. "'Grace,' he cried, "'you're crying!' She raised her face. I've got a headache, a dreadful headache, Ned. A headache, he repeated, in surprise and incredulity. He pulled a chair close to hers. Later, as he cast his eye over the zone of light shed by the dull red panes, he saw that a low table had been drawn close to the stove, and that it was burdened with many small cups and plates of uncut tea-cake. He remembered that the day was Wednesday, and that his wife received on Wednesdays. "'Who was here today, Gracie?' he asked. From his shoulder there came a mumble. "'Mrs. Twelve. "'Was she, um,' he said. "'Why, didn't Anna Hagenthorpe come over?' The mumble from his shoulder continued. "'She wasn't well enough.' Glancing down at the cups— Trescott mechanically counted them. There were fifteen of them. Why, there, he said. Don't cry, Gracie, don't cry. The wind was whining round the house, and the snow beat a slant upon the windows. Sometimes the coal in the stove settled with a crumbling sound, and the four panes of mica flashed a sudden new crimson. As he sat holding her head on his shoulder, Trescott found himself occasionally trying to count the cups. There were fifteen of them. Section 10 of Selected Short Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. DEATH AND THE CHILD One. The peasants who were streaming down the mountain trail had in their sharp terror evidently lost their ability to count. The cattle and the huge round bundles seemed to suffice to the minds of the crowd if there were now two in each case where there had been three. This brown stream poured on with a constant wastage of goods and beasts. A goat fell behind to scout the dried grass, and its owner, howling, flogging his donkeys, passed far ahead. A colt, 
suddenly frightened, made a stumbling charge up the hillside. The expenditure was always profligate, and always unnamed, unnoted. It was as if fear was a river, and this horde had simply been caught in the torrent, man tumbling over beast, beast over man, as helpless in it as the logs that fall, and shoulder grindingly through the gorges of a lumber country. It was a freshet that might sear the face of the tall, quiet mountain. It might draw a livid line across the land, this downpour of fear, with a thousand homes adrift in the current, men, women, babes, animals. From it there arose a constant babble of tongues, shrill, broken, and sometimes choking as men from drowning. Many made gestures, painting their agonies on the air, with fingers that twirled swiftly. The blue bay, with its pointed ships, and the white town lay below them, distant, flat, serene. There was upon this vista a peace that a bird knows, when high in the air it surveys the world. A great calm thing, rolling noiselessly toward the end of the mystery. Here on the height, one felt existence of the universe scornfully defining the pain in ten thousand minds. The sky was an arch of stolid sapphire. Even to the mountains, raising their mighty shapes from the valley, this headlong rush of the fugitives was too minute. The sea, the sky, and the hills, combined in their grandeur to term this misery inconsequent. Then, too, it sometimes happened that a face seen as it passed on the flood reflected curiously the spirit of them all, and still more. One saw then a woman of the opinion of the vaults above the clouds. When a child cried, it cried always because of some adjacent misfortune, some discomfort of a pack-saddle or rudeness of an encircling arm. In the dismal melody of this flight there were often sounding chords of apathy. Into these preoccupied countenances one felt that needles could be thrust without purchasing a scream. The trail wound here and there, as the sheep had willed in the making of it. Although this throng seemed to prove that the whole of humanity was fleeing in one direction, with every tie severed that binds us to the soil, a young man was walking rapidly up the mountain, hastening to a side of the path from time to time to avoid some particularly wide rush of people and cattle. He looked at everything in agitation and pity. Frequently he called admonitions to maniacal fugitives, and at other moments he exchanged strange stares with the imperturbable ones. They seemed to him to wear merely the expressions of so many boulders rolling down the hill. He exhibited wonder and awe with his pitying glances. Turning once toward the rear, he saw a man in the uniform of a lieutenant of infantry, marching the same way. He waited then, subconsciously elate, at a prospect of being able to make into words the emotion, which heretofore had only been expressed in the flash of eyes and sensitive movements of his flexible mouth. He spoke to the officer in rapid French, waving his arms wildly, and often pointing with a dramatic finger. Ah, this is too cruel, too cruel, too cruel, is it not? I did not think it would be as bad as this, I did not think. God's mercy, I did not think at all, and yet I am a Greek, or at least my father was a Greek. I did not come here to fight. I am really a correspondent, you see. I was to write for an Italian paper. I have been educated in Italy. I have spent nearly all my life in Italy, at the schools and universities. I know nothing of war. I was a student, a student. I came here merely because my father was a Greek, and for his sake I thought of Greece. I loved Greece, but I did not dream. He paused, breathing heavily. His eyes glistened from the soft overflow which comes on occasion to the glance of a young woman. Eager, passionate, profoundly moved, his first words, while facing the procession of fugitives, had been an active definition of his own dimension. 
his personal relation to men, geography, life. Throughout he had preserved the fiery dignity of a tragedian. The officer's manner at once deferred to this outburst. Yes, he said, polite but mournful. These poor people. I do not know what is to become of these poor people. The young man declaimed again. I had no dream. I had no dream that it would be just like this. This is too cruel, too cruel. Now I want to be a soldier. Now I want to fight. Now I want to do battle for the land of my father. He made a sweeping gesture into the northwest. The officer was also a young man, but he was very bronzed and steady. Above his high military collar of crimson cloth, with one silver star upon it, appeared a profile stern, quiet, and confident, respecting fate, fearing only opinion. His clothes were covered with dust. The only bright spot was the flame of the crimson collar. At the violent cries of his companion, he smiled as if to himself, meanwhile keeping his eyes fixed in a glance ahead. From a land toward which their faces were bent came a continuous boom of artillery fire. It was sounding in regular measures like the beating of a colossal clock, a clock that was counting the seconds in the lives of the stars, and men had time to die between the ticks. Solemn, oracular, inexorable, the great seconds tolled over the hills as if God fronted this dial rimmed by the horizon. The soldier and the correspondent found themselves silent. The latter, in particular, was sunk in a great mournfulness, as if he had resolved willy-nilly to swing to the bottom of the abyss, where dwell secrets of his kind, and had learned beforehand that all to be met there was cruelty and hopelessness. A strap of his bright new leather leggings came unfastened, and he bowed over it slowly impressively, as one bending over the grave of a child. Then suddenly the reverberations mingled until one could not separate an explosion from another, and into the hubbub came the drawling sound of a leisurely musketry fire. Instantly, for some reason of cadence, the noise was irritating, silly, infantile. This uproar was childish. It forced the nerves to object to protest against this racket, which was as idle as the din of a lad with a drum. The lieutenant lifted his finger and pointed. He spoke in vexed tones, as if he held the other man personally responsible for the noise. "'Well, there,' he said, "'if you wish for war, you now have an opportunity magnificent.' The correspondent raised himself upon his toes. He tapped his chest with gloomy pride. Yes, there is a war. There is a war I wish to enter. I fling myself in. I am a Greek, a Greek, you understand. I wish to fight for my country. You know the way. Lead me. I offer myself. Struck by a sudden thought, he brought a case from his pocket, and extracting a card, handed it to the officer with a bow. My name is Peza, he said simply. A strange smile passed over the soldier's face. There was pity and pride, the vanity of experience, and contempt in it. Very well, he said, returning the bow. If my company is in the middle of the fight, I shall be glad for the honor of your companionship. If my company is not in the middle of the fight, I will make other arrangements for you. Peza bowed once more, very stiffly, and correctly spoke his thanks. On the edge of what he took to be a great venture toward death, he discovered that he was annoyed at something in the lieutenant's tone. Things immediately assumed new and extraordinary proportions. The battle, the great carnival of woe, was sunk at once to an equation with a vexation by a stranger. He wanted to ask the lieutenant what was his meaning. He bowed again majestically. The lieutenant bowed. They flung a shadow of manners, of capering tinsel ceremony, across a land that groaned, and it satisfied something within themselves completely. 
In the meantime, the river of fleeing villagers had changed to simply a last dropping of belated creatures, who fled past stammering and flinging their hands high. The two men had come to the top of the great hill. Before them was a green plain, as level as an inland sea. It swept northward, and merged finally into a length of silvery mist. Upon the near part of this plain, and upon two grey treeless mountains at the side of it, were little black lines, from which floated slanting sheets of smoke. It was not a battle to the nerves. One could survey it with equanimity, as if it were a tea-table. But upon Peza's mind it struck a loud clinging blow. It was war. Edified, aghast, triumphant, he paused suddenly, his lips apart. He remembered the pageants of carnage that had marched through the dreams of his childhood. Love he knew that he had confronted, alone, isolated, wondering, and individual, an atom taking the hand of a titanic principle. But, like the faintest breeze on his forehead, he felt here the vibration from the hearts of forty thousand men. The lieutenant's nostrils were moving. I must go at once, he said. I must go at once. I will go with you wherever you go, shouted Peza loudly. A primitive track wound down the side of the mountain, and in their rush they bounded from here to there, choosing risks which in the ordinary caution of man would surely have seemed of remarkable danger. The ardor of the correspondent surpassed the full energy of the soldier. Several times he turned and shouted, Come on! Come on! At the foot of the path they came to a wide road, which extended toward the battle in a yellow and straight line. Some men were trudging wearily to the rear. They were without rifles. Their clumsy uniforms were dirty and all awry. They turned eyes dully aglow with fever upon the pair striding toward the battle. Others were bandaged with the triangular kerchief upon which one could still see through bloodstains the little explanatory pictures illustrating the ways to bind various wounds. Figure one, figure two, figure seven. Mingled with the pacing soldiers were peasants, indifferent, capable of smiling, gibbering about the battle, which was to them an ulterior drama. A man was leading a string of three donkeys to the rear, and at intervals he was accosted by wounded or fevered soldiers, from whom he defended his animals with ape-like cries and mad gesticulation. After much chattering, they usually subsided gloomily, and allowed him to go with his sleek little beasts unburdened. Finally he encountered a soldier, who walked slowly with the assistance of a staff. His head was bound with a wide bandage, grimy from blood and mud. He made application to the peasant, and immediately they were involved in a hideous Levantine discussion. The peasant whined and clamored, sometimes spitting like a kitten. The wounded soldier jawed on thunderously, his great hands stretched in claw-like graspings over the peasant's head. Once he raised his staff and made threat with it. Then suddenly the row was at an end. The other sick men saw their comrade mount the leading donkey, and at once begin to drum with his heels. None attempted to gain the backs of the remaining animals. They gazed after them dully. Finally they saw the caravan, outlined for a moment against the sky. The soldier was still waving his arms passionately, having it out with the peasant. Peza was alive with despair for these men, who looked at him with such doleful, quiet eyes. "'Oh, my God!' he cried to the lieutenant. "'These poor souls! These poor souls!' The officer faced about angrily. "'If you are coming with me, there is no time for this!' Peza obeyed instantly, and with a sudden meekness. In the moment some portion of egotism left him, and he modestly wondered if the universe took cognizance of him to an important degree. This theater for slaughter, built by the inscrutable needs of the earth, 
was an enormous affair, and he reflected that the accidental destruction of an individual, Pesa by name, would perhaps be nothing at all. With the lieutenant, he was soon walking along behind a series of little crescent-shaped trenches, in which were soldiers, tranquilly interested, gossiping with the hum of a tea-party. Although these men were not at this time under fire, he concluded that they were fabulously brave, else they would not be so comfortable, so at home in their sticky brown trenches. They were certain to be heavily attacked before the day was old. The universities had not taught him to understand this attitude. At the passing of the young man, in very nice tweed, with his new leggings, his new white helmet, his new field-glass case, his new revolver holster, the soiled soldiers turned with the same curiosity which a being in strange garb meets at the corners of streets. He might as well have been promenading a populous avenue. The soldiers volubly discussed his identity. To Pesa there was something awful in the absolute familiarity of each tone, expression, gesture. These men, menaced with battle, displayed the curiosity of the café. Then, on the verge of his great encounter toward death, he found himself extremely embarrassed, composing his face with difficulty, wondering what to do with his hands, like a gawk at a levee. He felt ridiculous, and also he felt awed, aghast, at these men who could turn their faces from the ominous front and debate his clothes, his business. There was an element which was new-born into his theory of war. He was not averse to the brisk pace at which the lieutenant moved along the line. The roar of fighting was always in Pesa's ears. It came from some short hills ahead and to the left. The road curved suddenly and entered a wood. The trees stretched their luxuriant and graceful branches over grassy slopes. A breeze made all this verdure gently rustle and speak in long silken sighs. Absorbed in listening to the hurricane racket from the front, he still remembered that these trees were growing, the grass blades were extending according to their process. He inhaled a deep breath of moisture and fragrance from the grove, a wet odor which expressed all the opulent fecundity of unmoved nature, marching on with all her million plans for multiple life, multiple death. Further on, they came to a place where the Turkish shells were landing. There was a long hurtling sound in the air, and then one had sight of a shell. To Pesa, it was of the conical missiles which friendly officers had displayed to him on board warships. Curiously enough, too, this first shell smacked of the foundry, of men with smudged faces, of the blare of furnace fires. It brought machinery immediately into his mind. He thought that if he was killed there, at that time, it would be as romantic to the old standards as death by a bit of falling iron in a factory. 2. A child was playing on a mountain and disregarding a battle that was waging on the plain. Behind him was the little cobbled hut of his fled parents. It was now occupied by a pearl-colored cow that stared out from the darkness, thoughtful and tender-eyed. The child ran to and fro, fumbling with sticks and making great machinations with pebbles. By a striking exercise of artistic license, the sticks were ponies, cows, and dogs, and the pebbles were sheep. He was managing large agricultural and herding affairs. He was too intent on them to pay much heed to the fight four miles away, which at that distance resembled in sound the beating of surf upon rocks. However, there were occasions when some louder outbreak of that thunder stirred him from his serious occupation, and he turned then a questioning eye upon the battle, a small stick poised in his hand, interrupted in the act of sending his dog after his sheep. His tranquillity in regard to the death on the plain, was as invincible as that of the mountain on which he stood. It was evident that fear had swept the parents away from their home, 
in a manner that could make them forget this child, the firstborn. Nevertheless, the hut was clean bare. The cow had committed no impropriety in billeting herself at the domicile of her masters. This smoke-colored and odorous interior contained nothing as large as a hummingbird. Terror had operated on these runaway people in its sinister fashion, elevating details to enormous heights, causing the man to remember a button while he forgot a coat, overpowering everyone with recollections of a broken coffee cup, deluging them with fears for the safety of an old pipe, and causing them to forget their firstborn. Meanwhile the child played soberly with his trinkets. He was solitary, engrossed in his own pursuits. It was seldom that he lifted his head to inquire of the world why it made so much noise. The stick in his hand was much larger to him than was an army corps of the distance. It was too childish for the mind of the child. He was dealing with sticks. The battle lines writhed at times, in the agony of a sea creature on the sands. These tentacles flung and waved in a supreme excitement of pain, and the struggles of the great outlined body brought it nearer and nearer to the child. Once he looked at the plain and saw some men running wildly across a field. He had seen people chasing obdurate beasts in such fashion, and it struck him immediately that it was a manly thing which he would incorporate in his game. Consequently, he raced furiously at his stone sheep, flourishing a cudgel, crying the shepherd calls. He paused frequently to get a cue of manner from the soldiers fighting on the plain. He reproduced, to a degree, any movements which he accounted rational to his theory of sheep herding, the business of men, the traditional and exalted living of his father. 3. It was as if Pesa was a corpse walking on the bottom of the sea, and finding there fields of grain, groves, weeds, the faces of men, voices. War, a strange employment of the race, presented to him a scene crowded with familiar objects, which wore the livery of their commonness, placidly, undauntedly. He was smitten with keen astonishment. A spread of green grass, lit with the flames of poppies, was too old for the company of this new ogre. If he had been devoting the full lens of his mind to this phase, he would have known he was amazed that the trees, the flowers, the grass, all tender and peaceful nature, had not taken to heels at once upon the outbreak of battle. He venerated the immovable poppies. The road seemed to lead into the apex of an angle formed by the two defensive lines of the Greeks. There was a straggle of wounded men and of gunless and jaded men. These latter did not seem to be frightened. They remained very cool, walking with unhurried steps and busy in gossip. Pesa tried to define them. Perhaps during the fight they had reached the limit of their mental storage, their capacity for excitement for tragedy, and had then simply come away. Pesa remembered his visit to a certain place of pictures, where he had found himself amid heavenly skies and diabolic midnights, the sunshine beating red upon desert sands, nude bodies flung to the shore in green moon-glow, ghastly and starving men clawing at a wall of darkness, a girl at her bath with screened rays falling upon her pearly shoulders, a dance, a funeral, a review, an execution, all the strength of Argus-eyed art. And he had whirled and whirled amid this universe, with cries of woe and joy, sin and beauty, piercing his ears until he had been obliged to simply come away. He remembered that as he had emerged he had lit a cigarette with unction and advanced promptly to a café. A great hollow quiet seemed to be upon the earth. This was a different case, but in his thoughts he conceded the same causes to many of these gunless wanderers. They too may have dreamed at lightning speed, until the capacity for it was overwhelmed. 
as he watched them, he again saw himself walking toward the café, puffing upon his cigarette. As if to reinforce his theory, a soldier stopped him with an eager but polite inquiry for a match. He watched the man light his little roll of tobacco and paper, and begin to smoke ravenously. Pesa was no longer torn with sorrow at the sight of wounded men. Evidently he found that pity had a numerical limit, and when this was past, the emotion became another thing. Now, as he viewed them, he merely felt himself very lucky, and beseeched the continuance of his superior fortune. At the passing of these slouched and stained figures, he now heard a reiteration of warning. A part of himself was appealing, through the medium of these grim shapes. It was plucking at his sleeve and pointing, telling him to beware, and so it had come to pass that he cared for the implacable misery of these soldiers only as he would have cared for the harms of broken dolls. His whole vision was focused upon his own chance. The lieutenant suddenly halted. Look, he said, I find that my duty is in another direction. I must go another way. But if you wish to fight, you have only to go forward, and any officer of the fighting line will give you opportunity. He raised his cap ceremoniously. Pesa raised his new white helmet. The stranger to battles uttered thanks to his chaperone, the one who had presented him. They bowed punctiliously, staring at each other with civil eyes. The lieutenant moved quietly away through a field. In an instant it flashed upon Pesa's mind that this desertion was perfidious. He had been subjected to a criminal discourtesy. The officer had fetched him into the middle of the thing, and then left him to wander helplessly toward death. At one time he was on the point of shouting at the officer. In the veil there was an effect as if one was then beneath the battle. It was going on above somewhere, alone, unguided. Peza felt like a man groping in a cellar. He reflected, too, that one should always see the beginning of a fight. It was too difficult to thus approach it when the affair was in full swing. The trees hid all movements of troops from him, and he thought he might be walking to the very spot which chance had provided for the reception of a fool. He asked eager questions of passing soldiers. Some paid no heed to him, others shook their heads mournfully. They knew nothing save that war was hard work. If they talked at all, it was in testimony of having fought well, savagely. They did not know if the army was going to advance, hold its ground, or retreat. They were weary. A long-pointed shell flashed through the air and struck near the base of a tree, with a fierce upheaval, compounded of earth and flames. Looking back, Pesa could see the shattered tree quivering from head to foot. Its whole being underwent a convulsive tremor, which was an exhibition of pain and, furthermore, deep amazement. As he advanced through the veil, the shells continued to hiss and hurtle in long low flights, and the bullets purred in the air. The missiles were flying into the breast of an astounded nature. The landscape, bewildered, agonized, was suffering a rain of infamous shots and Pesa imagined a million eyes gazing at him with the gaze of startled antelopes. There was a resolute crashing of musketry from the tall hill on the left, and from directly in front there was a mingled din of artillery and musketry firing. Pesa felt that his pride was playing a great trick in forcing him forward in this manner in conditions of strangeness, isolation, and ignorance. But he recalled the manner of the lieutenant, the smile on the hilltop among the flying peasants. Pesa blushed and pulled the peak of his helmet down on his forehead. He strode onward firmly. Nevertheless, he hated the lieutenant, and he resolved that on some future occasion he would take such trouble to arrange a stinging social revenge upon that grinning jackanapes. It did not occur to him until later that he was now going to battle, 
mainly because at a previous time a certain man had smiled. 4. The road curved round the base of a little hill, and on this hill a battery of mountain guns was leisurely shelling something unseen. In the lee of the height the mules, contented under their heavy saddles, were quietly browsing the long grass. Pesa ascended the hill by a slanting path. He felt his heart beat swiftly. Once at the top of the hill, he would be obliged to look this phenomenon in the face. He hurried, with a mysterious idea, of preventing by this strategy the battle from making his appearance a signal for some tremendous renewal. This vague thought seemed logical at the time. Certainly this living thing had knowledge of his coming. He endowed it with the intelligence of a barbaric deity. And so he hurried. He wished to surprise war, this terrible emperor, when it was growling on its throne. The ferocious and horrible sovereign was not to be allowed to make the arrival a pretext for some fit of smoky rage and blood. In this half-lull, Pesa had distinctly the sense of stealing upon the battle unawares. The soldiers watching the mules did not seem to be impressed by anything august. Two of them sat side by side and talked comfortably. Another lay flat upon his back, staring dreamily at the sky. Another cursed a mule for certain refractions. Despite their uniforms, their bandoliers and rifles, they were dwelling in the peace of hostlers. However, the shells were whooping from time to time over the brow of the hill, and swirling in almost straight lines toward the veil of trees, flowers, and grass. Pesa, hearing and seeing the shells, and seeing the pensive guardians of the mules, felt reassured. They were accepting the condition of war as easily as an old sailor accepts the chair behind the counter of a tobacco shop, or it was merely that the farm boy had gone to sea, and he had adjusted himself to the circumstances immediately, and with only the usual first misadventures in conduct. Pesa was proud and ashamed that he was not of them, these stupid peasants who, throughout the world, hold potentates on their thrones, make statesmen illustrious, provide generals with lasting victories, all with ignorance, indifference, or half-witted hatred, moving the world with the strength of their arms, and getting their heads knocked together in the name of God, the king, or the stock exchange, immortal, dreaming, hopeless asses, who surrender their reason to the care of a shining puppet, and persuade some toy to carry their lives in his purse." Pesa mentally abased himself before them, and wished to stir them with furious kicks. As his eyes ranged above the rim of the plateau, he saw a group of artillery officers talking busily. They turned at once and regarded his ascent. A moment later, a row of infantry soldiers in a trench beyond the little guns all faced him. Pesa bowed to the officers. He understood at the time that he had made a good and cool bow, and he wondered at it, for his breath was coming in gasps. He was stifling from sheer excitement. He felt like a tipsy man, trying to conceal his muscular uncertainty from the people in the street. But the officers did not display any knowledge. They bowed. Behind them, Peza saw the plain, glittering green, with three lines of black marked upon it heavily. The front of the first of these lines was frothy with smoke. To the left of this hill was a craggy mountain, from which came a continual dull rattle of musketry. Its summit was ringed with the white smoke. The black lines on the plain slowly moved. The shells that came from there passed overhead with the sound of great birds frantically flapping their wings. Peza thought of the first sight of the sea during a storm. He seemed to feel against his face the wind that races over the tops of cold and tumultuous billows. He heard a soft voice afar off. Sir, sir, what would you? 
he turned and saw the dapper captain of the battery standing beside him. Only a moment had elapsed. "'Pardon me, sir,' said Pesa, bowing again. The officer was evidently reserving his bows. He scanned the newcomer attentively. "'Are you a correspondent?' he asked. Pesa produced a card. "'Yes, I came as a correspondent,' he replied. "'But now, sir, I have other thoughts. I wish to help. You see, I wish to help.' "'What do you mean?' said the captain. "'Are you a Greek? Do you wish to fight?' "'Yes, I am a Greek. I wish to fight.' Pesa's voice surprised him by coming from his lips in even and deliberate tones. He thought with gratification that he was behaving rather well. Another shell, traveling from some unknown point on the plain, whirled close and furiously in the air, pursuing an apparently horizontal course, as if it were never going to touch the earth. The dark shape swished across the sky. Ah! cried the captain, now smiling. I am not sure that we will be able to accommodate you, with a fierce affair here just at this time, but— He walked gaily to and fro behind the guns with Pesa, pointing out to him the lines of the Greeks, and describing his opinion of the general plan of defense. He wore the air of an amiable host— other officers questioned Pesa in regard to the politics of the war. The king, the ministry, Germany, England, Russia. All these huge words were continually upon their tongues. And the people in Athens were they. Amid this vivacious babble, Pesa, seated upon an ammunition box, kept his glance high, watching the appearance of shell after shell. These officers were like men who had been lost for days in the forest. They were thirsty for any scrap of news. Nevertheless, one of them would occasionally dispute their informant courteously. What would Serbia have to say to that? No, no, France and Russia would never allow it. Peza was elated. The shells killed no one. War was not so bad. He was simply having coffee in the smoking-room of some embassy, where reverberate the names of nations. A rumor had passed along the motley line of privates in the trench. The new arrival with the clean white helmet was a famous English cavalry officer come to assist the army with his counsel. They stared at the figure of him, surrounded by officers. Pesa, gaining sense of the glances and whispers, felt that his coming was an event. Later, he resolved that he could with temerity do something finer. He contemplated the mountain where the Greek infantry was engaged, and announced leisurely to the captain of the battery that he thought presently of going in that direction and getting into the fight. He reaffirmed the sentiments of a patriot. The captain seemed surprised. "'Oh, there will be fighting here at this knoll in a few minutes.' he said orientally. That will be sufficient? You had better stay with us. Besides, I have been ordered to resume fire. The officers all tried to dissuade him from departing. It was really not worth the trouble. The battery would begin again directly. Then it would be amusing for him. Pesa felt that he was wandering with his protestations of high patriotism through a desert of sensible men. These officers gave no heed to his exalted declarations. They seemed too jaded. They were fighting the men who were fighting them. Palaver of the particular kind had subsided before their intense preoccupation in war as a craft. Moreover, many men had talked in that manner, and only talked. Peza believed at first that they were treating him delicately. They were considerate of his inexperience. War had turned out to be such a gentle business that Pesa concluded he could scorn this idea. He bade them a heroic farewell, despite their objections. However, when he reflected upon their ways afterward, he saw dimly that they were actuated principally by some universal childish desire for a spectator of their fine things. They were going into action, and they wished to be seen at war precise and fearless. 5. 
Climbing slowly to the high infantry position, Pesel was amazed to meet a soldier whose jaw had been half shot away and who was being helped down the sheep track by two tearful comrades. The man's breast was drenched with blood, and from a cloth which he held to the wound, drops were splashing wildly upon the stones of the path. He gazed at Pesa for a moment. It was a mystic gaze, which Pesa understood with difficulty. He was exchanging looks with a specter. All aspect of the man was somehow gone from this victim. As Pesa went on, one of the unwounded soldiers loudly shouted to him to return and assist in this tragic march. But even Pesa's fingers revolted. He was afraid of the specter. He would not have dared to touch it. He was surely craven in the movement of refusal he made to them. He scrambled hastily on up the path. He was running away. At the top of the hill, he came immediately upon a part of the line that was in action. Another battery of mountain guns was here firing at the streaks of black on the plain. There were trenches filled with men lining parts of the crest, and near the base were other trenches, all crashing away mightily. The plain stretched as far as the eye can see, and from where silver mist ended this emerald ocean of grass, a great ridge of snow-capped mountains poised against a fleckless blue sky. Two knolls, green and yellow with grain, sat on the prairie, confronting the dark hills of the Greek position. Between them were the lines of the enemy. A row of trees, a village, a stretch of road, showed faintly on this great canvas, this tremendous picture, but men, the Turkish battalions, were emphasized startlingly upon it. The ranks of troops between the knolls and the Greek position were as black as ink. The first line, of course, was muffled in smoke, but at the rear of it battalions crawled up and to and fro, plainer than beetles on a plate. Pesa had never understood that masses of men were so declarative, so unmistakable, as if nature makes every arrangement to give information of the coming and the presence of destruction, the end, oblivion. The firing was full, complete, a roar of cataracts, and this peeling of connected volleys was adjusted to the grandeur of the far-off range of snowy mountains. Peza, breathless, pale, felt that he had been set upon a pillar and was surveying mankind, the world. In the meantime, dust had got in his eye. He took his handkerchief and mechanically administered to it. An officer, with a double stripe of purple on his trousers, paced in the rear of the battery of howitzers. He waved a little cane. Sometimes he paused in his promenade to study the field through his glasses. "'A fine scene, sir,' he cried airily upon the approach of Pesa. It was like a blow in the chest to the wide-eyed volunteer. It revealed to him a point of view. "'Yes, sir, it is a fine scene,' he answered. They spoke in French. "'I am happy to be able to entertain monsieur with a little practice,' continued the officer. "'I am firing upon that mass of troops you see there a little to the right. They are probably forming for another attack.' Peza smiled. Here again appeared manners manners erect by the side of death. The right flank gun of the battery thundered. There was a belch of fire and smoke. The shell flung swiftly and afar was known only to the ear, in which rang a broadening hooting wake of sound. The howitzer had thrown itself backward convulsively, and lay with its wheels moving in the air, as a squad of men rushed toward it. And later it seemed as if each little gun had made the supreme effort of its being in each particular shot. They roared with voices far too loud, and the thunderous effort caused a gun to bound as in a dying convulsion. And then occasionally one was hurled with wheels in air. These shuddering howitzers presented an appearance of so many cowards always longing to bolt to the rear, but being implacably held to their business by this throng of soldiers 
who ran in squads to drag them up again to their obligation. The guns were herded and cajoled and bullied interminably. One by one, in relentless program, they were dragged forward to contribute a profound vibration of steel and wood, a flash and a roar, to the important happiness of man. The adjacent infantry celebrated a good shot with smiles and an outburst of gleeful talk. "'Look, sir!' cried an officer to Peza. Thin smoke was drifting lazily before Peza, and dodging impatiently, he brought his eyes to bear upon that part of the plain indicated by the officer's finger. The enemy's infantry was advancing to attack. From the black lines had come forth an inky mass which was shaped much like a human tongue. It advanced slowly, casually, without apparent spirit, but with an insolent confidence that was like a proclamation of the inevitable. The impetuous part was all played by the defensive side. Officers called, men plucked each other by the sleeve. There were shouts, motions, all eyes were turned upon the inky mass, which was flowing toward the base of the hills, heavily, languorously, as oily and thick as one of the streams that ooze through a swamp. Peso was chattering a question at every one. In the way, pushed aside, or in the way again, he continued to repeat it. Can they take the position? Can they take the position? Can they take the position? He was apparently addressing an assemblage of deaf men. Every eye was busy watching every hand. The soldiers did not even seem to see the interesting stranger in the white helmet who was crying out so feverishly. Finally, however, the hurried captain of the battery espied him and heeded his question. "'No, sir, no, sir, it is impossible,' he shouted angrily. His manner seemed to denote that if he had sufficient time he would have completely insulted Peza. The latter swallowed the crumb of news without regard to the coating of scorn, and, waving his hand in adieu, he began to run along the crest of the hill, toward the part of the Greek line against which the attack was directed. 6. Peza, as he ran along the crest of the mountain, believed that his action was receiving the wrathful attention of the hosts of the foe. To him, then, it was incredible foolhardiness thus to call to himself the stares of thousands of hateful eyes. He was like a lad induced by playmates to commit some indiscretion in a cathedral. He was abashed, perhaps he even blushed as he ran. It seemed to him that the whole solemn ceremony of war had paused during this commission. So he scrambled wildly over the rocks in his haste to end the embarrassing ordeal. When he came among the crowning rifle pits filled with eager soldiers, he wanted to yell with joy. None noticed him save a young officer of infantry who said, Sir, what do you want? It was obvious that people had devoted some attention to their own affairs. Peza asserted, in Greek, that he wished above everything to battle for the fatherland. The officer nodded. With a smile, he pointed to some dead men covered with blankets, from which were thrust up turned dusty shoes. "'Yes, I know, I know,' cried Peza. He thought the officer was poetically alluding to the danger. No, said the officer at once. I mean cartridges, a bandolier. Take a bandolier from one of them. Peso went cautiously toward a body. He moved a hand toward the corner of a blanket. There he hesitated, stuck, as if his arm had turned to plaster. Hearing a rustle behind him, he spun quickly. Three soldiers of the close rank in the trench were regarding him. The officer came again and tapped him on the shoulder. "'Have you any tobacco?' Peza looked at him in bewilderment. His hand was still extended toward the blanket which covered the dead soldier. "'Yes,' he said, "'I have some tobacco.' He gave the officer his pouch. As if in compensation, the other directed a soldier to strip the bandolier from the corpse. Peza, having crossed the long cartridge belt on his breast, felt that the dead man had flung his two arms around him. A soldier with a polite nod and smile 
gave Pesa a rifle, a relic of another dead man. Thus he felt, besides the clutch of a corpse about his neck, that the rifle was as inhumanly horrible as a snake that lives in a tomb. He heard at his ear something that was in effect like the voices of those two dead men, their low voices speaking to him of bloody death, mutilation. The bandolier gripped him tighter. He wished to raise his hands to his throat like a man who is choking. The rifle was clammy. Upon his palms he felt the movement of sluggish currents of a serpent's life. It was crawling and frightful. All about him were these peasants, with their interested countenances gibbering of the fight. From time to time a soldier cried out in semi-humorous lamentations, descriptive of his thirst. One bearded man sat munching a great bit of hard bread, fat, greasy, squat. He was like an idol made of tallow. Peza felt dimly that there was a distinction between this man and a young student who could write sonnets and play the piano quite well. This old blockhead was coolly gnawing at the bread, while he, Peza, was being throttled by a dead man's arms. He looked behind him and saw that a head by some chance had been uncovered from its blanket. Two liquid-like eyes were staring into his face. The head was turned a little sideways, as if to get better opportunity for the scrutiny. Peza could feel himself blanch. He was being drawn and drawn by these dead men slowly, firmly down as to some mystic chamber under the earth where they could walk. Dreadful figures, swollen and blood-marked. He was bidden. They had commanded him. He was going, going, going. When the man in the new white helmet bolted for the rear, many of the soldiers in the trench thought that he had been struck, but those who had been nearest to him knew better. Otherwise they would have heard the silken sliding tender noise of the bullet and the thud of its impact. They bawled after him curses, and also outbursts of self-congratulation and vanity. Despite the prominence of the cowardly part, they were enabled to see in this exhibition a fine comment upon their own fortitude. The other soldiers thought that Pesa had been wounded somewhere in the neck, because as he ran he was tearing madly at the bandolier, the dead man's arms. The soldier with the bread paused in his eating and cynically remarked upon the speed of the runaway. An officer's voice was suddenly heard calling out the calculation of the distance of the enemy, the readjustment of the sights. There was a stirring rattle along the line. The men turned their eyes to the front. Other trenches beneath them to the right were already heavily in action. The smoke was lifting toward the blue sky. The soldier with the bread placed it carefully on a bit of paper beside him as he turned to kneel in the trench. 7. In the late afternoon the child ceased his play on the mountain with his flocks and his dogs. Part of the battle had whirled very near to the base of his hill, and the noise was great. Sometimes he could see fantastic smoky shapes, which resembled the curious figures in foam, which one sees on the slant of a rough sea. The plain indeed was etched in white circles and whirligigs, like the slope of a colossal wave. The child took a seat on a stone and contemplated the fight. He was beginning to be astonished. He had never before seen cattle herded with such uproar. Lines of flame flashed out here and there. It was mystery. Finally, without any preliminary indication, he began to weep. If the men struggling on the plain had had time and greater vision, they could have seen this strange tiny figure seated on a boulder, surveying them while the tears streamed. It was as simple as some powerful symbol. As the magic clear light of day amid the mountains dimmed the distances, and the plain shone as a pallid blue cloth marked by the red threads of the firing, the child arose and moved off to the unwelcoming door of his home. He called softly for his mother, 
and complained of his hunger in the familiar formula. The pearl-colored cow, grinding her jaws thoughtfully, stared at him with her large eyes. The peaceful gloom of evening was slowly draping the hills. The child heard a rattle of loose stones on the hillside, and, facing the sound, saw a moment later a man drag himself up to the crest of the hill and fall panting. Forgetting his mother and his hunger, filled with calm interest, the child walked forward and stood over the heaving form. His eyes, too, were now large and inscrutably wise and sad, like those of the animal in the house. After a silence he spoke inquiringly, "'Are you a man?' Pesa rolled over quickly and gazed up into the fearless cherubic countenance. He did not attempt to reply. He breathed as if life was about to leave his body. He was covered with dust. His face had been cut in some way, and his cheek was ribboned with blood. All the spick of his former appearance had vanished in a general dishevelment, in which he resembled a creature that had been flung to and fro, up and down, by cliffs and prairies during an earthquake. He rolled his eye glassily to the child. They remained thus until the child repeated his words. Are you a man? Pesa gasped in the manner of a fish, palsied, windless, and abject. He confronted the primitive courage, the sovereign child, the brother of the mountains, the sky and the sea, and he knew that the definition of his misery could be written on a grass-blade. End of Death and the Child